Welcome everybody to tonight's council meeting of Tuesday, June the 13th. We start our council meetings off with a singing of O Canada. And I'd like to invite up Kylie Mason to the microphone. Kylie, I'm just going to read a little bit about Kylie before she starts to sing. Welcome, Kylie. And you can pick whatever microphone you prefer. Our clerk's going to make sure that you're all set and the little lights are on. Kylie is 12 years old and is finishing grade 8 at St. Vincent de Paul School. She's grown up with music in her family as her mother, Sandra Mason, is a voice teacher and her brother, Jordan, plays piano, drums, and trumpet. Kylie's been singing for several years and is preparing to take her grade five Royal Conservatory of Music voice examination. She's participated in several music festivals, frequently being an award winner, and she's an active soloist at church, at the church that I go to as well. She's participated in school performances also in the production of Peter Pan. Kylie plays the piano as well. Kylie's chief love, though, is ballet. She's been dancing at the Lisanne Digman Nagy School of Ballet Arts for several years. Kylie hopes to continue her ballet studies throughout her high school and university with the hope of opening her own ballet school one day. Kylie's an avid reader who always seems to have a book in her hand. She loves traveling, swimming, and cottaging as well. Socializing with friends is also a way, is way up on her list. Kylie's very grateful and pleased to have been asked to sing our national anthem for City Council and all the residents of Niagara Falls. So Kylie, whenever you're ready. Oh Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love in other sons command. Count on plus the porte the paye, il se porte the qua. Tony soit et tu ne pas paye, de plus exploit. God keep our land, glorious and free. Oh, we stand on guard for thee. O Canada, we stand on guard for thee. All right, good job. <laughs> Kylie, on behalf of all of us here today, you did just a fantastic job, and I'll see you at church. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great job. Can you get, se get seated, everybody? <coughs> so we're just going to uh, readjust our, our agenda tonight. We're going to first uh, do a couple of our awards groups. So the first we're going to do is we're going to start with the Niagara Selects uh, U17 girls basketball team. What's that? Oh, and just before we do that, thank you very much, Mr. Clerk. We'll start by an adoption of the minutes from our May 19th meeting. Moved by Councillor Pierangelo, second by Councillor Cario. All those in favor? Thank you for that. Are there any disclosures of a pecuniary interest? Councillor Pierangelo. Thanks, Your Worship. I work for the Niagara Catholic District School Board. There's two checks in there, 00079006 and 00081007. 00. Did you get that one, Mr. Clerk? Thanks. Okay. Any other, Councillor Anoni? Check number 404153, made out to a member of my family. Thank you. Councillor Crater. Uh, thank you, Worship. Under your municipal accounts, check number 404508, payable to myself for services, and check payable to the Niagara District Catholic School Board, a member of my family works there, and the check numbers are 00790006. 0810007. Do you get, get that? Thank All you. Right. We got it. Thank you for that. Councilor Morocco? Uh, yes, Your Worship. I have um, three checks to declare. Uh, check number 404182, check number 404561 to my spouse, and check 404743 to myself for an uh, OSIM conference. Thank you for that. Any other disclosures? And I have one check number 403936 check made out to myself too, Mr. Clerk. Okay, so uh, actually, uh, suggestion here, actually rather than starting with the girls, we're going to start with the boys because you're already in here. So the Niagara Falls Red Raiders Novice Boys Basketball Team are going to be the first group that we're going to recognize. So give me one second, fellas, let me get down. 
and get the uh, proper list. Here we go. Okay, so if I could start by calling up your coaches, Brian McMahon and Josh Lennox. If you gentlemen want to come up to the ring. receiving the reward, and then when it's done, we'll get the whole group up here, do a group shot, and the coaches might give a little synopsis of how the season went. That sound good? Yeah. So everyone will have a chance to get their picture up here. So this year, the Niagara Falls Red Raiders Novice Boys Basketball Team represented our city in the Ontario Basketball Championships that were held in London, Ontario. This first year team was comprised of mostly eight-year-old boys competing in a nine-year-old division. The boys represented our city with class and with sportsmanship. During the championships, the Red Raiders went undefeated. And they did that in round robin play and received an automatic bid to the semifinals. It was in the semifinals that the boys showed their never give up attitude by erasing a late eight point deficit to win their game in overtime. In the last two minutes of the Ontario Championship game, the boys found themselves trailing and persevered to capture the Ontario Championships. The Niagara Falls Red Raiders are so excited about the future development of these boys, both as basketball players and as citizens of Niagara Falls. Congratulations, boys. Remy Dino, please come up.
for the uh, coaches, and we've got one, one missing. Away, yeah. One missing, and for our coaches. Oh. Coaches. <laughs> so he's got. Josh is going to address us, and then we'll do a group shot. So, uh, as many of our parents know, but our team was a first-year team. Uh, none of these kids had played travel basketball before, and they've never even played a basketball game. Uh, Red Raiders organization just uh, uh, trains at the beginning. So it was a, a good learning experience for all our boys this year. And um, not only the boys, but the parents, we have to say thank you to them because the dedication throughout the long winter and uh, coming to practices and showing up. And I don't think we played a game for the first three or four months. So we, we concentrate really on development. So it's been a great year for us and we're looking forward to a bright future. So thank you to the kids and to the parents as well. <laughs> So we're going to do this, so anyone wants to take any group shots? I'll just move this out of the way. Oh my goodness, everything comes down. Everyone's got a smile. This is what happens when you get to the NBA. say is thank you very much to our coaches because they're volunteers and, and it's not easy being a coach I know I've done it and and everyone's got to comment on whatever you're doing but but they still do it anyway and they're helping to develop these these young boys not just necessarily for sports but for life and I know they say busy kids stay out of trouble and it's a great way to help these kids stay active and if appearance has anything to do with these guys and their attitude and performance, <laughs> like they look like they're going somewhere. <laughs> they look like they're ready to play and beat somebody somewhere. So anyway, on the behalf, I have to say thank you to all the parents. It's a, it's a big commitment to you to drive them around everywhere, especially travel, and your coaches, because it's a big commitment to all of them. So thank you. All of you. <laughs> Side. So maybe if I could call the, the co head coaches, we've got uh, Enzo Di Domenico and assistant coach Nicole Di Domenico. Can I get you to come join me up here, please? Right. How about a big hand for our coaches? <laughs> okay, so here's what, uh, what I'll do. I'm going to uh, go over quickly what you did, ladies, your accomplishment. You all look very nice, by the way. You look a little bit dress differently dressed than the boys that you just had in here. They're ready to play basketball. I don't know if you're ready for basketball right now. And then what we'll do is, I pay a guy to laugh when I thought it was <laughs> It's the best investment I've ever made. It's so good. So, yeah. so what I'm going to do is, I'm going quick to quickly give a synopsis. Then we're going to ask your coaches to introduce you one at a time. We'll come up right here. We'll do a group shot with you receiving your award, or individual shot with you getting your award. Then stay up here and we'll do a group shot. And then your coaches will maybe give a little bit of a background on how the season went.
That sound good? Okay, good. During the weekend, May 5th through 7th, 2017, the Niagara Select Girls U17 basketball team competed in the Ontario Provincial Championships. The U17 girls achieved a Division I gold medal. This placed them number one in Ontario. This honor was a true testament to their undefeated season. The Selects went on a perfect 25-0, playing tournaments in both Canada and the United States. Congratulations, ladies. Well done. Chelsea Russell. Hey, Naomi Shad. Rosie Tate. And uh, we've also, for our two coaches, we have a couple certificates, and one for the player who's stuck in the traffic, uh, Jan and St. Catharines. And uh, maybe, Enzo, if you wanted to share with everybody uh, how you sum up the girls and the season. Well, the one thing that everybody should know of the accomplishment is because these girls not only play the U17, but they're all in grade 10, except for even Naomi's in grade 9, actually. So we played a year up and still won Division One. So that's pretty incredible that doing that for a younger team. Um, we played some couple really good tournaments in the Rochester area. We played some big, pretty good teams there. And actually, uh, these girls always found a way to win. And the most amazing thing is that the, at the provincial championship in the gold medal game, we actually beat the team by something like 37 points. So it wasn't just a, a win, it was like a crusher. A crusher yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's, uh, it was a pretty good team, and they were a lot bigger than us, and so they, they just uh, they played hard and they knew how to win. That was the key thing with this team. So great job! Great, great job! <laughs> Now you're like a blur. 
Or are you doing it? Do it again. Got it. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, um, the thing we like to always acknowledge is your two, two things I like to acknowledge. Number one is your coach, your coaches, because your coaches volunteer, and oftentimes that's a thankless job because all the parents are all coaches too in their own minds, right? Everyone's got an idea how they would have ran the play. And, and the coach at the end of the day is the one out there making the call, and it's not an easy job. It's thankless, they volunteer, they do it for the love of it. So, how about a big hand for our coaches? <laughs> You know, it takes special parents because you're, you're always shuffling everyone around, right? You're trying to rush meals. You're trying to make sure everything works out so everybody gets everything and everyone's happy. And in the end, you had a huge success. You had the gelling of these great young ladies who are going to be contributing members of our community. And they have tasted, they've tasted success at the highest level. And now they're going to take this. It's one more life experience they're going to take throughout their life because of your commitment and because of your coach's commitment and because of the, the girl's commitment. So on behalf of the city of Niagara Falls, we want to say congratulations to all of you and to all the people up here as well. Thank you very much. And ladies, thank you very much. Good job. Okay, you guys. Good job. We'll see you back next year over there, right? <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. Do we know? Okay, so we'll do that. Okay, so I'll go back down there. Oh, no, no. Do I have to? So I need to, to call it card for that. Is he here? Oh, I don't like glass. Is Gwen Van Cleef here? Oh, there you are. Okay. Do you want to join me up here? Sure. And is all is, is all of our Mayak people here? We have five winners here. And are, is, are they all here? Um, we have five of the, of the eight winners. Okay, five. Yes. Are, are you expecting any more? This is they have the other winners. Okay. So the winners. Okay, good, good. Okay. So if we're let me grab these certificates. Okay, tonight, if I can uh, have everyone's attention tonight. We're going to recognize youth contest winners from the essay and poster contest of why I want a drug-free community. I've now got Gwen Van Cleef here from the Foundation for Drug-Free World to help present the awards. I'm also going to call Councillor Crater, who sat on the committee to help judge these essays and posters. As Councillor Crater to join, join me up here, myself and Gwen. I can give a little bit of background on the foundation. The foundation that we're recognizing tonight here, they provide education, advice, and coordination for its international drug prevention network. They work with youth, with parents, with educators, volunteers, and with government agencies. They help people to lead lives free from drug abuse. Our Niagara Region chapter is proud to continue to provide these resources to youth in the Niagara Region. And I can tell you, as, as a dad of three kids, that's the thing that you worry about all the time, that you get the wrong kids and you try the wrong thing and it changes your life in a way that it's hard to recover from. So we're so grateful for these people and acknowledging the good work that they do to recognize these young people. So now I now ask uh, Gwen, she's going to call up each of the winners and we have a little certificate that we're going to present you with. We'll have an opportunity if you want to take a picture of them receiving the certificate. Then we'll do a group shot of all the recipients, if that's okay. Everyone go with that? Sounds good. And if you need to come forward to take a better picture, by all means, if you got a good spot where you are, that's fine. Whatever works for you, we'll wait. Okay? So, Gwen, it's all yours. Okay, so um, we have first prize in the essay contest, grade 5-6, Kelly De La Rosa from St. Mary Catholic Elementary School. Is Kelly here? 
Strange, you wanted to add to this? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I got, a count, I got an email from one of our residents, uh, Rich Judge, about one of the uh, the second place winners, but a truly amazing story about this, this young uh, lady. I'll just read the email out. Um, uh, I trust all well with you and your families. I thought you might be interested in the background of one of the essay contest winners to be recognized at council this evening. Uh, her name is Jomana, Jomana. Altanawi, hopefully I'm not pronouncing it right. She is the 14-year-old daughter of Rat Raken and Aziza Altanawi. Jomana, along with her parents and brother, Haiti, and sister Rem, arrived in Canada on December 29, 2016 from Lebanon. They were forced to flee their home in Syria almost four years ago to escape the Civil War. They walked from Syria to Lebanon and lived there in a shed for more than three years. A sponsorship group from St. John's Anglican Church, Holy Trin Trinity Anglican <coughs> Church, and First Baptist Church joined forces to sponsor the Altanawi's trip to Canada. They have been living in Niagara Falls since mid-January. The children are doing very well in school at St. Mary's. The family racking is worth working part-time in a local restaurant. The family loves Niagara Falls and, and very proud of Canada. So it's quite an accomplishment, accomplishment for a 14-year-old to win an essay, or second, sorry, in a, in a writing competition, but Jemana's accomplishments are even more worthy of praise when one considers the challenges she and her family have faced. Bravo, Jemana. Well done. 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 Well done.
associations and she was contacted to go forward with the idea of maybe speaking to the schools speaking directly to the children and she also worked in conjunction with uh, the Toronto has a chapter for the drug free world and Pat is here as well taking pictures and Pat got involved with her and so I was asked if I would be a judge uh, and I've been fortunate to be a judge for the past three years so I'll tell you a very On a very personal level, when you read the essays uh, and you understand when the research they, it, the children have done about the dangers of drugs, but some of the essays when you read them, you realize how personal it were. Things that some of these kids have seen and, 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 and were aware of what drugs could, could do to, to their own family. I was, I was deeply touched when I uh, read them. The other thing was, uh, and this year there was a poster, and I know Joyce uh, chose the poster winners as well. Uh, I, I thought it was important that people realize that we have some very special people in our community, such as Gwen, who truly cares about the kids. And one, one kind of unique story, we did the awards this year, this year Mr. Mayor, at Oaks Park. All the schools were there for track and field day, so a number of schools were all in one location. It was a great time to meet. I met all the students then. I remember Pat and I were standing there and there was a lot of um, older students just sitting on a bench and one of the one of the students shouted out and said, I know you. And in your mind you're thinking, probably like you, you're thinking, well, yeah, I'm a city council, you know me. But I didn't say anything. She wasn't talking to me. She said, I know you, you're the drug lady. <laughs> <laughs> and we kind of laughed. And then after I went back over to talk to the to the students and I said, how come you said that? And I know why they said it. They said, I couldn't remember the name, but we remember the impact of the presentation that was made to us in the school about drugs. So I just wanted to uh, recognize Gwen through you and thank her for what she's done to educate the kids about the dangers of drugs, especially when you see what's going on right now across this whole country with some very serious drugs that are out there. So Glenn, I just want to say congratulations. Uh, the mayor will be telling you that he will relieve you of her paying property taxes again. <laughs> 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 I had to say this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But all kidding aside, congratulations for all you do and, and all the kids that you've educated. That's just fantastic. Thank you. Thank you.
Got you when you were smiling. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, here you have it. This is the future of Niagara Falls. Do this kind of proactive stuff. Congratulations. Yes, please. Yes, Yeah. 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 Do you know, do, is the MIAC uh, members here, do we know? Is, uh, do we have everybody, Luca, is the whole group here? Uh, no, like, but we can go now. Well, I mean, we can do one ahead of you. What time? Okay, okay, why don't we, we'll give you a few more minutes. Okay, because I do see, okay, let's, we're gonna do two, we only got two left. Okay, I see that we've got Mr. Noel Buckley, the head of our convention center here, and he's gonna give us an update on how we're making out with our assets. So, <coughs> Mr. Buckley, welcome. Thank you very much, Your Worship, and, and thank you for allowing me to have time to be here today, and uh, certainly thanks to all members of Council, and that's, really the, uh, and that's really the reason why I'm here, although there will be a little bit of an update, uh, and who's ever doing that can leave it on that slide for a moment. Uh, um, I would like to really begin by thanking uh, many members of this council, but certainly everybody that was on this council in 2006 when they, uh, when they made the decision to unanimously support uh, a convention center build for the city of Niagara Falls. Uh, you know, somebody has to be a leader, somebody has to be first, and when somebody steps up first, as the city of Niagara Falls did, others follow. The province, the feds, the BIAs, the parks commissions, the bridge commissions, the casino, the private sector, a very, very significant asset was built, and I'm really just here to give you a little bit of an update on that asset. I'm sorry, is this, is, I thought I was filling the room, but maybe not Kojiko Television. Uh, but thank you, and I'm not gonna repeat all that for the viewers at home and spare people, and particularly those that are waiting for their recognition at council. So in 2006, council made, some, council made some decisions that really eased the direction and eased the way for this facility to be built. And I think it's incredibly important to recognize that up until 2006, we were really a spectacular leisure destination. And I mean that. We are the dominant leisure destination in Canada, generating more international demand than any other leisure, leisure destination in the country. But part of rounding out a destination is becoming a, a destination that has, attracts more than one type of visitor. And the decisions that were made by this council subsequent to 2006 and during 2006 have led to us not only being a really strong leisure destination, but also a really strong meeting destination. And it's important to understand that those go hand in hand. The best leisure destinations in North America are also the best meeting destinations. You only have to look at Orlando and their convention center, and Anaheim and their convention center, and San Francisco and Las Vegas, and everybody's been there for a meeting and they've all been there for leisure. The best leisure destinations in North America have the best chance of being the best meeting destinations. We have become that. And I think it's very, very important that, uh, that people understand the synergies between the two. For those that follow sports and understand you know, how big and important the Super Bowl is, it'd be interesting to note that the Super Bowl has been held more times in New Orleans than anywhere else in the US. Not in the big cities of Los Angeles and New York and Chicago and San Francisco. It's held in a fun leisure destination. That's where people want to go. So really, a thank you to this council for the decisions you made in 2006 that led us to where we are today. And I'll give you a little bit of an update on that if we want to move through the slide deck to the next one. If you take a look at where we were in 2011 when we first opened in 2012, our first year, we had about 153 total event days a year 
We are now at 282. That 230 needs to be corrected. It's 282, and it is later in the presentation. So you can see the type of growth. Uh, now, we didn't get a full year out of 2011, opening in April. But from 2011 at 140 total event days up to 282 total event days in 2016, you get a sense of the trend line on where we've gone and where we've been, producing roughly an annual economic impact of $93 million. And the next slide, please. The net revenue also has followed that. If you take a look at where we were in 2011 and 2012 when we first opened, you can see that our net revenue was uh, a, a net negative cash flow position. But if you look at what happened in 214, 215, and the most recent year of 216, we're generating net revenues in the neighborhood of a million dollars or 800,000 to a million dollars. We have a fully funded life cycle reserve of about $1.45 million. We will be able to look after the life cycle costs of our own building and we meet with uh, your, uh, your director of finance regularly, and in fact, I think we're scheduled tomorrow to meet uh, uh, Mr. Harrison, uh, to ensure that the city's asset is well, paid, well protected and well maintained and has a funding reserve as we move forward uh, because there will be life cycle costs as we move forward. We're in a well-funded position right now. Over and above the 1.45 million we have in restricted life cycle assets, we are also sitting on a surplus right now of about $2.0 million. So between the two, we are at over $3.5 million right now, and we are in a comfortable position from a financial perspective. I thought the city should know that as you own the asset. So uh, I, I think that the board of directors on your behalf and uh, on behalf of our chair, Wayne Thompson, who is here tonight and, uh, and uh, does yeoman's work on the board, Vince Cario, who's a board member, and all of our board members, I think I can uh, say on their behalf that they are, are looking after the asset and ensuring that it's properly funded and doing well as we move forward to 2017 and the years beyond. Uh, if we take a look at the next slide. In 2016, we took a little bit a look at what we were doing, and we took a look at particularly how we were marketing our facility. And there's one thing that you will always hear me, and I began my little talk today with it. This is the dominant leisure destination in the world. We're not going to necessarily talk about the facility or talk about the square footage or talk about the asset without talking about the destination. That is first and foremost why people will choose this meeting destination. We're in the dominant leisure destination in the country. We're not asking you to go to the Netherlands. We're not asking you to go to some faraway place in the country. We're asking you to come to a place where a significant number of people want to be. And in fact, today in our building, we have the Canadian Payroll Association who, in a conversation with us today, let us know that this is their largest gathering of their membership ever, and it is attracting payroll association association members from all over the United States and all over Europe, particularly because it's in Niagara Falls. So the destination is paramount in us being a successful, a successful facility. Uh, we have within uh, 50 kilometers of our front door approximately 125 wineries. We will be the best at wine and culinary for a facility of our size or a large banquet facility anywhere in the country. We can put together an accommodation block that almost no other, no other destination in the country can other than Toronto. Within walking distance of our facility and four-star branded hotel rooms, there are at least 5,000. There isn't 5,000 four-star branded hotel rooms within the Montreal Convention Center, within walking distance, within walking distance of Quebec or Calgary or Edmonton, and not even Vancouver, but there is at ours. So we tell meeting planners about that and the ease of doing business in our facility. Those are the four pillars upon which we market our facility, and we're, uh, we've really begun hammering those home in the past year. If you take a look at the type of business that comes to our facility, there's really three types of business. There's corporate business represented by the likes of our bond who were here last September with uh, six or 7,000 delegates, Best Buy, McDonald's, Metro, Deloitte, Staples, Sobe, Scotiabank, this is just a sample of the, types of, uh, of the types of business that comes on the corporate side. The next type of business that comes 
would be the next slide. And you're looking at associations. I reference the Canadian Payroll Association. They're in the building this, this week. The Ontario Groundwater Association was in the building last month. The Canadian Chiropractic Association. You're all very familiar with FCM and AMO. The Assembly of First Nations was at the facility last year. So, you know, the, the effort and the work done by everybody in this room, particularly when you help with FCM and AMO and others, is really pays off for the destination and really begins to position us, as I said, as a really strong meeting and leisure destination. The third major type of business that comes is kind of on the, uh, and here it is, kind of on the trade show and or large event. Cheer Evolution, which I'm happy to inform Council, has signed with us until 2022, generating tens of thousands of room nights for the destination. Uh, the Niagara Falls Comic Con, just completed last weekend, uh, is a very important uh, annual event in the building. And this year in June, on June the 30th, Global Legacy Boxing uh, and Lennox Lewis will be bringing prize fighting back to Niagara Falls. And uh, we're very, very thrilled to have them coming back and, uh, and hopefully developing a longer term relationship with Global Legacy Boxing, Les Woods and Lennox Lewis, as we look for another avenue of business as we move forward uh, uh, beyond 2017. I guess the last thing I would like to say is this type of growth, and I'll, I'll highlight it again, moving from 130, uh, 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 from 83 to 135 events in 2016, representing 282 event days, uh, has really allowed our board to make certain types of decisions. And if we move to the next slide, you'll see that in 2016, our board approved uh, completing some space that was roughed in but never finished. Approximately 10,200 square feet on the 200 level, just outside the offices, uh, the administrative offices, we're going to finish another uh, 10,000 square feet of space, uh, create five more breakout rooms or, or a larger breakout room if you want, allowing us to accommodate five more, uh, five more breakout rooms, as I said, uh, 125 in the small breakout rooms or combining the entire breakout room, 735, as we begin to attract uh, more conventions and more meetings were pressured to have the right amount of breakout space for the amount of exhibit space we have, which is, uh, as I'm sure you're all aware, a very large floor. So um, the board has approved this expansion. Uh, we, are, uh, we are moving down this road. We have applied for all the necessary building permits and are uh, completed the engineering drawings. They are out to bid right now, and we're expecting, uh, we're expecting the bids back uh, late next week. That, in a nutshell, is where we are and what's been going on. I know you have a very full agenda. I would be more than happy to answer any questions. But really, a major thank you on behalf of our chair, Wayne Thompson, on behalf of board members like Vince Cario, on behalf of the tourism industry for your leadership in ensuring that this infrastructure got built. And uh, uh, no ask other than you continue to speak highly of Niagara Falls as not only a leisure destination, but also a meeting destination. And thank you very, very much for your time. No, thank you very much. Well done. I have to say, I know uh, Councillor Thompson, when he was the mayor, I know he was pushing hard knowing this was one of the missing pieces of the puzzle in Niagara Falls in developing our shoulder season. And that's exactly what's happened. And then the last piece of the piece was bringing you back. Uh, you know, I know I was speaking with the mayor of Ottawa and Mr. Watson, um, you know, two jabs he gave me. One, we took you back from Ottawa and brought you back to Niagara. And the second one was that we won the uh, 2021 Canada Summer Games. Right. So he told me, third strike, I'm in trouble. So <laughs> I don't wanna ask for too much. But, but yeah, you're doing a terrific job. I, I, I'm down there regularly bringing greetings for conferences. I hear firsthand right from the organizers. They're thrilled with what's going on, how they're being treated. Just the fact that the cheer event has been extended to 2022 is huge because I know they want him all over the place. They would love to have him there. I think Doug Martin was his name. And uh, yep. every group that I talk to is really happy with the way they're dealt with. And anytime I've got a challenge, I give him a, a quick call to Noel. He's on it right away and everything's taken care of. So nice thing is the buck stops with the buck. Right, Mr. Buckley? Thank you, your So on behalf of the city, we're, we're, we're pleased. I don't know Thank if there's you. any other uh, questions or comments of council. I guess seeing, uh, yeah, go ahead, well, Mr. Just, Council I Strange. Just have been kind of in touch with Noel the last few uh, months because we've been doing this care with childhood cancer 
event. And uh, what child, is the event? Did you want to mention that? The KO Child Cancer event. It's this Friday. It's sold out basically. Oh, great! Friday. But you can buy tickets at the door. <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> I want to thank Noel for for being so professional, unbelievable. That venue is awesome, and I think everyone's going down there. The conventions. We're in a top-notch destination, but now they have a beautiful venue where they have their conventions. They bring their whole families down here now while they're, you know, the people are going in their conventions, the families are enjoying the attractions, filling our hotels, filling the restaurants, and it's first top-notch uh, conventions, Comic-Con, concerts, and even boxing now. So I want to thank you and, and the customer service is, is first class as well. So thank, thank you, you very you. much, Councillor. No, thank you very much. Appreciate thank you coming you. out tonight. Oh, wait, wait, uh, Councillor Thompson. Um, yeah, I just want to uh, say, uh, this was a, a long-term situation. We worked on this for probably over 20 years. And uh, Noel was uh, with us uh, at Niagara Falls Tourism for uh, 10, 10 years. 10, 10. years. Uh, during that, we were at meetings constantly trying to accomplish that. And when it got open, uh, we were doing okay. Uh, but our objective was always we got to get Noel Buckley back here. And uh, we had to give him a lot of money, which is unfortunate. <laughs> but uh, anyway, we got him back uh, and things changed. You've seen the scale. And uh, I just want to mention Noel Buckley is a key element to the success that we're having at that facility and what we're doing uh, in the community generally with tourism and creating jobs, so no, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you very much. And, your, uh, your worship, yes, it's sir. incredibly important, and I appreciate those the being singled out, but there is a very, very, very strong board and a very, very, very strong team and very strong leadership in the community that got this facility built, and honestly, every single person in this room should, should, uh, should if they could, pat themselves on the back because, uh, you know, these things are built by armies, not by individuals. So really, it's, it's, it was the foresight of this council to get it done. And also the Falls UBIA was instrumental too in uh, making sure financially that it was viable. So uh, definitely gotta mention those folks as well. Councilor Crater. Uh, thank you, uh, Noel, it's nice to see you. Um, I'm really pleased um, that you've come out. Uh, I've been back, fortunate to be back on council for the last couple of years. Um, I know the Convention Center is doing well, but we never really heard anything um, and the figures you're throwing out, um, it's really positive that we realize how successful financially you are and how um, your life cycle, I think that's the term you use. Yes. You're in a position where you can maintain and renovate the building, do anything that needs to be done. It doesn't have to come back to City Council. We don't have to get involved. The way you've explained it is I'm correct. That is correct, Councillor. And the other thing I do want to, I want to recognize a couple of people that I think should be property recognized. I can remember on my term of office as an MPP, that was one of the things that uh, worked uh, diligently with McGinty and, uh, and our Minister of Finance to convince him to put in the $30 million. But two of the people that really, for the city, that really helped drive this in particular is, uh, um, I don't know if he's here, but Serge Felicetti, who was, and Ed Lustig. And they brought very quality uh, reports to show why it was a benefit not just to the city, but also to the province that it was well worth the money to invest in a convention center, as you said, in a destination that everyone knows. So I wanted to mention those two names in particular because they certainly deserve to be recognized. And yeah, it's probably one of the highlights of my term of office was to convince the government to, uh, to take the uh, to jump and put forward the $30 million. I think that was very, I know it was beneficial, so thank you. Absolutely. Well, Council, uh, you have it. Thank you very much, Mr. Buckley. Appreciate Thank you, the update. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Sure. Next up, we have the Mayor's Youth Advisory Committee. So, folks, if I can get you to come on up here. And we're going to get a presentation of Council providing their annual update. And, ladies and gentlemen, for those of you at home watching that are not familiar, MIAC stands for Mayor's Youth Advisory Committee. And this is a group of youths. That and folks, you can come up and stand up with your uh, with your team up here. And come closer. Come on, <laughs> you stand up behind them, and uh, they they represent the city in so many ways, representing the youth and keep us, keeping us connected to those that are going to be running the city in the future. These are the some of the brightest kids, and when you see what I see, young adults, these ones are going on 
doing amazing thing in education, in business, around the globe. These are the future leaders, not just of Niagara Falls, they're future leaders, they're current leaders, period. So maybe if I could have uh, two of our leaders here, maybe introduce, Luca, you can introduce your, yourselves here and uh, it's all yours. Okay, so um, my name is Luca Vucic. Um I'm a grade 12 student at Meyer, and I'm here to speak on behalf of Mayor's Youth Advisory Committee. I'm co-chair this year along with um, I'm also co-chair. My name is Emily Hunter. I go to St. Mike's. I'm a grade 12 student. So basically, we're just going to take you through our slideshow showing the projects we've worked on this year and um, the future projects we will be planning for the upcoming school year. So You have control there. If you like. Oh, gotcha. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we'll start off with our mandate. So our main two goals are to provide a voice for the youth of Niagara Falls while advising council of important issues concerning the city's younger population. So this can include um, advising council or um, gathering input from our peers about what can make Niagara Falls a more youth friendly city or how we can improve certain aspects of the city to benefit um, the youth specifically. And then secondly, we have to encourage facilities and programs that will enhance the quality of life health and well-being of the youth in our community. So that echoes um, what I previously mentioned. Um, so we're just going to go over our structure. So the way the committee works is there's a main committee, which is the whole committee, which is composed of five students from each five of the high schools, um, which is then directed and run by me and Emily. And then under that committee, we have three subcommittees. So there's one committee which is just for fun, there's another one which is giving back, and then there's a third which is youth voice, and each of those committees have their own chairmen, which we'll speak today. Um, so on the main committee. So we begin the year with our leadership day. So we come here actually to City Hall. Um, we do a tour. We get to know each other, just um, break the ice kind of so that we can form the relationships required to do the instrumental work that takes place later in the year. Um, next is the City of Niagara Falls Youth Volunteer of the Year Award. Um, me and Emily got a chance to speak, which was amazing, and uh, I was really happy that one of our own members on MIAC received the award. So as you can see, a picture of Haroop. Where are you? <laughs> this is Haroop. So next we have the Santa Claus Parade. So this isn't a MIAC specific event, but MIAC does take place, um, does, does take part in the event just to show that we're um, an active participant in our community and to um, support the city's initiatives. Um, next is the Mental Wellness Summit. This is huge for our committee. Um, it's really important to our committee especially. Uh, we got approved for a $77,000 grant from the Ontario 150 program which we're very happy about. So we're planning a mental wellness summit in the fall. Um, there's a lot of work going into it. We've met with the Scotia Bank Center and a lot of, a lot of other people. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with jack.org. They're also gonna be helping us. Um, there's a lot of work going into it. We're still in the planning stages. We've been meeting with both the DSPN and the Catholic board. So that's all I can say for now. I, there's not too much happening, but we're working on it. <coughs> so something that MIAC does annually is we help out with the Niagara Falls Community Outreach Kitchen. This is just one of our volunteering initiatives that is not solely, um, um, is not solely given just to the Giving Back Subcommittee, but every member is expected to take part in this and just to volunteer their time. Um, the Community Clean Sweep. So uh, every year we go do the cl clean clean sweep of the street. Um, unfortunately, we try to do it twice a year, but this year we could only do it once. Uh, no MIAC members, or not enough of us, were able to make the second one, which was on Saturday. But as you can see, this is a photo from our first one, which was very successful. Um, the Rotary and Citizenship. Um, I This year, the member that went uh, was not able to attend, but I went last year. It's an amazing, it's an amazing event. You uh, spend four days in Ottawa traveling, doing very, touristy stuff. You get to also go through a citizenship ceremony. Um, we got to meet a few political leaders, including Elizabeth May and Stephen Harper and uh, a few members from the Liberal Party, so it was really great. Uh, we got to speak with the Speaker of the House of Commons. It was a, it was a really good event. Um, and then next we're going to Youth Voice. So. So I am um, co-chair of Youth Voice along with... And I'm Erica, I go to Meyer as well and I'm in grade 11 and I co-chair the Youth Voice subcommittee. 
Okay, so one of our annual events um, with Youth Voice is the Niagara Student Summit. Um, this is personally my favorite event because what it is is a day at Brock. Um, it's an educational summit for high school students to have the opportunity to learn things that aren't traditionally taught in high schools. So, for example, we teach financial literacy, we teach surviving um, first year of university 101, we talk about international admissions, um, we talk about um, volunteering opportunities, scholarship opportunities, so a whole variety of things. Um, students can also participate in recreational activities. So they get to see Brock's campus, they get to do campus um, and dorm tours, um, they get to learn a bit about Niagara College bridge programs, um, they get to speak with some admissions officers, some university students, and they get to ex explore um, the rowing and archery, I guess, facilities on Brock's campus. Um, so students choose which um, programs they'd like to sit in, on, sit in on. So each student's day does look a little bit different, but it's just a nice opportunity for students to learn things that they otherwise won't have access to easily. And so what we're doing this year with this event is we've actually changed the structure a little bit. So we're going to have more of a focus on the science part. So we'll also be able to teach science. And this is an event that we've been planning all year and it comes every fall annually. So even though Emily will be leaving us next year, we'll still continue on with the event, although she's been helping us plan for the entirety of the year so far. Okay. So we could call the giving vouchers. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. So my name's Haroop. I'm a grade 12 student at Wesleyan, and I co-chair the Giving Back Subcommittee with... Mohitney Rathod. And together, again, we're from Wesleyan Secondary. So if you'd like to start... Okay, so the first event that we planned throughout the year was the children's Christmas party. And what we did here was that we made arts and crafts with the children at Red Roof and St. Catharines, as well as we went out and bowled with them. This was a win-win situation because we had fun, and the kids also had fun there, which was a great time. Next was the wheelchair basketball. Uh, this is a great way to sort of experience the other side, get to lay low, just because Mike, Mike does a lot of planning and all, all the hard work, but it's also good, good to have a balance between fun and work. And this was sort of a chance to give back and also have fun with the people who worked so hard at wheelchair basketball. Of course, we got destroyed. Uh, they shot five <laughs> points and we got one. But that's, that's aside the point, we had a lot of, we had a lot of fun. Okay, so the next event that we planned was the Mike Skate Night, um, and this was open to all youth of Niagara Falls. They can come out with their friends and have a good time. And at the Mike Skate Night, we also collected donations for Project Share, which we donated during Christmas time, which helped families out as well. And next, one of the biggest things that we sort of took on was the Mental Wellness Project this year. We partnered up with the Catholic, uh, the, the Catholic Board and uh, REACT, which is a peer leader position offered at the Niagara Regional Public Health. And what we did was, sort of the title was How to Deal with Real Life. It was teaching elementary students and high school students coping strategies with how to deal with stress, the difference between good stress, bad stress, what they could do when they're under pressure, and different strategies that they can take on to be a better version of themselves. And what this whole thing entailed was that from each section, so grade one to three, would submit a poster regarding what, what they did to deal with real life, any problems that they had, and they got a chance to win a pizza party for their class and high school students. One, uh, one particular member got a chance to win a $250 gift card, which is a great experience for everyone. And uh, with this poster contest, we partnered up with Mayak and React, as well as the Niagara Catholic District School Board. So just for fun, um, our other chairman, Sarah Malinkovich, isn't here, so I'll step in with Olivia. Okay. So I'm Olivia Gallagher. I'm a grade 12 student at St. Paul, and I am the co-chair, along with Sarah Malinkovich, of the Just for Fun Committee. Um, we'll start with School Palooza. Our numbers this year were rather amazing. Last year's numbers were estimated between 2,500 to 3,000. Uh, this year we were more than 4,000 students. Um, the main focus of School Palooza uh, is to get students to dress up in their school spirit and come and compete for the school to become the School Palooza champion. Um, a lot of students come and have fun along with their fellow classmates and uh, fellow schools in Niagara region. Um, just to recognize the winner this year was Wesleyan. I wasn't happy, but I mean, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, this was a new event for the Just for Fun Committee. We partnered up with um, 
the people over at Roost Chris, and we had an acoustic and uh, dance night for the youth of Niagara Falls, where students were able to buy tickets and get appetizers, as well as see performances from their fellow students at their schools, perform live, and then we had a dance at the end where students really enjoyed, which students yeah, really enjoyed. It was, uh, it was definitely a different kind of atmosphere for my act to set up, but it's something we're trying to explore more. And I mean, we, uh, we sold out at the door, we had to start turning people away because we reached our cap of 400, so we were very happy about that. Um, and we hope to continue doing more events like this. Uh, so we'd like to thank, actually Emily, if you can come up. We can't list all of our sponsors because there is very, there's a lot of them, but uh, we'd like to thank all of them. And we'd like to thank um, all of you, councils and your worship for continuing to support us and sponsor us and we appreciate it greatly. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Councilor Peter Angela. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. I think I would be remiss if I didn't uh, send off my congratulations to one of the co-chairs of my act this year, Emily Hunter. Uh, Emily, while well, she is a, a student at St. Michael, was also, um, she was accepted to Harvard University this year. Uh, after writing her SATs, uh, she scored very similar to yours, Your Worship. She, <laughs> she was in the 99th percentile. Uh, when Almost when there, young Scott. She, <laughs> she was one of only about 2,000 uh, students that were accepted out of almost 40,000 applicants. So I know you talk about how MIAC is, uh, you know, the group of individuals that are bright and are going to lead the communities in the future, and they certainly don't disappoint. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And also, yeah, go ahead, Councillor Strange. No, as you say, and also, uh, Luca was our intern. He worked in the office uh, for this past term, and he got invaluable uh, experience in what not to do in politics. So uh, <laughs> it's good. You got to learn both sides. As, uh, yeah. as you call it, Jim, a mini PhD. <laughs> a mini PhD, yeah. So he did. He's been an invaluable help in our office. I know uh, the ladies were sad to see him, uh, his term come as it comes to an end, but he's been a big help, and he's done a lot of things to help us get organized right from. Uh, the state of the city to all sorts of events, everything in between. So he's been a very valuable resource to the city as well. Councillor Strange. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I just want to congratulate all of you for doing a great job this year. All the different events. I know you got to try to think of diff different innovative events every year, right? So you guys have great minds, obviously. And in particular, um, not a lot of us, I don't think, know about what the grant they got for the teen mental health. We got a grant from the government with, uh, with Beth Atap. And just to me, one of the very few municipalities that got that grant for teen mental health, $77,000. Mm -hmm. And uh, they put that money to good use this year in helping schools and how they can cope with uh, the stress, everyday stress. Uh, sometimes we don't get it. It's, you know, we, maybe we didn't have that 30, 40 years ago with the social media and stuff right now and uh, bullying and stuff like that. And, and I like that you guys went to the secondary schools, the grade ones. And, and, and up the, and elementary schools and grade one and up and teaching them those kids how to stream. We don't know what goes on in these, some of these kids' heads. So really thank you for doing that and just amazing and, and getting the word out. And I know uh, uh, Mr. Campbell here is a big proponent of that. So thank you on behalf of him as well. So And lastly, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge Beth Angle and Carrie Campbell. Uh, these two ladies worked very closely. They love, it's a labor of love. They love this part of their job where they get to work with the Mayor's Youth Advisor because you're, you're bright lights, right? You're exciting individuals. Your futures are so exciting. You gotta be thrilled. And you get to work with other people that have the same kind of mindset and attitude. You're positive, you're constructive, and you're looking forward and what you can build. And I think that's terrific. And I'm proud that I get to associate with all of you as well, because one day I'll be working for you probably. So that's good. So on behalf of the City of Niagara Falls, we want to say thank you to our Mayak uh, group. You, you're terrific. We're going to miss some of you and the rest. We're going to welcome you back. So please stay in touch with us and come back home. Get all your life experience. Then come back home and run this city. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Now to our patient uh, presenters, I know you had some challenges on the highway, I understand. We did indeed. So I'd like to, maybe I'll introduce Kent, who works for the city. He's our infrastructure and asset manager for the city. Along with Dave Watt, project manager is going to make a presentation to council on the study. So rather than mess up your name, Kent, I'm just going with Kent, okay? So Kent and Dave, step up. If you could introduce your team and introduce the presentation, we'd appreciate that. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, Tell Vic how, Councillor Peter Angel, how you would say your last name. I yeah. asked him before the meeting. And how would you say it? Shaka Do you got that? 
Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So the uh, the yeah the, the members of the team from GM Blue Plan that uh, uh, completed the pollution prevention control plan study are Dave Watt, uh, Julian Bell, Daniel Anders, and Chris Hamill. Yeah. So um, yeah. So similar to the um, uh, master drainage plan update study that uh, we presented uh, back in April, this is the uh, pollution prevention control plan update study. Um, and so this focuses instead on the, uh, the wastewater collection system for the city. So just to briefly uh, I'm gonna go, uh, re outline the agenda for, uh, for the presentation, I'm going to talk about the, uh, sc the scope and the purpose of the study and uh, briefly outline the various study tasks and then I'm uh, going to have the team from GM Blue Plan take over and they'll go over the uh, findings and recommendations, uh, focusing on uh, recommended capital works, operations and maintenance review and uh, recommendations regarding programs and policies. And then uh, we'll finish with next steps. Okay, why are we updating the uh, pollution, pre pollution prevention control plan study? Uh, the, uh, the current study was completed in 2008 and ideally they should be reviewed and updated every five to 10 years. Uh, we're also dealing with a period of uh, ongoing and rapid growth and the associated surfacing challenges that uh, come with that. Um, we're still experiencing ongoing basement flooding issues, primarily during our wet weather events. Uh, we also need to ensure that we have continued alignment and compliance with the uh, Ministry of the Environment and Climate Change uh, regulatory procedures. And finally, uh, there's a need for a comprehensive plan to provide uh, excuse me, guidance on capital investments, service level policies, <coughs> excuse me, maintenance and of a good state of good repair of the city's wastewater infrastructure. Okay, some of the tasks that were uh, included in the study. There was, a, in two, 2014, um, we uh, completed a, a citywide sewer flow monitoring program, and one of the first tasks was a, a detailed review and assessment of all those findings, as, as, well, as well as a uh, background data uh, review, which included looking at all the previous uh, uh, PPCP studies, and uh, as well as existing planning information, policies, regulations, and guidelines as it pertains to uh, pollution prevention control. Um, there was a, a public consultation that's required uh, in accordance with uh, phase one and two of the municipal class environmental assessment process. Uh, as well, there's a uh, uh, development of a hydraulic sewer model to uh, look at the existing and uh, future sewer system capacity and performance. Um, an assessment of uh, extraneous flow, which uh, consists mainly of infiltration and inflow into the system, and then assessing the impacts of potential future growth. There's also a review uh, of the operations and maintenance uh, side, and then a level of service analysis, and then finally identifying areas of concern, developing and evaluating alternatives, and providing recommendations with costing. Now I'm going to pass it off to Mr. Watt to uh, pick up the uh, study. Good evening, Your Worship, uh, members of Council, senior staff. My profound apologies for being late tonight. Uh, however, the QEW seems to be closed for 10 kilometers in, in each uh, direction. We no it normally takes us about 25 minutes to get to City Hall. It took about two hours tonight. So. Wow. Um, used, to, used to work here uh, as well. Indeed, time, indeed. I'm, I'm, I'm coming back some 15 years hence. So. Um, Bit of an introduction to the team that's here. I'm David Watt. I'm Vice President of GM Blue Plan. We're a Canadian and wholly employee-owned uh, company. We have about 27 staff in our Stony Creek office, 160 in total. Here tonight with Danielle Anders, who was the project en engineer who did a lot of the work in the background that you're about to see. Mr. Julian Bell, who's primarily responsible for um, hydraulic model and capacity evaluation. And Mr. Chris Hamill, our President is here tonight. One of the reasons we, we, do, we don't normally invite the president out, but uh, Mr. Hamill is the project manager for the Niagara Region Water and Wastewater Master Servicing Plan, which has some profound impacts what you do, on what you do within your wastewater system. Kent was the project manager, or is the project manager. Internally, there were three other individuals that provided technical assistance. We also had representation from the region of Niagara and the uh, Ministry of the Environment and Climate Change. Uh, we enter every project with some guiding principles. In this case, uh, we notice with uh, interest your 2015 to 2018 City Council and staff strategic priorities. 
We'd like to think the outcomes from this uh, project support seven of those, with the only, uh, with the only exception being uh, the, the priority around transportation. This is the first pollution prevention control plan that's aligned fully with the Niagara Region Master Servicing Plan. Just so happens that they were being delivered synchronously. We were actually delayed a little in waiting for some of the outcomes from the Master Servicing Plan. That's a 25-year plan, our 25-year planning horizon to look at regional infrastructure from water and wastewater perspectives. What we've introduced uh, that's somewhat new to the plan is uh, customer level of service metrics. So um, I apologize for the error in this slide, but there's a, an act coming in called the Infrastructure for Jobs and Prosperity Act that's going to regulate asset management within the province of Ontario. So it's actually a link the technical things you do and investments you make in your wastewater system to finite customer level of service objectives. To, set, to sort of set you up on that path, we've, uh, we've aligned the recommendations to uh, level of service uh, framework. <coughs> Excuse me, some, different, uh, some differentiators. Past plans just looked at achieving regulatory compliance with respect to release of untreated sewage to the environment. We're looking at customer and technical levels of service and some key performance indicators for, for council and staff to look at on an annual basis. Juxtaposing what you spend on the system uh, and showing whether the system's getting worse, staying the same, getting better. Uh, past plans only looked at capital requirements. Uh, that's the addition of new infrastructure, upsizing of new infrastructure. This plan looks at rehabilitation and it also looks as, at maintenance as an effective way to defer capital expenditures. Your, all your previous plans looked at trunk infrastructure only. The majority of your issues don't exist in trunk infrastructure. They exist in local systems, mainly basement flooding and overflows. So your new system model is an all pipe model. And we're also looking at the condition of the system because that can have a profound impact on where you're having constraints, bottlenecks, and, and, and basement flooding essentially occurring. We've come up with a tactical action plan that's in your council package in the executive summary. It's a five-year forecast on re of recommended actions. Previous plans gave you a sort of summary level recommendations. We're uh, promoting a continuous improvement approach between plans. So Kent mentioned you go five to eight years between plans. We're putting a business process in place where, where staff will come to you and report on the efficacy of their investments on an annual basis. And this plan is fully integrated with the regional master plan. So for those of you that aren't familiar with the City of Niagara Falls uh, wastewater system, the Stanley Avenue Wastewater Treatment Plant owned and operated by the region of Niagara's up here, Tourist Core here, I'm quite familiar with this system as you can tell, is uh, pumped via a central pump station to Stanley Avenue. Anything south of Lundy's Lane is conveyed to the low left, uh, or sorry, the high left pump station uh, up the Stanford Interceptor, which is, uh, I think I've lost my mouse but basically borders the west side of the hydro canal. You actually also service uh, part of St. David's. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of that, the, the, but the north end of Niagara Falls basically gets conveyed directly via a series of pump stations to the Stanley Avenue wastewater treatment plant. Two-tier service delivery, you own 90% of the collection system. Region owns about 10. They own and operate the wastewater treatment plant pump stations. So so I've put some system statistics there. I guess one takeaway is uh, you have 20, about 25 overflows in the system. So some existing system challenges and constraints. In the interest of resident confidentiality, we've drawn uh, pink boxes around some areas that are of concern. Uh, these probably aren't news to you, but you get repeated basement flooding in some of these areas uh, by virtue of heavy rains. Uh, there are a number of operational and maintenance issues in these areas as well. Uh, that frankly need to be moved to capital. Uh, you've had a recent sewer failure, of which you're probably aware, um, that you, you couldn't reasonably foresee because you didn't have condition information on that particular pipe. And you have combined sewer overflows to the environment. Some of the other challenges, you've got increased development, particularly in the tourist core and in southern Niagara Falls. Uh, this system is aging. Your earliest pipe is around 1885 to the present day. So the system is a aging. Uh, and you're also uh, up against climate change. We're dealing with climate change in other municipalities. We just finished a project for the region of Halton. They had a one in 200 year event. 
So what used to be a one in five or 10 or 100 year event is becoming more and more frequent. The key is to make your system, optimize your system so it's more resilient to these rainfalls. I'm gonna turn it over to Julian, he's gonna do a couple slides, then Chris will do a slide and I'll come back. Hi, um, so one of the, the key components of this study and is really what's gonna be a benefit to the city moving forward um, was that there was a development of an all pipes model. So Dave, David Watt alluded to that, that you know, the system is quite a complex system. There's a lot of pipes, there's a lot of interactions, you've got combined sewers. Um, so a model was developed in, in a way so that we could assess how that system is performing, what are really necessarily the root causes of some of these issues that we're seeing within the system. Is that the pipes are just too small and we're not having enough capacity and when it rains it just it overflows or when we look at from a capacity perspective we're indicating that there should be no issue here so this is leading us towards perhaps a maintenance or a condition issue uh, and that's really where we should be exploring those results and so this this model was constructed also in coordination with the region of Niagara and coordination with the master plan and the rationale for that was that now you have a common tool moving forward, so you have a common understanding of your shared system and your shared interactions. So you don't have a process of one tool resulting in one set of results and another tool resulting in another set. So there, there's commonality moving forward. Um, and so this was an extensive process, and then once that was developed, it was used to one assess how is the system performing today? What are the key causes or potential causes of, of our known issues. And then secondly, once we layer on quite significant growth that we're expecting to see within Niagara Falls, how is that expected to impact the performance? And then the final component is, if we apply these set of upgrades or these different solutions, how is that going to work to resolve these solutions, uh, these issues, and is one more cost effective than the other? <coughs> And so the, the first step uh, that we went through was assessing the system in dry weather flow. So just to provide a little bit of context is, is you've got your sewer pipes and their main objective during most times is conveying the, the wastewater flows from your houses and industries. So you're flushing the toilets, running the tap, uh, industrial processes run off. And, that's hap and so during most of the time, the system is performing more than adequately. There's more than adequate capacity within the system. The, some of the issues are when it rains, you have a component called wet weather flow. That comes in. So it rains, and that rainfall in part gets into the sewer system. In, in parts of your area where you have these combined sewer systems, there's a single pipe conveying the wastewater flow and the stormwater flow. And so all the rain gets into the pipe and gets conveyed out, and then that creates quite large flows. In other parts of the system, there's cracks in the pipes, there's connections from the house, parking lots, various other components that allow the rainwater to get in. And when we talk about basement flooding issues and capacity issues, it's really this wet weather flow component that's coming in and overwhelming the pipes, and that's what's leading to a lot of the capacity issues and, and, and the constraints that, that Watt, Dave and Mr. Watt has identified earlier. So um, the first step that we, we did was to look back and see how successful has some of the previous work been in addressing some of the previously identified issues in, in past um, at PPCPs. So one component of that was to assess how successful have we, has this current sewer separation program been and has it really achieved the objectives that it was trying to achieve. And going through that process, uh, we've identified that currently your, your sewer separation program has been quite successful. It has led to a, a reduction in the wet weather flow coming into your system. In terms of your F55 criteria, which is one of the major criteria with, which is governed by the MOCC, which determines how much uh, overflows you're allowed to have from your sewer system, you're seeing that you're more than meeting that that objective and that through sewer separation you've actually improved on, on your previous targets. Um, it's also helped to reduce your peak wet weather flow rates to some of your key uh, constraints um, points in the system and reducing peak flows to your various um, pump stations. So it's been quite successful, but there's still ongoing issues. 
Sure. Uh, the next component that was also done was layering on growth. And as here on this map, you can see that all these various areas here identify where all the growth is expected to occur over the next 25 years. And so you can see it's a lot of intensification within the downtown core area, and then a lot of growth in towards the south of the system. Um, and going through this process and, and uh, assessing the system, we really we've identified that going through on status quo, there, there's four potential issues moving forward through the system. So some of the key issues is there's, there's a large growth component happening in the south end. And so that really adds a lot of stress to the existing infrastructure that's here. So everything that's south of Niagara Falls has to be pumped up sometimes several times before it goes into what's called the Stanford Interceptor Sewer, which is a large pipe that runs all the way down to the treatment plant. And once we layer on growth, we can see really that the backbones of that system are nearing capacity or start exceeding capacity once we layer on this growth. Uh, the other one that's identified is that there's the Bender Hill pump station. This is a pump station that services the downtown core. It's, it's in a quite constrained and complex area. And although it's, it's not been flagged specifically for upgrades at this time, it's been flagged as being a potential candidate to watch because, again, we're still planning on some using the, the city's planning information. That's within an area where there's a lot of hotels and commercial areas. Um, and that the potential for growth in there can be can far exceed what your current planning um, estimates could be. So, I think Mr. Hamill is going to talk about the the recommendations of the master plan and how they influence the city. Thank you, Julian. Good afternoon and uh, evening, everyone. So, as David and Julian were alluding, it's important that these two studies are aligned and that we're using some of the same base information. So you can see right off the bat. The Niagara Region Master Servicing Plan has used the same growth projections that this team has inputted into your PPCP. So what we're looking for in the city of Niagara Falls is you've got almost 52,000 people and jobs that are going to come to your city up to the year 2041. And what's interesting about that growth, about 64% of that is south of Lundy's Lane and almost 22-23% of that is south of the river. So you've got a very significant portion of your growth happening at the south end and as David was explaining, right now all of that growth gets pumped north to your existing uh, wastewater treatment plant. So when we looked at servicing options underneath the, uh, or sorry, as part of the master servicing plan, we were looking at the capacity constraints of those pumping stations, the Stanford Interceptor and the plant itself. And for those that may or may not be aware, we went through a series of different alternatives that ultimately resulted in the rec recommendation for a new South Niagara Falls wastewater treatment plant. Um, so that was a very significant recommendation that came under the Niagara Region Master Plan. Uh, but what's important as we move forward even to that solution is that the, the solutions that come out of your PPCP need to happen at a local level for even the region's master plan solutions to work. So what we ended up uh, coming up with, as you can see, is in the south end, we still have the Grassy Brook uh, pumping station force main upgrade. We still have the need to convey the flows from the high lift pumping station down to your new site. So that's a significant conveyance project. It does eliminate the need for new capital related to the Stanford Interceptor as well as the wastewater treatment plant. But you can see that there is a significant investment required with this new wastewater treatment plant. So it's, it was a really good exercise that involved uh, region staff. The master servicing plan involved a lot of integration with Kent and, and Jeff and others. So the, the integration between local municipal engineering staff and regional staff planning, as well as engineering, worked out really well. And to come up with this solution, I think, is quite substantial. So this recommendation that's in the MSP has gone through the Public Works Committee at the region level, was also went through regional council on uh, June 8th and the master servicing plan itself, this is just the executive summary, goes on file for public review starting this Thursday, June 15. Um, the other part that I think is important to highlight in there is one of the uh, very strategic elements that we worked on under the MSP was wet weather management. So as David was alluding to and Julian as well, when this wet weather flow gets into your system, it can be very taxing and it can be very expensive to be adding new infrastructure to deal with those flows. So we felt that there's a cost-effective way 
with both the region and local municipality work together to try to address reduction of the wet weather management. So on top of that 180 million that's, that's directed to Niagara Falls, there's another $30 million in wet weather management uh, costs that are built in there as well. So that's something that I think is gonna be uh, very um, substantial and very effective for both the region and, and Niagara Falls to work on in dealing with wet weather issues. So again, this was a, a successful master plan that's coming to its completion as well. And knowing that these pieces are integrated with your PPCP uh, will make for a comprehensive solution across Niagara Falls. So the use, building off the recommendations of the regional master plan, that's really serving as the backbone for what the trunk upgrades are going to be within uh, the city of Niagara Falls. But there still remains a number of local issues uh, within the existing system that need to be addressed. And so from, from earlier, I've mentioned that the dry weather component, which is the 90% of the time, the system is performing quite well. But once we layer on the wet weather flow, we can see that there's starting to be a number of constraints within the system. So right here, we've got a bit of a map of the system. And the green pipes generally represent the performance of the system. And so right now, we can see this is, this is essentially a map of showing how the system is performing under typical dry weather flow. You can see all the pipes are green. Everything is fine. But then when it rains, um, things start to happen. So. The first condition here is these are a number of design storm events that we're running through the system. They're, they're effectively, you know, large storm events that would could occur, and then this is a representation of, of the performance under those storm events. So this is this one here is the two-year storm event, and that really represents it's a it's a storm that you would expect to happen once every two years, um, and so you can see when we have these larger storm events you can see all these red pipes showing up. And these really represent areas that are at risk of potential basement flooding or at the pump stations, potential overflows to the environment. So you can see when we layer just a, a two-year event, you can see the performance that is occurring. And then if we go to a five-year event, you can see that the performance starts to get a little bit worse. And then we go to a 10-year storm event. So this is something I would expect to see once every 10 years. Again, you see the performance. And then when we go to the 25-year storm, once it happens every 25 years, we can see the performance of the system. And so really, with the, the trunk capacity, or with the trunk solutions identified through the master plan, the, the PPCP is really to focus in on, on addressing these red areas. And where the modeling and the various solution analysis comes in is how, what's the best solution to addressing these various issues? Is it, are the pipes too small? Or is it that there's too much wet weather coming into the system and we need to find solutions for getting it out? And so this is really where Dave can take yeah. over and talk about the various uh, options that we've reviewed. So one thing I'd like to stress is um, a lot of people look at the South End uh, wastewater treatment plant as a bit of a panacea. Do we have any plant uh, or capacity issues that will be solved? It's not, in fact, uh, um, there are a number of system constraints. I can point to some of them on the map here. Where we simply, because the system's so leaky, we simply cannot get that wet weather flow out of that area fast enough to get it to a new plant or an old plant. That's when it starts to create basement flooding. So, so a lot of our recommendations are around optimizing your existing system, getting the water out. And a lot of these areas have nothing to do with sewer separation. Some other system challenges. Uh, staff currently don't have uh, an in-depth knowledge of 95% of the system's uh, structural and operating conditioning, meaning what, what sort of condition is it in? Does it have debris? Uh, is, it, is, it, is it near or is it is it imminent failure? Uh, a lot of people will point to age as being an ind indicator of condition. Uh, clearly it's not. Your recent sewer failure was in a sewer pipe that was only 60 years old. Uh, you have pipes that are over 100 years old that are still functional today. So we've, we've recommended uh, an aggressive inspection program over the next three years. There's about 15 to 20 areas in Niagara Falls with chronic maintenance issues. Uh, we sat with your maintenance department over a series of three sessions and we identified these. Clearly, these need to move to capital solutions. 
These are things they maintain on a uh, monthly or uh, bi-monthly basis. They need to move into engineering, be designed out of the system, reconstructed. Um, in terms of looking at overall options and recommendations for the plan, we used a multiple bottom line evaluation. So along the left-hand column, you'll see uh, all the outcomes, the principles or guiding principles that we use to select alternatives. So potential to redu reduce basement flooding, system sustainability, life cycle costs. Um, do nothing is always presented as a, an option under a class environmental assessment. Obviously, we're not going to do that. Uh, you've been very busy increasing storage capacity in a number of areas and storage tanks. Well, this is a viable solution. We would suggest that you're, you're taking on another asset, which you then have to take on the life cycle cost to operate and eventually have to replace. Um, their impact on, uh, on uh, basement flooding is somewhat suspect in that they are designed to a finite return design storm return period, which under climate change now is changing every day. Municipal sewer separation has been, uh, has been quite effective, as Julian's alluded to. Uh, so that stayed in the mix. What we're introducing is a state of good repair program. A lot of your issues are in areas that do not have combined sewers, that are typically separated sewers that span from 1960 to all about 1990. So what we're rec recommending is a hybrid, so state of good repair program with uh, a focus away from sewer separation. I'll explain that in a, in a minute. Continued sewer separation, but getting some understanding of the condition and performance of the rest of the system the 95%. So in terms, you have a five-year forecast in front of you, which is quite detailed. Uh, you need to start doing five-year projections. The region is planning, it doesn't mean a five-year budget commitment, it means a forecast so that, that staff can bring predictability to multi-year programs. When they're applying for provincial, federal, or regional funding, a lot of these funding uh, programs span several years. They need to show that they have some foresight in what they're gonna spend. Good news, I guess, as a councillor, there's minimal budget impact of what we've recommended. It's a bit of a hold year, if you like. So we're saying reduced emphasis on sewer separation. You have some staff execution constraints. Uh, at the end of the day, you've got a, a, a quite a large backlog of sewer separation projects that have already been designed. You don't have enough people in your engineering department to execute them, to build those projects. Uh, conceivably, you could give all that work to consultants like myself. Uh, but we believe you've got to uh, retain some intellectual property and ownership over, over the programs you execute on. So at, at the core of the program, there's a four-year condition assessment and remediation uh, program. That'll be targeted initially in high priority areas to fix the leaks within the system, to look at deteriorated sewers, high risk sewers, uh, look at uh, system bottlenecks. Uh, Julian's talked a lot about wet weather getting in the system. You, you like our modeling starting to show that uh, you likely have conveyance system restrictions in certain areas of the city. You will not know what those are until you inspect the sewers. And this will, uh, this program will provide the information necessary to create a maintenance plan. You should ideally be doing continuous flow monitoring. You're spending 4.5, 4.6 million dollars a year. Uh, it would behoove you to look at what beneficial impact you're getting for spending that kind of money. Additional analysis, maybe some uh, less than popular recommendations. Uh, you're losing your corporate memory through retirements and your wastewater maintenance division. A lot of uh, the information that's collected uh, is collected up here. It's not written down. These people walk out the door. I guess I'm somewhat proof of that. Um, there's low levels of system understanding due to inaccessibility of information. I walked in the maintenance division and saw a map book from 1988. Uh, gladly, we've created new map books for you with updated systems, with updated, updated system information. Uh, you've got a very reactive maintenance state where uh, I spent some time down at the service center. The phone rings. Uh, it, someone's dispatched immediately, irrespective of the type of call it is, um, which is which is of concern because it's an ineff ineffective way to deliver maintenance. Uh, staff on the ground, you get a lot of new young faces there, very eager but they don't have access to the past work history. So they show up on a site and they don't know what's happened prior. Uh, supervisors are spending up, upwards of two hours a day uh, populating your timesheet system, which is uh, not a good use of their time. Uh, that should be entered at source on the job site and, and 
checked by them in the office. Uh, you need some standard operating procedures. Different people are doing jobs differently and uh, some training. So in terms of the programs, we talked about a lot in terms of the capital. One exception being the Mewburn Road Pump Station Servicing Relocation. This is a pump station that's located on private property right now and uh, needs to be moved. Uh, in terms of maintenance and operations, uh, the only standout here is the uh, addition of uh, one FTE. Uh, we think you need a maintenance planner to take that reactive state more into a planned state. And those people could, uh, whoever that person is, could uh, do dual roles between water and wastewater. Develop a long-term maintenance and operations plan. Uh, the city's work management system is basically a timekeeping system right now. Either it needs to be reconfigured or replaced to give staff that, that are working out in the field the information they require to make uh, more informed decisions. We strongly suggest the mobile technology for op staff when they're in the field so they're situationally aware. You know what they're looking at. Um, and start looking at uh, documentation and formalization of customer response times. Seems like every, every customer call is very, very high in priority. From a strategic and policy perspective, um, document and implement levels of service and key performance indicators. So we've come up with a draft set. Uh, we've offered to come back and have a session with council if necessary to talk about those. The city's uh, wastewater design standards need to be updating to reflect need to be updated to reflect technology today. Uh, pretty much every municipality in Ontario right now is developing an extraneous flow public education program. At some point, uh, you may have to go on private property. You probably will. Uh, that shouldn't come as a surprise to the public. You should start informing them now. Uh, you should do some waste, wastewater quality management system reporting. Uh, do some performance standards for new infrastructure. Some of the people we're working with right now in the uh, Toronto area and uh, Regional Halton are, are um, finding out they're building new infrastructure or, or inheriting new subdivisions that have uh, significant wet weather problems. So you don't want to spend all your money trying to solve the problems you've got while inheriting new ones. Uh, extraneous flow prevention training for building department and engineering inspection staff is, uh, is pretty much uh, uniform across Ontario now. Uh, making sure that you're building and you're constructing things and developers or builders are constructing things that don't leak. And you need to review and update your extraneous flow bylaw. So I left this to the end. Um, I did some of this work when I was actually in your employ. Um, once you've got your house in order in terms of your state of good repair program, so you're going to do a four-year program and seal your leaks in the right-of-way, you will likely have to, and if that doesn't have the intended impact in reducing extraneous flow in areas with chronic basement flooding, you will likely have to consider going on private property. I thought I'd bring this for context. So this is this is a job we did in a project we did in the regional halt, and this is a I got rid of the address, but this is a house in uh, in uh, South Burlington. So this is a foundation drain that was disconnected, connected to a sump pump. We put a meter on it. So the 1,400 square foot residence site split. Typical summer storm, about 32.5 millimeters for the imperial people. That's about an inch and a quarter. Uh, the flow from from this foundation drain for this event. So this one day. Uh, I think it was July or June 31st to the first was about 10,000 liters, which is 10 cubic meters. So uh, what, what does that mean? About 100 standard bathtubs or a 12 foot by four foot deep above ground pool. So you gotta realize that if you have an, uh, an area of two and a half thousand homes and they're all discharging at the same time, it doesn't take long for you to overwhelm the system. In terms of budget and funding, uh, there's no appreciable increase other than a moderate increase to operating to fund some maintenance initiatives, the maintenance planner we talked about. I've crossed out, uh, in terms of available funding, the existing CSO funding under the regional municipality of Niagara. Chris has talked about this. It's being replaced with a 10-year fund. It's about $154 million over the next 10 years. Niagara Falls is eligible for $30 million of that. So all the programs that we, we put together, the recommendations we put together, the vast majority of them are eligible under those funding. So there's a general move in the industry to optimization. I have some good friends at the City of Toronto, they're spending 1.5 billion over 10 years to reduce extraneous flow. Regional Halt, uh, Regional Peel, Chris uh, was actually responsible for this recommendation, 100 million over 10 years. 
Regional Halt and I actually wrote that program 10 years, $65 million. And even your neighbors are spending significant monies on, on, on system rehabilitation and optimization. So that's all I had. And thank you for listening. And I, again, I apologize for being late. Thank you very much, David. Uh, any questions of council for our group? Councilor Peter Angelo. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Um, I will get to some questions. I just first of all wanted to uh, thank Mr. Watt and his team. I know Mr. Watt mentioned that he was a past employee here at the City of Niagara Falls, and I'd like to believe that all the expertise that he has, he came from here. Uh, and that was the reason for his recommendations. I also wanted to thank Mr. Holman and Mr. Uh, Shakaskoy uh, for their dedication for this, uh, to this project, Your Worship. Um, the recommendations, in my opinion, are the best case scenario for Niagara Falls. I know it's no secret that Niagara Falls is, uh, has experienced a lot of growth and that we're slated for a lot more growth. And any time that uh, you have a municipality that is experienced a large amount of growth, if the infrastructure doesn't precede the actual growth development, then what you have a lot of times is you have the existing <coughs> landowners who end up facing some challenges because the infrastructure wasn't in place before the development came forward. Um, and I think a second pollution control plant in Niagara Falls uh, would not only help our current situation, as I think you've heard Mr. Watt allude to, um, but it would pave the way for development in the future. Uh, I wanted to ask a question that was in relation to, I had a chance to uh, meet with Mr. Watt, I think it was last year, mm -hmm. and at that time we talked, about, um, we talked about making this facility a true regional facility in the sense that there was other municipalities that were facing some challenges already and that they needed some help. Uh, one of them was, um, one of them was Thorold. Um, I know that uh, in Thorold, all of their flows uh, go down to the Port Weller Pollution Control Plant, and right now a lot of their land has an H symbol on it because the Port Weller plant can't take any more flows. So by allowing some of those flows to come, I guess it would be east to the Niagara Falls second pollution control plant, we'd be able to help Thorold to open up some land. And there was also some pools that were in uh, the Fort Erie boundary, some open pools that we were hoping to actually get those flows a little bit north so that they could be treated as well at the new facility. And that would make it a true regional facility, Your Worship, which would help out more municipalities than just Niagara Falls. So thank you, Mr. Wayne. Yeah, fair comment. A any other questions or comments? Councilor Crater. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, thank you very much. So I, uh, just to share with you, a couple weeks ago we really had a, a rainy spell. So I can tell you during that week, I think I made no difference to any other councilor, I probably went out and visited about 15 homes uh, that had flooding problems. They call you up, you gotta come over and take a look. So I made a point and this is, this is where I'm going. I made a point of calling a number of those people back because I had their phone numbers. And I said, you need to watch City Council tonight because there's going to be a presentation that will explain how we're going to deal with this. Because I, I thought, and I did share this with a number of people, we were really going that direction of separated sewers and that separating the sewers and that would alleviate the problems. But then I'm making notes as you're going, as you're speaking and I'm not getting that feeling. So. For those people that are watching, that don't really grasp everything that you're saying, that had their basements flooded, what is it that we're going to do so next next three weeks from uh, next year, we, they're not going to get those flooding of basements, whether it's over on Homewood, I can give you a name. In fact, I was looking at your map with all the reds. I can remember some of the streets that I mm -hmm. visited. In fact, you I remember a group of neighbors called me because they were panicking, thinking that our swimming pool on Valley Way was going to get flooded. There was so much water because we had put restrictors in, because we didn't want the water going down the drain. So the water was, I drove out there and took a look, the water was building up. They panicked thinking we're gonna have all the water going into the swimming pool and we may not be able to get it open. So the question is pretty simple. If they're, what they're watching tonight, I know they are, can you kind of just say in layman's language, what it is that we're gonna do so they're not gonna have this problem? So through you, your worship, um, the program we've recommended, I, I guess I'll take a step back here. Uh, basement flooding is due to a lot of water. It, there's no smoking gun here. Um, you have basement flooding in combined areas, semi-separated areas, and separated areas. Basement flooding generally in our experience, in our 25 years experience, is generally a, the result of a peak wet weather flow, a lot of flow going in, but it's also a conveyance system issue. 
So the, the program we've recommended, we haven't recommended stopping sewer separation. What we're recommending is this, the condition assessment of every pipe in the system over the next three years. So I don't know the specific 15 homes or the areas uh, willing to talk about that offline that you were referring to, but they'll also benefit from the state of good repair program. So we're ensuring the conveyance system, the, the hydraulic model, which maybe wasn't talked about, assumes that the, uh, a lot of the red you saw, assumes that the pipes in the system are open, that there's no roots, debris, vertical deflections, breaks, collapses. Um, we have to make that assumption right now in Niagara Falls because we don't know any differently. The program we've recommended is to check everything. So that will aid people in combined areas as well as separated areas. We're just decreasing the sewer separation to a rate where we can fund the state of good repair program. So it will help all citizens of Niagara Falls. I happen to be one, so it'll help me as well, as is Ms. Sanders. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Councillor Pietrangelo, you've got to get your answers yet too, and then I've got Councillor Thompson. Yeah, and I guess through you to Mr. Watt, I was just wondering if the facility that you're proposing is still um, going to encompass other municipalities as we had talked about before. <laughs> Uh, so I'll, I'll leave that with you. I'd be happy to uh, answer that, Mr. Mayor. So you're absolutely right that when we did the evaluation of the South Niagara Falls wastewater treatment plant, it wasn't solely to serve as just South Niagara Falls. We were looking to see if there was going to be a broader benefit. So this sort of graphically and schematically shows that the idea will be to split Niagara Falls at Lundy's Lane. So everything south of Lundy's Lane would go to the new plant, that that will allow for you're right, the Thorold South area, which now it pumps north into Port Weller, the plan would be for that whole Thorold South to then come east to South Niagara Falls. Without that flow going into the north side of Niagara Falls, that now provides you a lot of greater flexibility of what's happening in your core, so that'll support your intensification that's happening in those areas if you have any future growth areas to the north. What it also allows us to do is integrate some of the south end of Niagara on the lake to come then into the south, or excuse me, the North Niagara Falls area. So the Queenston plant, we now have the flexibility of decommissioning that Queenston plant and pumping it in. Uh, we did look at some of the lagoons down in that Stevensville, Douglas town. At this time, the, the distance to the plant might be too great to overcome the cost benefit, but the flexibility is there. But what it's really doing, it's putting a facility in a location that's so supportive of what could happen, not only to 2041, but easily expand to support any flexibility if there's continued growth in that whole gateway area. So the idea is it benefits St. Catharines, because now you don't have Thorold South coming into St. Catharines in the Port Weller system. So capacity is improved in St. Catharines, Thorold South is improved, Niagara on the lake is supported, and ultimately, potentially, there's flexibility for Fort Erie and, and greater Niagara Falls. Um, if, if, if I could address while I'm still talking, just the whole issue around state of good repair, I think it's important to talk about what David's explaining by, by looking at your condition of your existing infrastructure, the solutions are gonna become much more apparent on whether it's relining, fixing cracks, and what's happening, if you just simply separate and build new pipes, you still have those old problems in the pipes that were there before. So with a more focused effort to get that information, to get that data, to actually better and more cost effectively spend money on fixing the issues of your existing pipes, you're gonna gain capacity, which is gonna help prevent a lot of that backups that you're seeing in the system. Yeah, Councilor? Yeah, thanks, Your Worship, and I, pre uh, and it, sorry, I appreciate Mr. Hamill's uh, comments and uh, uh, and the fact that we are going to be helping out other municipalities as well, which will make it more of a regional facility. Um, perhaps if we need to send a resolution to the region, then we could also uh, send this on to uh, the municipality of Niagara Lake and also Thorold, since they'll become a beneficiary of this plan. Um, I also wanted to mention, Your Worship, that uh, I, I don't know if Mr. Holman wants to highlight the fact that I think Council had approved uh, almost one and a half million dollars this year in our capital budget to um, inspect our system uh, to make sure um, uh, that what we had uh, didn't have any blockages in it and that we were replacing pipes as we should. And I think that's what Mr. Watt is alluding to. Yep, Mr. Holman. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, thanks, uh, Councillor. Uh, we have approved uh, $1.4 million for upgrading and uh, monitoring our systems to make sure that we understand how it works. We just need to put some staff in the right positions now. 
uh, to be able to interpret what's happening in the field and to, uh, to develop those programs that Mr. Watt pointed out that are going to help us uh, make sure the system that we already have are working uh, to their full capacity. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I'm sorry, you're, you're asking if, if that's no, going to be done no, this year? No. No, the only thing I was going to say, Your Worship, is it, it, it's not something that we're looking at doing. It's something that we are currently doing. The money was already approved right. to be spent this year. So it's not something that we're going to be looking at doing. It's something that we're actually uh, doing right now. Okay. That's all I wanted to yep. point out. Correct. Thank you for that. I've got Councillor Thompson and then Campbell. Yeah, I just want to say. Uh, uh, I was here when Mr. Watt was here and he was an excellent employee at that particular time, but I just wanted to say how much I enjoyed the presentation. Very different, very unique, and uh, really lays out uh, a long-term plan for us, uh, which is really essential at this particular time. But I particularly enjoyed your comments about mentioning specific deficiencies which is unique, uh, haven't seen that done before. So nice to see you again and congratulations on the presentation. Thank you for that, Councillor Campbell. Thank you, Your Worship. I just have uh, one very simple question. Um, how effective are reverse flow valves in terms of preventing or reducing flow? Uh, Mr. Through you, Mr. Mayor, I've uh, got a long history of uh, backwater valves on residential properties if they're installed appropriately in conjunction with a sump pump by qualified staff, uh, they're highly effective. So that's something that we as citizens could consider if that uh, we live in a zone that has high flooding, we should contact somebody professionally to have this installed. My understanding, Mr. Mayor, is you've got an existing pro uh, program called the RAP program right. that provides subsidies uh, with respect to backwater valve installation and foundation drain disconnection. The key, the key takeaway here is you can install a backwater valve without disconnecting your foundation drain or you'll flood yourself. Thank you. Thank you for that. Any other questions or comments of council? Okay, seeing none, we have uh, two recommendations here. Looking for someone to move the, uh, okay, moved by Councillor Creator, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo. There's any, does everyone see the recommendations? Bottom line is this report is received. Staff are directed to finalize City of Niagara Falls Pollution Prevention Control Plan, update the study report and supporting documents and post them on for the mandated 30-day review period in accordance with the municipal class environmental assessment process. And secondly, the staff be directed to integrate the recommendations contained, update the study into the Municipal Works Department priorities, including future capital and operating budgets. That's the recommendations. It's been moved and seconded. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. So thank you very much. Appreciate your uh, patience and traffic today too, folks. We'll see you back at the region. Yep. Who's the chair? Tino, Tino's the chair. Okay, well, next up is the Arts and Arts, Culture and History Committee. And uh, if you guys are still awake back there. I'm here. All right. Got Laura Moffat and Dino Fazio. If you want to mm. take it from here and introduce your clan, you've got some people here with you as well. We do. A person. Well, good evening. My name's Lori Moffat, and I am co chair of the Arts and Culture and Museum Committee. And I'm Dino Fazio, the other co chair of the committee. And here tonight with us from the committee is Diane Monroe uh, for us as we uh, are here to present. Or what we're here to do is we're very pleased to be here tonight to present the um, 2017 Alistair Young Arts and Culture Endowment Fund recipient with her check. In 1997, Mr. Alistair Young donated a 1932 Ford Roadster to the then Arts and Culture Commission. The car was raffled off and the money raised from the sale of tickets was used to establish an Arts and Culture Endowment Fund. Since then, the Endowment Fund has undergone several changes, all with the approval of Mr. Young. Applicants must be residents of Niagara Falls and be active artists in any of the creative arts fields. Recipients must be in grade 12 and 
or above to uh, receive the award. Applicants don't need to be a student and any artist between the ages of 16 and, well, 100, they say, but we wouldn't turn down anybody over that age. Um, are, they're encouraged to uh, apply. The one award of $1,000 is awarded each year. And every year, the Arts, Culture, and Museum Committee get excited by the talent that exists in this community. And we're very happy to be able to provide this award to assist uh, with their pursuits. And we're very happy to announce that the 2017 winner of the Alistair Young Endowment is Sarah Lou Stewart. Sarah Lou is a talented a visual artist who has received her Bachelor of Arts in English and Visual Arts and a Master of Arts in English from Brock University. She has volunteered and worked at several events in Niagara Falls, providing her experience in visual arts and her passion in, to create interesting spaces within our community. She is the co-founder and executive director of the Harmonic Shadows Circus, which specializes in curating pop-up performances and art spaces that encourage peace, joy, and audience participation under the philosophy that art is healing. Her intention with this award is to complete her series, Stewards of Mist and Thunder, a large-scale series of paintings examining the stewards who keep care of things. And we, as citizens of Niagara Falls, fall into the role of keepers of a small little cataract known as the falls. So, Mr. Mayor, if I could, uh, you and Sarah, and uh, we'll have Laura and I, will go and have a photo op and chef presentation. Right, Clark? Okay. Oh, we have to come around. Yes, Councillor Campbell. I'd like to uh, bring forward uh, RNC 2017-09 oh, yes. from the uh, consent agenda while the uh, Arts and Culture Committee people are still here. This is dealing with the uh, Street Performance uh, Pilot Project for Busky. Yes, certainly. Yes, okay, uh, Ms. Moldenhauer, would you like to uh, speak to this? Thank you. The um, report that is in front of you, that this is a uh, follow-up report from a request that came to council a few years ago that instructed staff and our Arts and Culture Committee at the time to look at the possibility of having buskers. Yes. So our newly formed Arts, Culture, and Museum Committee, they have formed a subcommittee over the last year to look at this and actually we do have the chair here tonight of that subcommittee Diane Monroe so if council does have any questions she's here to speak to them the the report in front of you tonight this is simply a pilot project and Diane and her subcommittee member, committee members they did meet with all of the BIAs to see if they would be interested in participating at this point in time, there is only one BIA that will be participating, and that is the downtown Queen Street. The committee will work with the BIA to select the locations and to also help them with the selection of the musicians for this pilot project. As it is a pilot project, we're proposing a $10 license fee for this year. Next year, there'll be a full year if we do go ahead with a pilot project, and the proposed fee is $25. The um, opportunity to busker, I'm sure a lot of you have been in Toronto, 
New York City, Montreal, almost anywhere, and you have seen the buskers on the street, it's an opportunity for musicians to put out their hat, their guitar case, and people on appreciation of their performance will provide them with tips. We're not looking at actually paying the musicians. This is buskering, where they have the opportunity to go out on the street and perform, and then again, it's appreciation. People will provide tips to them. So as I mentioned, Diane is here to speak to the report. If you do have any questions, I can ask, answer questions. Clark can answer any questions. We're all here tonight because we're really hopeful that we can go ahead with this project because we believe that it will be great for our community because they have asked for this in the last couple of years. Thank you for that, uh, Ms. Bolden Howard. Do we have, come up, Diane. Yep. Thank you very much. Appreciate your You're work welcome. on this and your committee. Uh, are there any questions of council? Does anyone have the report? Um, you might want to find it. It's um, it's consent agenda, right? Yes. Yeah, RC 2017 09. Let's make sure everybody's got it. Just, just give them half a second to uh, share. Does everybody have it? Yes, they did, but in case they didn't remember, it was a big package. So do we have any questions, first of all, for Diane or for Ms. Moldenhauer? Okay, so we're looking for, uh, we've got a recommendation. Looking, okay, it's going to be moved by Councillor Campbell, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo. Any discussion or questions? Seeing none, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimously approved. So thank, thank you, you for coming much. out. Good luck. Look forward to hearing the results. Thank you. Thank you very much. Planning now, right? Yeah. What do we got? District Airport or what's the first one? What's the first one? Oh no, there it is. Medical marijuana. Medical marijuana. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Clerk. Would you please introduce the next item on the agenda as we move into our planning portion of the meeting tonight? A uh, public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed amendment to the city's zoning bylaw to permit a medical marijuana facility at 6471 Kister Road. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the Planning Act on May 12th, 2017 and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who wants notice of the passage of the zoning bylaw amendment to participate in any site plan process, if applicable, or preserve their opportunity to appeal to the Ontario Municipal Board, shall leave their name on the sign-in sheets outside the council chamber. Thank you very much, Mr. Clerk. I now ask our Director of Planning, Mr. Herlovich, to explain the purpose and reason for the proposed bylaw amendment. Thank you, Worship. This is an existing property and building in our uh, Stanley Industrial Park at the south end of town. The uh, property is on the west side of Kister Road between Progress and Don Murray Street. The uh, site is just under a ha uh, half hectare in size. The uh, property is uh, zoned and designated for industrial purposes. Uh, the immediate uses to the um, north, south, east, and west are industrial uses, uh, about 300 meters to the north. That's a little uh, around 1,000 feet. Uh, there are some in, uh, existing residential uses. Uh, they are in an industrial zone, so they're legal non-conforming, but they are residential use and they're considered um, a sensitive land use by our uh, definition in the uh, city zoning bylaw. And I also point out that uh, further to the west is uh, a creek which separates the uh, industrial lands from the uh, thundering waters uh, paradise planning area that uh, we have heard some discussion on in the past. The uh, building itself is uh, 629 square meters, so the proposal is to the, use the existing building. Uh, there's a paved parking area at the front, and then there's a gravel loading area at the back of the property. The applicant is um, requesting that the current general industrial zone um, be uh, 
amended to add a medical marijuana facility to the site, so it would be a site specific use. Uh, medical marijuana facility was defined uh, by this council a few years ago uh, and rather than allowing uh, these kinds of facilities as of right, council determined that we would deal with them on a site by site basis and that's the reason for this application tonight. Um, we did have a neighborhood meeting in May of this year. There were eight nearby landowners who came out. They were largely concerned about security. Uh, they did ask about emissions, traffic and employment. Um, the applicant did say that they would have to adhere to the uh, requirements of the, uh, the province in respect to the facility. Uh, the, there's no cultivation planned, so they would actually be bringing in the uh, uh, dried plants, and from that they would be processing those uh, into, um, into oils and, uh, and, um, and um, tablets. And the, uh, in terms of air emissions, those are concer um, controlled through uh, HEPA filters, uh, there were no storefront uh, sales. This is purely a, um, uh, a wholesale facility so that there would be only commercial couriers and it would have about 10 to 20 employees. Uh, I mentioned already the lands are designated for industrial purposes in our official plan which pr uh, provides for manufacturing and processing. So basically this plant would be taking the uh, marijuana plants, the cannabis plants, they would be um, processing those, putting them into capsules and bottles, and uh, they would be sold um, through uh, uh, a warehousing as a warehousing facility. The uh, the zoning, and I already mentioned this, council added this as a use uh, in 2015, uh, but with the proviso that anybody would have to come back on a site specific basis. Council also required that they be separated from sensitive land uses, we define what sensitive land uses are, the residential uses, campgrounds, daycare, schools and institutional uses, also parks and playgrounds. So uh, as I pointed out, the, uh, um, the closest residential use is uh, 300 meters uh, away from this facility. Um, the, uh, as well, the uh, uh, current range of uh, Manufacturing would provide for laboratory uses, uh, just would not pro provide for the uh, uh, production of cannabis into uh, the pharmaceutical product. Um, the uh, proposed land use does conform with our medical marijuana facility definition. The lands are, as I've said, well removed from sensitive uses. The facility has yet to obtain and would be required to obtain a federal license uh, in order to uh, produce on the site. And so this rezoning is the first step in that requirement. Um, there, is, there are provisions that they would have to be a uh, uh, secure site, there's perimeter fencing, surveillance systems, and the product would be kept in a vault. Uh, so these requirements are seen as elements to reduce uh, potential criminal activity. The uh, uh, Proposal, therefore, is being recommended by staff because it is in an industrial area. It's in an area where we expect um, uh, production, manufacturing of pharmaceuticals and other types of, uh, of um, merchandise. As well, the site is located in excess of 300 meters from sensitive land uses, and there will be security requirements uh, to meet the federal license should there be granted such a license. Uh, therefore, the recommendation is that council approve the zoning bylaw before you tonight uh, for the medical marijuana facility at uh, 6471 Kister Road. Those are the highlights of this application. Thank you, Mr. Hurlovich. Any questions of counsel for Mr. Hurlovich? Okay, seeing none, members of the public are advised the failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting will result in the Ontario Municipal Board dismissing any referral it receives. Failure to sign the sign-in sheet will result in staff rejecting an appeal as per section 3419 of the Planning Act. Council will now hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to speak to this proposed bylaw amendment. Is there anyone here other than the applicant? Yes, you can step forward. You can state your name and your address. Hello, it's, uh, my name is Clark Bitter. I live in Niagara Falls. I've spoken 
to council before on medical marijuana facilities and uh, the future of cannabis. Um, some of you may recall a couple of years ago, there was uh, potential for two other facilities to come in town, both of which wanted to actually cultivate. Um, and due to small uh, planning reasons, there was, it was rejected. Uh, since then, the federal government has introduced legislation to allow recreational marijuana in addition to medical marijuana. Um, and some numbers have come out to reflect what they see in the future. The current black market on marijuana for recreational uses is about $8 billion a year in an economy. To put that in perspective, um, wine is about $6.5 billion a year. The introduction of recreational marijuana will bring about $9.5 to $10 billion to the economy of Canada, which is a full one-third more than wine. Tourism will be huge. Um, this, I know, is a medical facility. The licensing laws are all changing now. Uh, recent new applications have come out from the federal government to allow for the production of recreational marijuana. And I think um, this is a great opportunity for this council to start addressing that and thinking about it because when the federal laws do get passed, they put the onus onto municipalities and the province to say what we are going to do, what we'd like to see as people of Niagara Falls and what you'd like to see as the Council of Niagara Falls. I myself am a medical patient. I've recently been told that I might have multiple sclerosis and we've taken a, a chance to um, use cannabis as a prophylactic type treatment to hopefully stave it off so that I never do have to take some of the heavier medications required for this. Uh, my wife has a brain tumor that has uh, unfortunately started to progress and uh, we are going to go through a, a process using exactly what these people are, are planning on making here in our backyard that may save her life. Um, I think this is something that's very important. It helps a lot of people. Uh, we earlier saw some people here speaking about drug addictions and problems with that. Cannabis is being used in the treatment of pain as an alternative to opiates. We have a huge problem with opiates in this country and, and throughout the world. Um, the use of cannabis at the end of the pain cycle for, say, operations or uh, a, a knee can prevent that post-operative addiction that is, is a huge problem for a lot of people. Um, I really hope that Council takes the recommendation of staff that approves this facility. Um, those, that's all in addition, of course, to jobs which is something that uh, I think every single one of you ran on. <laughs> and uh, we here in Niagara would like to see, these are, these are good paying jobs. I believe every one of the jobs that they posted in the report was over $50,000 a year, um, which is a good number here in, in Niagara. <coughs> Other than that, uh, I just, I, I want you to use this opportunity to possibly think about what the future, one year from now when recreational mar marijuana is available, uh, and people will be growing it legally in their backyards, up to four plants, one meter tall. It's an opportunity for us to start that discussion now on what we'd like to see, both maybe in the tourism sector or just in recreational as it is, because it's, it's your voice that the province is going to listen to moving into the election. And I think we, we have a great opportunity to capitalize um, economically. Again, it's a one-third more than wine, and we in the Niagara region put a lot of emphasis on wine. And if we really look at what cannabis is going to bring to the table in the future, there's a lot of opportunity there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else here other than the applicant? Bless you. Okay, seeing none, Council will now hear from the applicant or his or her representative. Good evening, Worship, members of council. My name is Rocky Vaca. I'm from the law firm Sullivan Manny. Uh, appearing this evening with me is the applicant, Alex Chinkarenko. Um, Alex? 
Alex was uh, stuck on the QEW, but was able to get here. His uh, partner, uh, uh, Sergey Mokin, is still on the QEW. And his security consultant, David Hyde, is still on the QEW. So we're going to do the best we can. Uh, I am pleased to say that we have re re received and reviewed the planning recommendation report prepared by your planning department, and we are in full agreement with their conclusions and recommendation of approval. Um, also, I want to thank Clark for his comments. Uh, I met Clark for the first time this evening. Um, he's very knowledgeable in this area, very eloquent, and uh, I think his comments should be given some weight. Um, also, I want to point out that this is my client's first experience of doing business in the city of Niagara Falls, and he wanted me to relay to you what a pleasure it has been dealing with your business development staff and your planning department. We have a brief PowerPoint presentation, but before we proceed with that, I want to outline some key points. First, marijuana for medical purposes is a proven medical treatment relied upon by many to get through their daily lives. This facility is both needed and important to have in our city. Secondly, this facility will not be cultivating marijuana plants. Very important to keep in mind. But instead, will simply be a processing facility for the extraction capsuling and bottling of cannabis product. Also, this will not be a retail facility. Thirdly, its location in the city's industrial park is ideal for the following reasons. The nearest residences are legal, non-conforming, on industrially zoned lands more than 300 meters away. So the 300 meters away, and according to your planning documents, there's an expectation they're not gonna be there forever. Secondly, it's surrounded by many more, uh, much more intrusive industrial uses in terms of noise, emissions, and traffic. Lastly, Health Canada licensing mandates that the facility has security fencing, 24-7 surveillance, high-level security clearances by its operators and employees, and odor controlling filters, etc., amongst many other Health Canada mandatory requirements. At this point in time, I'd like to call up uh, Alex, and uh, we're going to go through the PowerPoint presentation, which someone may need to assist me to, to get going. Okay, there we go. The floor is yours. I don't know how to start this. Perhaps the slides are at the top. All right. <coughs> Get there. Well, thank you everyone for, for having me here. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the applicant. My name is Alex Shinkarenko, and thank you, Robert, for the introductory remarks. Um, fortunately, my partner couldn't be here because he's still uh, stuck in traffic. Uh, my background is engineering, and now I also practice law, but not municipal law, so I can't make the same types of submissions as uh, Rocco with the same degree of intelligence. So uh, here's my portion. Um, we are here uh, on behalf of a company. Sergey and I are both directors of a numbered company currently, and we're dealing with medical marijuana extracts only, uh, so no cultivation. A bit of a background for you. Uh, we have approximately 480 extractable compounds called cannabinoids, which are derived from the plant. Uh, the most common of these are THC and CBD. And you can see based on the pie chart that most of these, in, at least in the medicinal realm, are used to treat uh, chronic pain. So that's what we're going to be targeting as part of our business plan. Uh, now, in terms of the difference between smokables and extracts, there are a lot of advantages, as you can see on the right, uh, based, on, based on the consumption of extracts. One is uh, precise dosing. That's very important for us because we're going to be dealing with people with serious conditions such as cancer, uh, nerve chronic pain, for example, etc. Uh, you have the benefits of long-lasting health. Um, you have also the fact that you're avoiding the carcinogenic effects of smoking in general. So what are we going to be doing exactly? We're going to be taking uh, uh, the plant wholesale from existing licensed producers in Canada. That's the only legal way to do it under the current regulations uh, in the ACMPR. I'll talk about that in a few slides. Uh, we're going to be converting it, processing it through an ex sophisticated CO2 extraction process into oils. And then we're going to be dispensing it in the form of uh, capsules and bottled oil. And those are the only two valid legal forms 
uh, permitted under the ACMPR today. We expect that to change, but currently that is the state. So where are we at in terms of legislation? Uh, medical marijuana has been around in, in, one, in some shape or form since 2001. Uh, the original legislation was the MMAR, and essentially what happened under the MMAR is people were allowed to either grow for themselves with a valid prescription through a doctor, or they were allowed to grow through others through a designated grow status. Uh, the problem with the MMAR, and as the country would find out over the next five years, is that people abuse their designated grow status by growing more than their permitted quota, and the excess began being diverted into the illicit market. That's actually the reason why you have a lot of these illegal dispensaries today. The supply is being fed from these excess designated growers. In 2013, the government came out with the MMPR due to these reasons and, and other reasons. Uh, and that is a system that we largely see today. We have more than 45 licensed producers, um, and these are large-scale, sophisticated commercial operations that undergo a sophisticated and long uh, licensing process. So that's uh, what we aspire to be. The ACMPR is the current state uh, of the law, and that essentially combines some elements from both uh, types, both legislations that we saw previously. So what does the licensing process look like? Uh, just briefly, it's a very intense and rigorous process. Uh, taking over two years. Um, in, in, in the case of large grow ops, it can take between five and ten years. Several stages involved. Uh, right now we're in enhanced screening. Uh, security clearance is the next stage that we'll be going through and that is where the Health Canada deals with um, the RCMP directly for, to make sure that, it doesn't, uh, that an operation like this doesn't get run by the improper individuals. We've hired several consultants throughout the, since the beginning of this project actually, and one of, the, one of the consultants that we hired is Mr. David Hyde, who is also uh, stuck in traffic. So I'll do my best to describe why this location is suitable according to what's called the threat risk assessment, which is essentially a pretty elaborate report that uh, Mr. David Hyde uh, provided for us. Uh, proximity to emergency services such as fire and police was noted. Um, the fact that it's segregated from sensitive use areas, now Health Canada uses the same designations as uh, Niagara Falls does in designating what is a sensitive use, so residential, schools, etc. We've got 300 meters to the north, uh, as was mentioned earlier uh, in this presentation. <clears throat> and finally, we've selected the building based on its actual layout and, and how robust it is. It's, um, it's concrete, it's reinforced concrete, uh, steel, and it's already uh, lined with a perimeter fence that's about 8 meters high with barbed wire. So that certainly helps in complying with the sophisticated uh, security requirements which fall under the ACMPR. It's called the Security Directive. It's about 100 pages long. Uh, Rocco, would you like to sure. discuss the slide? So, Your Worship, members of Council, you will, you will recall that two years ago you considered a citywide zoning bylaw amendment relating to uh, medical marijuana facilities as a permitted use. On the table at that time was allowing this as of right in certain zones, such as industrial zones, provided that there was a specific setback from sensitive land uses, such as residences, churches, etc. Uh, at that time, the city's consultant was recommending a 20 meter setback. Other setbacks examined in the staff report in 2015 were 70 meters and 300 meters. The left side of the, uh, of the slide is an actual attachment to the 2015 report that looked at a setback of 300 meters. The areas in black are those areas which would allow a facility if there was a 300 meter setback. You will see that we've located our property uh, in the black area. So it does comply with what was considered in 2015. Also the slide at the right side compares a cultivation facility with the proposed extraction facility. Uh, in that, firstly, this operation requires a much reduced physical footprint. Secondly, it eliminates or drastically reduces any odor emissions. And thirdly, it produces only organic and recyclable waste. And finally, the last slide that, that I'd like to address uh, tonight is the contributions to the Niagara region. Uh, as, as referred to earlier, um, it, it isn't cheap to run, these, to run one of these facilities, uh, but the potential payout is significant. Uh, just in the first three years, 
uh, we'll be expecting to hire those individuals listed on the slide. Um, very few of those positions will be minimum wage positions, but we will require those as well, uh, such as receptionists and, and call center people. Uh, beyond that, we'll be looking for people from the Niagara region with degrees, uh, community college, um, uh, university, uh, to take the roles of, of, for example, a process engineer or a quality assurance individual. Um, in terms of retrofits, it's another contribution we'll be making to Niagara Falls because we will be uh, seeking, uh, through a tendering process, uh, contractors and subcontractors to deal with the various aspects of the retrofits, which we expect, that's actually a lowball estimate, we expect the retrofits will cost approximately $1.4 million. Uh, and then in years four to six of operations, we hope to uh, double, if not triple, all of those numbers. So thank you for... Thank, Thank you very you much, you Alex time. and Rocky. Any, uh, I've got Councilor Morocco, then Iannone. Anyone else? Oh, Your Worship. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Baca. Thank you very much. And thank you. Greatly appreciate it. I have to say that there's always the right place and the right time. And I think that uh, this project is, is in the right location. Um, I looked and I only saw one person's uh, comment, and that basically that was in concern to safety and making sure that but that's part of the provincial regulations that are outlined provincially federally. So I have to say that uh, when the time has come, I'd like to uh, make the motion to support the recommendation. Okay, thank you for that. Councillor Anoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to the speaker, I want to say I'm really thrilled to see you had a security consultant. Sorry to see he's not here, but I'm glad to see you had them. That was my concern with the last two applications that came before us. The need, the, such a high need for security means that the residents in the area behind the residential area would have had no privacy either. And I really like that where the location is. I like the fact that the industri industry beside you will also have security. It will be pretty hard to get from point A to point B without being picked up somewhere. So I like the fact that you have it out there and, and you, you've, you've managed to massage it into a zone that it actually works. So if Councillor Morocco's proposing to make the the motion, I'd happy to second it when you close the meeting. Okay, thank you. I've got uh, now Councillor Pierangelo, Thompson, and Crater. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. I also want to say that I really find this application to be easily supported. Uh, I think that two years ago when we were dealing with the two applications that we had, um, Council made the right decision in, uh, I, I guess, going against the Committee of Adjustments recommendations to allow those facilities and obviously the Government of Canada agrees with us as well because uh, I know that the uh, speaker alluded to the fact that there are sensitive uses and that these facilities should not be located around residences, around schools and, and, and around churches and other such uses. I think the industrial area that's being proposed is a perfect location and I'd be happy to move the motion as well when it comes forward. Thank you very much. Councillor Thompson. Yes, uh, I... Um I'm pleased to uh, have the opportunity to uh, speak on this issue. Um, I came into my office this morning and there was a uh, message left. And uh, uh, actually a gentleman that I know, uh, elderly, uh, older than me. <laughs> wow. Uh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> but, but he was on the phone uh, for the entire time uh, talking about drug abuse. He must have heard that this application was on the agenda tonight, and he went on and on about uh, drugs and people and relating to this. And I didn't have the chance to uh, call him back, and I was delighted to hear uh, Mark Bitter's uh, comments, and I wish I had, to, had, I had the knowledge that he had uh, with respect to this uh, topic, but this is without exception uh, uh, great timing, and all every anybody who ever had any doubt about uh, medical marijuana, uh, all they had to do is to see one or two of the programs that have been on TV uh, regarding uh, uh, young children having seizures like 30 and 40 a day, and just by the opportunity, and some of them moved out of places where they were in the states to other states where medical uh, marijuana was legal, and they immediately were able to resolve the seizure problem. And uh, that just tells you how important it is uh, to move on with this. 
uh, and particularly the location, uh, the processing, uh, all fits in with uh, what should happen and uh, has absolutely nothing to do with the, the abuse of other drugs. Uh, this is for medical purp purp purposes, but also, uh, as we know, it's going to be approved by the federal government for recreation in the future. But uh, great application, and uh, I support it wholeheartedly. Thank you. Councilor Crater, no, you're good. Okay, Councilor Campbell. Thank you, Your Worship. I just wanted to follow up on uh, Councilor Iannone's comments. I have a very good friend in the Waterloo area that is uh, in the same business. He's been at it for about two and a half, three years now, and he just got the final uh, authority to move forward. When they were buying their property, they were a little paranoid about the fact that they were going into an industrial area, and they were welcomed with open arms. The security around these facilities is phenomenal. It's, uh, it's, it's to the point where the uh, uh, problems in this industrial area have almost been re reduced to zero because of the increased security with, from this factor. So I, I support this wholeheartedly. That's great. Well, if there's no further comments, the public meeting with respect to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment is now concluded. Councilor Morocco, you wanted to move yes. the, the recommendation, second by Councilor Iannone. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thanks very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Tell your friends to turn around and go back, right? They're okay. <laughs> 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 Okay, moving on to PBD 2017-20. Uh, Mr. Clerk, would you please introduce this next item on the agenda? Public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed amendment to the city's zoning bylaw. To, uh, sorry, that's the one I was just reading. Uh, consider a proposed amendment to the city's zoning bylaw and plan of vacant land condominium mm -hmm. at 7736 and 7746 Beaver Dams Road. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the Planning Act on May 12, 2017, and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who wants notice of the passage of the zoning bylaw amendment and approval of the vacant land condominium to participate in any site plan process, if applicable, or preserve their opportunity to appeal to the Ontario Municipal Board, shall leave their name on the sign-in sheets outside the council chamber. Thank you very much, Mr. Clerk. Now I'd ask our Director of Planning, Mr. Herlovich, to explain the purpose of this application and the reason for the proposed bylaw amendment. Okay, thank you, Worship. Yes, this application is on the uh, west side of Beaver Dams Road and um, immediately north of Lundy's Lane. It's behind uh, a, uh, num a number of commercial properties which contain uh, motels. So it's actually a big uh, parcel of land which is in between uh, the d uh, dwellings on Beaver Dams and the commercial on Lundy's Lane. The uh, parcel itself is about three quarters of an acre. It's actually two parcels. Uh, of land uh, which uh, basically keys in behind the residential properties on uh, Beaver Dams Road. The uh, proposed townhouse development uh, is a combination of uh, single and two-story townhouse units uh, that would face internal uh, to the site. The uh, proposed layout then is there would be a single driveway coming uh, west from Beaver Dams Road and providing access uh, to the uh, townhouse units uh, themselves. Uh, there are 10 units proposed. Um, the city clerk mentioned that uh, it says rezoning and a vacant land condominium. So vacant land means that we're actually creating 10 parcels of land and then the units are built on those parcels and the parcels then uh, are sold uh, within the condominium uh, process. In addition to the uh, parking in the garage, there's a parking space in front of each of the units, and then there are four visitor parking spaces uh, on the property as well. Uh, the applicant is looking for some changes from our standard um, zoning that would be applicable to, uh, 
townhouses. So they're looking for a reduction of front yard depth to 4.5 meters. We have reduced frontages for the dwelling unit. We almost always require six meters between the uh, property line and the uh, front of the building for parking. So in this case, there's no parking proposed on Beaver Dam. The uh, rear yard depths, both along the south lot line, backing onto the motels, and on the uh, west lot line to the left on the slide, uh, would have a rear yard uh, privacy area of 6.0 meters. And then there are uh, interior side yards proposed on the north and south side of 1.3 meters. The um, property itself, as I mentioned, there, uh, is requiring that the, uh, we add the, change the use of the land from R1C to an R4 zone uh, with the intention of uh, adjusting the front rear uh, privacy yards, the front yard, the side yard depth, and the, um, um, and the rear yard depth. The, um, we held a neighborhood open house on, in May of this year. Uh, no one came out to the open house uh, regarding this proposal. Uh, the lands are designated residential in the official plan. The official plan provides for a maximum of 40 units per hectare. This particular project has a density of 33 units per hectare. It's quite similar in terms of density to the surrounding uh, housing that's found in the area. And the development is uh, expected to contribute to the city's short-term uh, supply of housing. The uh, zoning for the site, I mentioned they're looking to change it from an R1C to an R4 zone. I uh, outlined the areas in which they're looking for some uh, minor deviations with respect to front yard, side yard, uh, privacy yard, and the rear yard depth. The, um, as well, the, the height of the proposed ta townhouses, I mentioned, uh, vary from one to two stories. Uh, the property does have a common driveway from Beaver Dams. Uh, the reductions that I outlined are acceptable uh, because the south property line of the units are not located to uh, other residences. Uh, so therefore, it doesn't mean, does not mean a loss of privacy. And uh, the potential uh, privacy issues along the westerly lot, uh, the applicant proposes to install um, a 1.8 meter high closed board fence uh, to uh, screen those properties. The uh, plan of condominium uh, would be used to uh, accommodate the sale of these units. I already mentioned there are four additional visitor parking spaces in addition to the parking at each of the, the areas. The developer will be required to enter into a development or condominium agreement rather uh, with the city which will prescribe the necessary works. Uh, the site plan uh, is not required because uh, the condominium will uh, address any of the site servicing, grading, uh, lighting, fencing, waste disposal uh, through that condominium agreement. Uh, Appendix A of the staff report uh, includes all of the uh, uh, recommendations, including those of uh, Canada Post, Bell Canada, and Enbridge. Um, therefore, we are recommending the uh, application as it complies with the official plan. It provides for an additional range of housing. It, uh, it is a, um, a comprehensive residential development. will help the city meet its 40% intensification target and that the zoning will provide the appropriate regulations for development. So uh, uh, the region is, uh, is uh, satisfied that these conditions will be included. Um, and therefore, staff is recommending that the vacant land uh, for condominium be approved, that the mayor or his designate be authorized to sign, that the uh, draft approval will run for three years, after which it will lapse. The application to uh, amend the zoning bylaw would also be approved, and the mayor and city clerk would be authorized to execute the condominium agreement um, once the uh, uh, conditions have been satisfied. Those are the highlights of this application. Thank you very much. Mr. Hillovich, are, are there any questions of council for Mr. Hillovich? Seeing none, members of the public are advised that failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting will result in the Ontario Municipal Board dismissing, dismissing any referral it receives. Failure to sign the sign-in sheet will result in staff rejecting an appeal as per section 
3419 or 5139 of the Planning Act. Council will now hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to speak to the proposed application. So anyone here other than the applicant? Okay, seeing now none, council will now hear from the applicant or his or her representative. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Uh, my name is Greg Hind. Uh, I'm a professional planner with the Quartec Group and uh, I have uh, participated in planning projects for a very, very long time in, in the Niagara region and the province of Ontario. Um, <clears throat> tonight I represent Mark and Debbie Scavatici. Um, Mark is uh, out of town um, and I think Debbie poked her head in here and is nervous out in the lobby, so um, we will um, represent them adequately, I think. Uh, we do support the recommendations of staff before you. Uh, as uh, Mr. Hurlovich indicated, uh, this is a, a very sensitive infill, a great transition land use between commercial and single family residential. Uh, we've worked with the City of Niagara Falls staff to make sure that not only does the provincial policy statement and the growth plan, and the regional policy plan, and, and the city plan not only are they implemented, but they're implemented in a way that's sensitive to this neighborhood. We think we have a great neighborhood fit. Uh, we're recommending uh, that uh, we use some sort of building materials. Uh, we're recommending that um, we uh, use uh, sensitive, sympathetic roof shapes. Um, three of the units are sold. The range uh, for the, the prices are 550000 and up. Um, the range of units are 1750 to 1850 and so far two of the units have been individually designed by an architect. That means it's not going to be a cookie cutter type of project. Some of these units are 36 foot wide as opposed to the standard townhouse development which is uh, between 20 and 25 foot models. So um, we've uh, taken uh, an approach uh, with the city of uh, Niagara Falls to make sure that the end unit facing Beaver Dams Road is specifically designed to respect the streetscape. It has an articulation to it. It's just not a blank wall. It's windows and doors and, and all those things that represent uh, front yards of the uh, surrounding neighborhood. Um, uh, those are my initial comments unless you have uh, some other uh, that's great. Thank you questions. very much, Mr. Idle. Um, any questions of council? Council Morocco, you had a question? Uh, no, the only comment I have is that uh, it does address infill and it looks like there's no objections and I'd like to uh, move the recommendation when uh, time's come. Okay, okay. So we'll uh, move along and if there's no other questions from Mr. Hyde, we will close the public meeting with respect to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment and vacant land condominium application. So moved by Councillor Morocco and seconded by Councillor Strange. Any discussion to that motion? Seeing none, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved unanimously. So thank you for that. Thank you. Okay, moving on to PBD 2017-22. I'd ask Mr. Clerk to please introduce this next item on the agenda. A public meeting is now being convened to consider a city-initiated amendment to the city's zoning bylaw to address derelict dwellings in the tourist core. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the Planning Act on May 12th, 2017. Anyone who wants notice of the passage of the zoning bylaw amendment or preserve their opportunity to appeal to the Ontario Municipal Board shall leave their names on the sign-in sheets outside the council chamber. Thank you for that, Mr. Clerk. Mr. Herlovich, our Director of Planning, will now explain the purpose and the reason for the proposed bylaw amendment. Thank you, Your Worship. The, um, this is, as the clerk said, a uh, city-initiated application. This affects a significant uh, portion of the, uh, the tourist core uh, located north of Ferry Street and between the Hydro Corridor and Victoria Avenue. Uh, there are some, uh, because this was an originally a residential area, there are a number of dwellings that uh, remain. Uh, many of them are in good repair, but there are many properties which have been allowed to uh, deteriorate over time. 
um, and therefore the uh, uh, concept is to actually try and uh, remove the uh, residential properties which are not contributing uh, to the um, betterment or the better appearance of the uh, community. There are a number located or clustered around Roberts, Robinson Pier, Adelaide, Falls View. These are depicted on this next slide. So there are about 39 residential properties in varying degrees of repair uh, in that highlighted area that was on the uh, initial slide. The, uh, um, in, in 1967, the city adopted an official plan to expand uh, the tourist area of the city. Um, as I said, there were a number of uh, uh, residential properties in this area and expansion into this area has uh, occurred, especially in the periphery, a little slower than uh, was anticipated back in 1967. Uh, some of these uh, properties are vacant um, and if the uh, dwellings were to be removed, uh, they would be assessed as vacant commercial property because they're actually zoned uh, as commercial properties. As a result, uh, people rather than demolishing the bu buildings have basically abandoned or boarded up the buildings because they would then continue to pay the residential uh, tax rate rather than a vacant land commercial rate. Uh, so, uh, in essence, uh, we're allowing the leave up buildings for tax uh, purposes. Um, so back in 2015, uh, we did a pilot project where we rezoned four properties on Fall Falls View Boulevard, which were in poor state of repair. Uh, we rezoned them from tourist commercial to deferred tourist commercial. Uh, the zoning was uh, uh, agreed to and approved by the owner of those properties. Um, as a result, um, we were able to get the owner to remove those properties. The properties have been turned into grass and the assessment office went out and reassessed the properties because it was own deferred tourist commercial. Uh, they retained their uh, vacant residential uh, tax rate and uh, so therefore um, have, uh, uh, have improved the area and therefore building on this uh, pilot project, we want to expand it to the balance of the tourist core. <coughs> um, the lands in the tourist core uh, are developing for a number of tourist serving uses. Uh, the legal non-conforming rights are uh, retained and would allow for the residential uses to continue. However, as I said, the derelict buildings are, um, are not contributing to the uh, overall well-being. So therefore, the uh, rezoning would assist in, uh, in removing these buildings and then provide for some land assembly in the future. The proposal, therefore, is to uh, rezone the subject property. There's a schedule in uh, the, uh, the zoning bylaw that would identify uh, the properties north of Ferry Street and as well as those south of Ferry Street that are in, uh, in poor shape. The um, proposed bylaw would be in place for a period of two years. And the purpose is, is that a dwelling then during that two year period could be uh, removed so it doesn't happen automatically. Some of these buildings, although in poor shape, uh, are <coughs> occupied by resident, residential uh, occupants and therefore we need to give sufficient time to uh, allow for those people to uh, transition out of those uh, properties. So the, um, once the building is down, the uh, property would automatically be uh, rezoned, deferred tourist commercial, and then this uh, uh, permits a single lawful single uh, dwelling um, that could be built in the future, and it allows then the assessment office MPAC to assess the properties as uh, residential. So the, uh, as I said, some of these properties are maintained, so I mentioned those. Uh, if the property is rezoned, deferred tourist <coughs> commercial, and the owner wants to uh, establish a commercial property, he would, or commercial use, he would be coming back to this council to rezone the property back to a tourist commercial. Uh, this approach has worked, as I said, with uh, our pilot project in the area. There are some people in the uh, tourist area who have indicated they do not wish to take advantage of this zoning. Um, but by leaving a two-year window, uh, should those properties be sold, 
uh, the new owners could come in and uh, take advantage of this property. Um, the uh, as, as well, if it's uh, if the owner chooses not to take any of these derelict buildings down, we would be seeking compliance with our property standards bylaw. Uh, again, in order to enhance the uh, the tourist area. Uh, therefore, we found that the uh, proposal does comply with the official plan policies. The appearance of the general our appearance of the tourist core will be improved as a result of these land use changes. Uh, and will provide a favorable impression overall. Therefore, staff is recommending that Council approve this amendment um, to apply site specifically to those lands as shown in the uh, Tourist Commercial of Schedule 1 and that uh, they be defer, uh, zoned Deferred Tourist Commercial conditional on any dwelling uh, being demolished within the two-year period. Uh, there is a uh, bylaw on tonight's agenda of Council and uh, it's recommended that Council pass that when uh, the bylaw section is being dealt with. I didn't need to do that, Phil. Okay, hey, thank you. Thank I have Councillor Thompson and Morocco that have questions. <coughs> well, I just uh, want to say um, it's been a long time coming, but uh, I, I know that uh, Mr. Hurlovich and Mr. Beeman have uh, worked uh, to come up with a solution for this for quite some time. Uh, I was uh, not sure of the date, but he said 1967, we had a secondary plan. Uh, people didn't come out and ask for their rezoning for tourist commercial. It was designated there and they were trapped with that and it caused a lot of people uh, uh, financial difficulties and problems and uh, made it uh, a real blight on the community right in the heart of the tourist area. So uh, I'm delighted that uh, they have come up with this solution. I know it wasn't easy, but uh, this should give the opportunity for uh, the owners to clean up their properties and uh, still remain deferred tourist commercial until such time as something really happens. So congratulations to uh, the staff. Uh, took a long time, but it was uh, certainly worthwhile. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for that. I've got uh, Councilor Morocco. Or were you uh, and Councilor Campbell? Were you moving the recommendation? Oh, sorry, second. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, uh, just a question. I don't. Uh, I would actually second it if uh, that was the case that he was going to. Councilor Thompson was going to um, make the motion. Um, one question: You said that um, it's a two-year window, and if the owner. Uh, does not want to change the zoning and leave a derelict building and then wants to sell it to someone else, then there's another two year. How long do we kind of wait to have this derelict building uh, hanging around there? And one other thing too that you might just answer and uh, someone has asked me about is, uh, you know, you've got this beautiful tourism area. It's all, you know, well ma uh, manicured and landscaped. And then in the heart there, you've got uh, a burnt building that's still, um, there, I think you know where I'm talking mm -hmm. about. Uh, it's been wrapped, and then that was, uh, it didn't work out. And I think, can I have a little bit of an update for some of the people that go by there? And it's just a little bit of an eyesore. So, so Mr. Beeman, one. first question is, what do they do? Can they keep doing two and two and two? And then the uh, uh, no, Johnny Peppers. Work. This is a specific window that's created for, for people to take advantage of now. That's why we put the time period oh. in there. If you continue to have a derelict building after that, then we're going to do the traditional property standards mm -hmm. route. This is a special kind of special offer amnesty, if you will, to get things done now. Okay. Thank you, thank you for clarifying. Them. As thank far you. as the identified building, um, there we are expecting developments on that before the end of the week. Uh, there, That'd there be great. is I'm a, sure the rest of the two are I'm not, would I'm appreciate not, it too. Uh, they've asked me not to say too much, uh, the, right. the people involved, but we're expecting uh, real progress very shortly. Well, that's, that's great, look forward to it. That's terrific, thank you. Councillor Campbell. <coughs> Councillor, uh, Councillor, yep. I'll, send a text message when I'm able to uh, on that. I've just been asked not to say yep. too much just yet by the lawyers involved, but I can, uh, I'll can i be sure. able to inform you as to whether it actually happened or not and what steps we're taking if it doesn't. <coughs> Thank you. Councilor Campbell. Thank you, Your Worship. I, I have somewhat of a concern with respect to the difference between a derelict building and a building that's still being used. And unfortunately, I have a sense that the ones, buildings that are being used 
are by people using it as affordable housing. And we've got a report right here that we just received on the uh, affordable housing reach from the region. Mm -hmm. And there's no affordable housing out there. And I fear that there could be a real large number, significant number of people being evicted by landowners to take advantage of this. My question, I guess, is that ha has that been taken into consideration? Is there a difference between a house that is being used right now by renters as opposed to a derelict building? The, the option is for the landowner. Um, we will be, you know, going after any property that doesn't comply with our property standards bylaw, which includes holes in roofs and missing eaves and um, broken windows, et cetera. Those are all things that um, we generally seek compliance on. Well, that sounds to me like that would be a derelict building, as opposed to a building that's run down. I mean, we all have homes like that in our neighborhoods where right. people that can't afford regular housing uh, are taking advantage of a landlord that, uh, or taking advantage <coughs> of the house being available because of the, the, the cheaper rent. So your worship, I'm not, un I'm not sure what the question is. Well, I'm just afraid that a lot of people are going to be out on the street because there is no affordable housing still for them to go to. Still residential taxes. They're not tourist commercial. Unless they I'm not talking about the taxes. I'm talking about the people that are being housed in some of these houses right now. Councillor uh, Campbell is concerned about people that will be displaced. Yes. There's some people. That's what. That's his concern. I don't. I. We were aware of this risk as a prepared report. I think, uh, Councillor, the risk is relatively minimal because the houses that might be affected that are occupied by and large are very well maintained. Um, I think there's only two or three which are occupied which are a problem but they if we didn't if, if the owner doesn't take advantage of this then we're going to be going after them for significant uh, improvements on the property standards and because we also have an obligation to make sure if people are living there that they meet the minimum that, that there's some minimum degree of, uh, of repair and I think we're looking at, at about uh, I think at maximum five houses that would be in that category in the area so generally speaking, the ones that are really falling down don't have anybody in them. Oh, I could appreciate that. Yeah. And I guess I'm really concerned about yeah. the housing yeah. and the, those five homes. Yeah. But this incentive um, doesn't really affect that. When you've got an occupied house, this incentive doesn't help you because you're paying as a residential taxes anyway. And you pay residential taxes once you get this done. The ones that are affected that would really matter to you is they've got a vacant property with nothing in it. They get residential. If they knock that down, unless they get the rezoning, it goes up to vacant commercial. And I can support yeah. that, yeah. but I can't support someone taking advantage of this bylaw that's being introduced to get people out of their house. Yeah, and that, there's, there will, there may be some cases like that, but I don't really think there's a significant number of them. The people that are that have tenants, generally speaking, want them. They're not, they're not in the business of, of letting the house fall down unless there's nobody in it. That seems to be the pattern we see. Okay. Thank you for those questions and those answers. Um, I'm not sure where, uh, Councillor, you left off here. Um, we have we had everybody speak now? Yes, on both sides? Okay. So if there's no further and final questions of Council, then the public meeting with respect to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment is now concluded. Move. Moved by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Morocco, that the recommendations uh, in the report be passed. We'll call the vote. All those in favor and opposed with one opposed. So that's approved with one opposed. Thank you for that. Got one more, right? Oh, same one, okay. Uh, finding it. Okay, last planning matter, PBD 2017-17. Mr. Clerk, would you please introduce this next item on the agenda?
A public meeting is now being convened to consider a city initiated amendment to the city's official plan and zoning bylaw to implement source water protection policies. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the Planning Act on May 12, 2017. Anyone who wants notice of the passage of the official plan and zoning bylaw amendment to participate in any site plan process, if applicable, or preserve their opportunity to appeal to the Ontario Municipal Board shall leave their name on the sign-in sheets outside the Council Chamber. Thank you for that, Mr. Clerk. And now ask Mr. Hurlovich, our Director of Planning, to explain the purpose and the reason for the proposed bylaw amendment. Yes, thank you, Worship. The, um, the purpose of this amendment is to implement uh, provincial uh, changes under the uh, Clean Water Act of the province, and basically it affects all of the uh, Niagara Peninsula but we're basically uh, concerned about the Niagara Falls portion. The uh, Source Water Protection Act, uh, as I said, was com uh, completed under the Clean Water Act of the province. Uh, this was uh, the um, Source Water Protection Plan, uh, did analyze the, uh, the water intake for the city's uh, drinking supply. Uh, this is down in uh, Chippewa on, at uh, Macklem Street. The uh, source water pollution plan outlines specific policies that need to be implemented through the regional and local official plans uh, in order to protect the quality of source water drinking. So basically that uh, source water protection plan uh, examined uh, currents uh, of uh, water within the Niagara River, which is basically where the city's water supply is drawn from. and so. Uh, they've identified and shown in uh, red on this plan as to the location that uh, would be sensitive should uh, um, various types of materials be dropped into that area. Uh, it would affect the city's uh, drinking water. So basically the province requires that we as a municipality which regulate the land uses take responsibility for putting the appropriate policies and regulations uh, into place. Uh, our policies fall under an IPZ1-1 one -one zone. Um, uh, there are also IPZ2 and IPZ3, but not within Niagara Falls. Uh, so the IPZ1 would prohibit uh, lands within that area in pink being used for a new waste disposal site um, or the application of untreated sewage. Uh, there would be no new stormwater management facilities uh, within uh, the 100 hectare drainage area. Uh, there would be no com new commercial or industrial uses um, allowed within those areas. And that uh, the source water protection plan shows three drainage outlets that are uh, vulnerable within that vulnerable area. There would be no discharge of wastewater from treatment plants. Uh, combined sewer overflows would not be allowed within this area and the discharge from industrial uh, facilities of industrial effluent would not be allowed. The uh, storage handling and application of agricultural uh, source material, basically manure and uh, nutrient supplements uh, would not be allowed as well. Um, the official plan policies have been drafted, those are included in Tonight's agenda basically outlined that we would be responsible for protecting our uh, drinking water supply. Uh, the region has uh, delegated approval of that official plan amendment uh, to the city and the, pro the province uh, does not allow any appeals against this official plan amendment. So once council passes it, uh, it is final. The, uh, the zoning bylaw itself uh, would be an overlay zone on top of the zoning. The majority, there are four different uh, zone categories uh, in this, within this area, uh, largely uh, residential. Uh, the overlay would uh, uh, be a new general provision in the city's uh, zoning bylaw, which would basically outline that area and would prohibit waste disposal sites, <coughs> new storm water management facilities, no uh, new uh, industrial and commercial uses, uh, wastewater treatment plants not allowed, uh, industrial effluent would not be allowed, and agricultural use. In essence, the, ma the majority of items that they've listed would not be even allowed um, on any of those properties now. Most of those properties, uh, if I go back a 
few slides. Oops. Can you go back, Bill, to that red slide? So you can see largely residential along uh, uh, Sarah Street, uh, along uh, Main Street, over to, uh, to uh, Bridgewater Street, and then uh, the front, uh, you know, um, Kingsbridge Park, and then there's uh, uh, um, the property where the, uh, the regional water intake is, and it touches just the bare uh, portion of the um, uh, property there, there's an old motel that's not currently operating but it just touches a bit of the frontage of that so in essence it's not, they're not lands that we expect to see agricultural uh, manure spread there's no sewage treatment plant there's not going to be a waste disposal site which is a landfill um, but in, an, in any event we're going to ensure that those uses do not establish in this area um, so therefore, we are recommending that Council approve the amendments uh, to the City's policy on source water uh, drinking um, for the, uh, from potential contamination. There is an official plan amendment and the zoning ball is in your handout um, in tonight's agenda. And as I said, once passed, those uh, would become final. Those are the highlights. Thank you, Mr. Hurlovich. Any questions of Council for Mr. Hurlovich? Okay, members of the public are advised that a failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting will result in the Ontario Municipal Board dismissing any referral it receives. Failure to sign the sign-in sheets will result in staff rejecting an appeal as per section 3419 of the Planning Act. Is there anyone here who wishes to speak to the proposed bylaw amendment? Okay, seeing none, if there are no further or final questions of council, the public meeting with respect to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment is now concluded. Councilor Peter Angelo. Your Worship, I'd be happy to move the recommendation. This is just common sense. I mean, since it's our water intake uh, and it ends up being the water that we drink and that we use in the city, we want it to be free from as many contaminants as possible. So I'd be happy to move the motion. Okay. That's great. That's moved by and seconded by Councilor Morocco. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you. Bill? Okay, moving on to presentations. We've got an update from our Integrity Commissioner. <coughs> Mr. Brian Duxbury, the Integrity Commissioner appointed by Council will address Council. Welcome, Mr. Duxbury. Yes, uh, good evening, uh, Your Worship, members of Council. Uh, I am Brian Duxbury, and I am your Integrity uh, Commissioner uh, for the matter that's before you this evening. Uh, your Worship, members of Council, I think you have uh, my report on this matter. I don't propose to read my report to, uh, to, to you this evening. Um, I would commend to you paragraphs 36 and 37 of my report where I set out my primary findings and conclusions and I also set out uh, my conclusions at uh, paragraphs uh, 42 and 43 of my report to, to you. And I've also uh, left you with information in respect to the available uh, remedies that uh, you may wish to consider. Um, Your Worship, uh, members of Council, uh, that is my presentation. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, now, Council, I believe everybody has uh, the report. We all received it on uh, yesterday, I, I guess it was. Was it yesterday? <coughs> yeah. So everybody has read the report, and I understand that Mr. Duxbury is not here necessarily to answer questions, but to deliver the report. Is that right? That's right, Your Worship. I've made findings. You have them? Um, yes, I I'm not here to engage in a debate or a dialogue. I, I made findings and given you my conclusions. Okay, thank you for that. Um, do we have any uh, any further input from council or questions or direction? Yes, Councillor Strange. Do we are, are we able to find out? You want to stand up? Sorry, yeah, are we, uh, sorry. Are we are we able to find out who W two and W one? Are or is that highly? Um, I don't know if I direct this to Mr. Beeman or to uh, you want to weigh in here? I'm not sure how this works. Okay. Okay. Find out from Mr. 
<coughs> Mr. Dukesbury cannot disclose that. Okay. I know I'm not sure if maybe some people thought we were gonna ask questions of, uh, uh, of the integrity commissioner and uh, that's not, I guess, the, the format, uh, is that right? So you've done your work, you've done your research, you've done your findings, you've published everything. Uh, we've all read it. Uh, we all understand it. I think it's pretty clear. It's pretty black and white. And uh, now, if we have any questions or comments, uh, Council, this is your time to ask them. Council Morocco? So my question is then, uh, I'm not sure. So then what is what are we, the Baptist Council, to um, deal with the uh, recommendations that you have outlined in your report? Is that correct? That's uh, through uh, you, uh, your worship, uh, I've made no recommendations, but I have advised you of the uh, penalties that are available That's based right. on my findings under the Municipal Act. And if I might, uh, your worship, I, I believe that that is a matter you may wish to canvass uh, uh, tonight. Okay, thank you for that. Appreciate that. Thank you. That answers your question, Councillor? Yeah. Uh, Councillor Carrier. <clears throat> thank you, your worship. Well, I, I'm obviously prepared to speak about this report. It was a great report. Thank you very much. Looks like that our integrity commissioner certainly put a lot of time and effort into the report. Um, I don't know how many people have read the report from cover to cover. Obviously, I, I've read it from cover to cover. Uh, I guess I'll start out by saying, I guess I was most disturbed by the, uh, not so much the, uh, the findings or the results, but the uh, counselor's uh, behavior uh, after the breach and in particular to the uh, to the uh, integrity commissioners uh, not cooperating with the integrity commissioner. Uh, the, after the breach of the in-camera session on January 24th, to me it's it, what's happened after that is much worse than the breach that was done to the voters of taxpayers trust. Uh, the counselor did not cooperate with the integrity commissioner um, as stated on page 11 of the report. The counselor actually insulted the integrity commissioner by suggesting that she didn't want to meet with him in person because she was afraid that he would misconstrue what she may supply to him in an interview. That's also stated on page 11. On page 9 and page 13, it suggested that she, would, she actually interfered in the investigation. On page 13, she also, it also suggests that she was a hindrance in the investigation. <clears throat> it also, if you read it, it says that she tried to mislead the investigator by implying that another counselor leaked the information to whoever W2 was on page 12 and page 11. Also, the counselor tried to discredit whoever W1 was, in my mind, who was the only person other than the integrity commissioner that has any integrity in this report whatsoever. Also, we owe it to whoever, whoever W1 is a great deal of thanks because they had the integrity come forward and not to be afraid to tell the truth. And that's on page four. So after I read the report, the, report, the conclusion I come to is that Councillor Iannone betrayed the trust of the people who put her here. She betrayed the trust of her peers on council. She betrayed the staff who's just trying to do their jobs. That's outlined right on the cover page. This report confirms what many of her peers and staff have suspected for a very long time, that there was a leak and a breach of confidential information that was uh, stated, for, came from the meeting on the 24th. So the problem I have with this, Your Worship, is going forward, you know, the, uh, it's very limited on what we can do or we, we can suggest as uh, penalties or punishment or whatever. But as a council, how does the council function effectively in the future on issues of a confidential nature when staff is obviously reluctant, justifiably so after reading the report, to share details with us when they suspect or they know it will be, it will hurt the city if they're leaked. So even though we are elected individually, what some counselors don't seem to understand is that it's collectively that we're the body that runs the city. And we are responsible collectively for, for keeping confidential privileged information. 
this information that is entrusted to us, in my opinion, belongs to the residents and the taxpayers. And it's our duty as a council to maintain the integrity of the in-camera proceedings. Things that are done in camera are done there to protect the interests of our city, our taxpayers, and our residents. I take that very seriously, Your Worship, and I'm sure that most of the other councilors around the table do as well. The things that are done in camera are not done, are supposed to be done in a way to benefit our family and friends. So I believe that as our duty, when we're told or become aware of a breach of trust given to us by the residents, it's our obligation to investigate the accusation. If it's proven, punish the perpetrator and then do everything in our power to make sure it doesn't happen again. After reading this report, Your Worship, I'm prepared to make a motion after I hear what some of the other councilors have to say. Councilor Thompson. Yeah, this seems to be a mystery here. I, I think uh, if anybody is viewing this, they're wondering what's going on here. I think uh, the recommendations uh, or the conclusions should be read out uh, by the uh, uh, acting clerk so that at least the public knows what we're talking about. Maybe not. Okay, well then, let me give a little bit of a background. Uh, well, actually, you know what? Maybe, would you mind starting off, Mr. CAO? And then I'll fill in, I'll jump in. How this got started. Mr. Mayor, there was a, a motion of this council uh, several meetings ago uh, requesting staff to investigate. Excuse, excuse me, I, I was gonna start with that. Okay. Um, because uh, um, I'm constantly called by people uh, about Facebook comments and uh, insinuations about how we arrived at the, this particular point and that I knew something about this issue uh, which I had absolutely zero information. And there's also uh, on Facebook where seven counselors got together and made a decision with respect to this issue, which is totally wrong. I came into the council meeting uh, prior to making that motion and I was approached, and I'm not, I'm not gonna say who I, I was approached by, and they said, look, we feel there's been a breach of the in-camera session, uh, and we think it should be investigated. Would you bring up a motion uh, at the end of the meeting and have this referred to an integrity commissioner? And I said, yeah, if that's what you want. I, that's all I knew about it. And I made the motion because of the information that was given to me at that particular time. That's the only involvement. And after that, I hear uh, on the radio constantly uh, how us bad people at council uh, are uh, handling this issue. I have a lot more to say, but I'd like to, I just wanted to make that initial point. Thank you. Okay. So Mr. Mayor, uh, at the February 14th meeting, uh, the motion that Councillor Thompson referred to was made where there was a uh, alleged breach of uh, in-camera matter was referred to staff. Uh, at that point, uh, I took it upon myself uh, to contact the Ombudsman's office and ask the Ombudsman's office if they would investigate this complaint. They indicated to me that they would not, that uh, we were uh, required or should engage a, an integrity commissioner. Uh, I told them it, that we did not have an integrity commissioner appointed at this time, and they indicated to me that we could do, lack of better words, a one-off appointment of an individual uh, to perform those duties. So we were back here at the February 28th uh, meeting of council where that information was relayed to council and 
Uh, at that meeting, council authorized that we go out and formally engage an integrity commissioner. At that point, Mr. Beeman engaged Mr. Duxbury to perform uh, the role of the integrity commissioner in the breach uh, or alleged breach of, of an in-camera session. From there, Mr. Duxbury conducted his investigation, Mr. Mayor, and those are the conclusions that are found in this report tonight, uh, along with his conclusion and along with what remedies or what, uh, what council can do with that by way of motion carrying forward. So that's the report. Uh, I don't know if, if, I don't know much further you want me to say on it or whether you want to refer no, to the report. I, I think that's good, that's good. And then um, Mr. Clerk, if uh, it was requested, if you could just read the conclusion. Yeah, so just to give a little further context here, uh, the report is, is a report of, as stated here, Mr. Brian Duxbury of Duxbury Law Professional Corporation as the Integrity Commissioner. It was addressed to mayor and members of councils of the corporation of the city of Niagara Falls. And just reading his brief introduction, this is the report of Brian Duxbury of Duxbury Law Professional Corporation, Integrity Commissioner, as I stated to the mayor and members of city council of the city of Niagara Falls, this report concerns an alleged breach of in-camera matters. Uh, the report by way of uh, letter was sent June 12th uh, via email and by overnight courier which arrived today and all of council has been provided with a copy of that report. Just jumping to uh, conclusion on page 16, paragraph 42, Mr. Duxbury writes, I conclude that Councillor Carolyn Iannone improperly shared the content of an in-camera meeting on January 24th, 2017, with a person who was not entitled to receive such information. While the counselor may have had, in her mind, good intentions to ensure that someone who was affected by the in-camera discussion was given a, quote, heads up, it remains an improper disclosure of the content of an in-camera meeting. The rule is inviolate, and counselors have no ability to, and are not entitled to, disclose, hint, or imply some or all of the content of an in-camera meeting to individuals who are not entitled to it. Paragraph 43 of his conclusion goes on to state, the city's code of ethics slash conduct requires employees, including elected officials, to protect confidential and privileged information. Sensitive and confidential personnel issues discussed in camera require the highest regard for confidentiality. Further, the city's code of ethics slash conduct policy document requires all elected officials to work together to promote a workplace built on core values of accountability, leadership, teamwork, and respect, and to set and be a prime example for others. In all of their business dealings, honesty and integrity is required. I conclude that Councillor Carolyn Iannone breached the city's code of ethics slash conduct. Uh, paragraph 44 of the conclusion states that in respect to the available penalties of the city, subsection 223.4, subsec subsection 5 provides as follows, penalties, subsection 5, the municipality may impose either of or either of the following penalties on a member of council or of a local board if the commissioner reports to the municipality that in his or her opinion, the member was contravened, member has contravened the code of conduct. Number one, a reprimand. Number two, suspension of the remuneration period to the member in respect to his or her services as a member of council or of the local board, as the case may be, for a period of up to 90 days. This is from 2006, chapter 32, schedule A, section 98. Lastly, paragraph 45, this report is provided to mayor and members of councils, council as a report that is intended to be made public. Councilor Carrio? Uh, just a quick question. I, you know, I'm, obviously my comments were based on thinking people had read the report. Is the report available to the public? Is it on our website? Has it been handed to the press? Um, is it a public document? I'm assuming that it is. Mr. Clerk? Uh, as stated uh, in the last paragraph there, it is a public document to be made public. 
uh, once we received it yesterday, uh, it was uh, put through the same process that we would receive any late correspondence for a council meeting and included in additions. Uh, those additions were handed out. The press has been given a copy of those. Um, and they will be, all of the late additions will be scanned like they normally are in any process uh, to our uh, laser feature agenda, which is made public. And I believe that process will take place tomorrow as it normally does at any council meeting when we receive correspondence this late. Okay. Questions of council or comments of council on the report on Councillor Thompson? Anyway, um, I find this e extremely sad that uh, we have to go through this process. Uh, I wouldn't have been uh, that upset about it, but looking what's happened over the last uh, six weeks with the constant comments, negative comments about the staff, they, they, they talk about uh, uh, politics being a blood sport. Uh, you know, we're all elected here to serve the community. And I would say uh, most of the people sitting around here, that's what they have in their mind to try to do the, prob the job properly. Um, I uh, read a lot of comments that were totally out of line in my opinion. In fact, I even during the discussion with the, uh, Mr. Dukesbury uh, indicated uh, we should have a policy with respect to council members uh, and their comments with respect to other council members uh, and the council in general on Facebook and other social media. Uh, you know, if you got something to say, have the guts to stand up in council and say it where it's going to be debated and people have the opportunity to respond rather than seeing it uh, hidden someplace else. Uh, it really uh, came to me when I opened this and started reading it. Uh, responsibilities and expectations. All elected officials are expected to work together to promote a workplace built on our core values of accountability, leadership, teamwork, and respect. Elected officials are expected to set a prime example in all of their business dealings, honesty, and integrity uh, shall be required. You know, that, that's, a, that's why we're here. That's what it's all about. And yet we have to get into uh, this nonsense. And in and, and fact, I don't think this is the only time that this has happened. Uh, I know the meeting previously, the in-camera, uh, within a day I was getting calls from uh, municipal staff with respect to sensitive comments that were made in the uh, in-camera session, which I could, I could not believe. So anyway, um, I've been through this for a long time. Uh, I sat there for I don't know how many years and uh, listened to uh, uh, three people attack me every Monday night. Uh, fortunately, we had a majority, so we got through the business of doing the city. And uh, that situation seems to continue on. And it's unfortunate that that happened. But I came back here and I wiped all that out of the way and I became uh, somebody who was interested in working with this council and trying to be friendly and do the right thing. And unfortunately, uh, that didn't happen. The last time, I, in fact, I don't know how many times I heard it, that uh, I never met a mayor that I didn't hate. A comment I heard regularly. And the last time I spoke with Councillor Iannone, uh, she said to me, which I think lays it all out, she said to me, I'm not running again. 
and I'm going to make the, the next two years hell for Jim Diodati. Now, with that kind of attitude, where are we going with this? And I tell you, uh, I've been thinking about this for a long time. And I, I, every word I've said has been totally accurate. And I would uh, uh, expose myself to a polygraph tomorrow to stand up uh, every word I've said here tonight. And I'm so upset that we have to be fooling around with this nonsense when we could be working on behalf of the community and doing the right thing. This type of uh, uh, backstabbing that goes on with uh, Facebook and the rest of it isn't going to work. Anyway, I'm very disappointed with everything. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Pierangelo. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Um, I just want to say that, uh, I mean, our heart goes out to W1, uh, whoever W1 is. I think that um, W1 obviously has a lot of honesty and integrity. For clarity, Councillor, I don't think people I don't know what W1 means. Well, in the report, Your Worship, there was, um, I guess, two witnesses. witnesses. One was declared as W1 and the other was declared as W2. Uh, W1 would have been the one that came forward with the information, um, which would have been uh, texts that were received on on their phone. And uh, I guess <coughs> I guess I wanted to say that I mean our heart goes out to W1 because had that person have never come forward, then there would be no evidence, and it would only be hearsay. And I think, as Councillor Thompson was alluding to, I mean we've known for a lot of years that uh, in-camera um, has consistently been breached. I mean, I don't know how many times I would pick up the paper and I'd start to read, you know, the newspaper has learned, you know, never tells you how they learned and then you sit there and you scratch your head wondering, how did they get that information? Or you would turn on the radio and it would say, the radio has learned that, you know, and again, you would sit there and you would kind of scratch your head wondering how they found out. And it's damaging, Your Worship, in a lot of respects. It's damaging in the sense that it's hard to be one cohesive unit when you know that you have someone who is, uh, I guess, um, doing what they can to destroy the confidentiality. And in uh, another way that it's damaging <coughs> is in the sense that Mr. Duxbury uh, put in his report in the sense that staff are really unwilling to open up the council and to, uh, to, to be very frank with us and tell us everything for fear that uh, confidentiality will be breached and that the municipality will actually lose out on opportunities. And I truthfully believe that we've already lost out on opportunities. Uh, I really believe that, I mean, head council had a very strict confidential behavior we'd already have a post-secondary institution downtown uh, I mean we were given some highly confidential information from um, one of the uh, senior ministers that had we have followed this process and done uh, um, taken certain steps that we were going to be able to jump ahead of all the other municipalities that were in line um, this information came out in the public. The other municipalities saw this. Every single one of them followed suit with our plan. We ended up in the same spot that we were. Uh, Post-secondary institution landed in Brampton. Uh, in my opinion, should have been here in Niagara Falls, Your Worship. It's just one instance. I don't know if our CAO or yourself want to comment on that. Um, but it hurts us, Your Worship. Councillor Strange. I, I through you, Mr. Rogers, I'd like to ask Mr. Pat, Peter Angel, if, if, if you are alluding that W-2, it could be part of the media. It just seems like information is getting leaked out in the past, and it's uh, beginning to kind of make sense now because for a long time we've wondered how confidential information has been leaked to the media. If this is the case, are we looking at a situation where con confidential information is being traded for airtime? 
it's a possibility of that. Any other questions or comments of council before I know uh, Councilor Cario said he's got a he's got a motion and if we don't have anything else then we might as well deal with that motion. Is there any other council? I'd be happy to go. Pardon me? I'd be happy to speak. Now. Okay, it's all yours, Councilor. Thank you. I'll get off my cross and I'll stand here and I'll I'll tell you this. I listen to all, everybody's comments around here. And I have to say there's parts of the report I do agree with, but I don't agree with his conclusion whatsoever. Um, and, and I'd like to speak to the reasons why. I'd like to thank you for adding the appendix to your report. And it hel it's helpful because it points out exactly what the integrity commissioner is bound by our code of conduct of this council to investigate. And our, our code of ethics states, employees may not disclose confidential or privileged information about the property or affairs or the organization or use confidential information to advance personal or other interests. Employees cannot divulge confidential or privileged information about the city's employees without those employees' written authorization. In our code of conduct, which is the only thing he can use to investigate, is counselors are referred as officials in that code of ethics, and the section does not mention officials, and I don't believe it applied to us. That said, there's another reference in the code that states it's contrary to the code to use confidential confidential information for private gain or advancement or the expectation of private gain or advancement. That's our code that we have today. I deny that I ever broke that code at all. And I certainly didn't receive any private gain and there's no evidence that this alleged breach caused any harm to this municipality in any way. To your point, this breach never hit the media. This alleged breach never hit the media but that was an interesting comment and i'll go on to state that tomorrow morning i'll be filing a complaint with the ombudsman's office to investigate how this investigation was conducted i believe that key evidence that i provided to the integrity commissioner that he claims i sent to deflect the issue or imply another theory of events i'm using mr duxbury's words states very clearly that the topic and I provided information to Mr. Duxbury that proved that the in-camera on January 24th was breached, but it wasn't by me. Not only by another member of this council, but by another staff member in City Hall. Now, I have another question through you, Mr. Mayor, to Mr. Todd. On April 27th, Mr. Todd, I sent you a number of confidential, highly confidential emails with texts, and I wanted to know, you didn't respond to me. Did you share any of those emails with anyone? Mr. Todd? Mr. Mayor, I had those emails and I forwarded them to Mr. Duxbury. Did but I had forwarded them to Mr. Duxbury already. I forwarded them as well because I felt it may be integral to his investigation and I was not gonna interfere with that investigation. That's why I did not respond to you. I responded only to him and provided him with those same emails. Okay, so I just want council to understand what's not in Mr. Duxbury's report is that in those couple of texts from this Saint W1, it states that another councillor sitting around this table, who I will let the ombudsman declare, breached that in-camera meeting, not me. And I'm also going to state this, and this is the last thing I'm going to say. Mr. Duxbury in number 40 on page 14 says that under the Municipal Act, councils are allowed to go in camera and have a meeting of the content which is not public, is not made available to the public, and is not made, made available to the public under a request of the Municipal Freedom and Information Act. Our deliberations in camera are confidential. There is nowhere in your report does it say that I breached or spoke about the deliberations in camera, and I did not. The City of Niagara Falls, to his own admission, does not appear to have any clear protocol or policy in respect to the importance of protecting the content of in-camera meetings from any disclosure to third parties or the public. But we all know that when we go in there, we're not supposed to talk outside of there. I know that I didn't. I know I provided Mr. Todd 
text messages from W1 that absolutely points out who breached in camera. And I'm going to say this, and this will be the last thing I say. A text from W1 to W2, because nobody knows who they are except those of us involved. W1 sends to W2 the morning after they supposedly give the mayor information about very alarming text messages. Says to W2, I said it already, and I will guarantee you they are guessing. They always blame Carolyn for shit. These are things that I think this council needs to go in camera and discuss. That's the reason why I asked Mr. Todd in that email if he would meet with me. I understand there's a lot of acrimony between the two of us. I even asked him to bring a witness. I got no response. And in Ms. to Councillor Cario's comment that I tried to impede the investigation because Mr. Duxbury says that he considers my email to Mr. Beeman and Mr. Todd to be an inferent interference to his investigation. What he doesn't put in here is his res my response back to him. I called the ombudsman. I was on the phone with them for 90 minutes because I had sent emails into this municipality before I knew that I was the person you were looking at, asking for clarification on how this is going to work. Might I say the only thing I got was a threat and I had no response from anybody else. I explained to Mr. Duxbury, in no uncertain terms, I did not mean to impede your investigation. I am contacting you on advice of the ombudsman who cannot get involved in this investigation until it is finished, but advise me to ask these questions to our senior staff. I have that in writing from the ombudsman, made sure she declared it to me. That's not in your report. I have no problem being crucified or being put on a cross when I've done something wrong. When I file a complaint to the ombudsman, I tell you I did it. I am in your face and I don't care what you think of me. So to think I'd hide behind some sort of text message exchange is ludicrous. You all know me, nobody met me yesterday. So my complaint is going to go to the ombudsman tomorrow. I asked what happens if pertinent evidence that I've supplied is not in this report, then I can have them investigate. Tomorrow morning I will have them investigate. And I think that every email that I sent to Mr. Todd that highlights the conversation between W1 and W2 should be provided to this council because it would show you that nothing in this report happened. I breached nothing. Yep, Mr. Todd. Mr. Mayor, I just want to clarify again for the record here tonight that those text messages were forwarded to me by Councillor Iannone and uh, I immediately contacted Mr. Duxbury because I felt they were pertinent to his investigation. I forwarded them to him. Uh, I advised him that I would not be meeting with Councillor Iannone and that I would not be dealing with this matter at all leaving it to him until his investigation was done. And that's what we agreed to do, and that's what Mr. Duxbury did, and that's what I did, Mr. Mayor. So those matters were part of his investigation. Yes, Mr. Beeman. Um, this is exactly what we municipal lawyers predicted would happen when the ombudsman came up with this scheme in amending the act, the uh, municipal act. The ombudsman declined to undertake this investigation, refused to do it. However, is quite prepared to parachute into it and make suggestions as to how it should be conducted. Then they'll come in later and decide on Monday morning how things should have been played on Sunday. They never would have run the ball for Pete Carroll. Never would have, never would have called the play before either. That's the habit of the ombudsman. Um, I just, it's a very frustrating scenario um, because it makes it difficult for anybody to get anything done. But in any event, I don't think anything that you've heard actually undermines any of the conclusions that Mr. Dukesbury came to. 
He has stated his reasons for coming to the conclusions he has. He has presented his report. Council must deal with this now, today, and not. And if they run off, if, if the matter is going to be reviewed by the ombudsman, that will happen every time there is an integrity commissioner report. That is what the ombudsman does. So my suggestion to council would be to address the matter as you see fit to, do, to address it today, and then we will wait and see what the outcome of anything the ombudsman does, if anything. Thank you. Councillor Kerry. Thank you, Your Worship, not to belittle the point, but this is not Mr. Duxbury's first rodeo. His report is very comprehensive. I just urge everyone to take the report, read it from cover to cover, and come to the conclusion that I've come to. And I've come to the same conclusion that he's come to in his summary conclusion. Councillor Carolyn Ioni improperly disclosed sensitive and confidential information which was discussed in camera by council on January 24, 2017 to a third party who was not entitled to such information. This is not our first rodeo. When you read this report, it's black and white, not gray. And I expect that he has done his homework. I think he's reviewed all of the texts. And Councillor Anoni had ample opportunities to meet with Mr. Duxbury. It's explained in this report that he asked on a half a dozen occasions to meet with her and she refused. She would not meet with them. She had her opportunity to meet with them and clarify all the things she's trying to twist and turn tonight. She had the opportunity to meet with him and clarify anything she wanted to clarify and she refused to do it. Why would you not have met with him and explain what you're trying to explain now when you have the opportunity to meet with them. You got the floor, Councillor. I didn't have to meet with them. I didn't have to meet with them. He offered me the opportunity. I said communicate with me in writing so that nothing can be misconstrued. Do you know why I have it all in writing, Mr. Councillor Carriel? Because the Ombudsman's gonna get all that tomorrow. I was honest. I was forthright. I'm never getting into the position I got into with, as I was with Lisa Bolton, which was a colossal waste of money here. And everything went back and forth so that I, I could lay it all out. I followed every email that he gave me, I responded to. I said, please provide me the information you have. Please provide the complaint against me, and I would be happy to move this along with you, he, for you. He has all of those responses. So why didn't you meet with him? I didn't have to meet with him. I can choose how to deal with him. Yeah, he can choose how he writes his report. And, and, and he can. And if I can prove to the ombudsman that the information provided to him is not in his report, and it's not, then they're going to rule on that. Mr. B. And you know why I don't do anything just verbally? Because I'm going to be able to prove to you that I did everything I just said I did. And the text messages I have will prove that I didn't breach in camera and somebody else around this table did. Council, yes, Mr. Beamer. What happens is when a person doesn't like the way an investigation is going in these situations, the immediate plan is to prepare a case for the elements. For clarity, Mr. Beeman, does the ombudsman have any authority over counsel? Um, what is their jurisdiction? They would be able to. Uh, they would be able to provide a different report than Mr. Dutra, and then they make their recommendations. So they make recommendations. I think it would be. Yeah, I think uh, without actually. No, I think they can actually order you to do something. But in any event. Generally speaking, it's not a good thing to get into a large argument with the ombudsman. However, having said that, the one of the things that the ombudsman has to avoid is being exploited in this way. That they become a threat to any effort of a municipality to try to enforce its rules. So once again, council, you have to deal with what's before you and not be thinking about the consequences down the road, uh, if there are any. And we don't know in any way whether the Ombudsman is going to be convinced of anything. Thank you. Councillor Crater. 
Uh, thank you very much, George. Um, just a couple short comments. I did read, read through the report. It's, it's well put together, so thank you, sir. Um, there was only a couple of things that sort of caught my attention. Um, the, there's a couple of things that caught my attention, uh, and you don't have to comment on them, but I'm going to just say in an open council. It was on page 13 when I was sitting going through this, and so I'm going to quote exactly what you said on page 13. He said, I therefore find on the balance of probabilities, I therefore find on the balance of probabilities that Councilor Caroline Ioni shared highly sensitive and confidential personal information discussed in camera on January the 21st between W2, third party W2, who was not entitled. It was that one sentence that really caught my attention. I therefore find on the balance of probabilities. And I'm thinking of the times when I spent uh, 12 years as an investigator for the government of Canada and spent a lot of time in the courts. And I can imagine me standing up before a judge and saying, on the balance of probabilities, Your Honor, I think this person is guilty. I mean, the judge would throw me out of the court and laugh at me. So that really caught my attention. When you, and then I know you did go on further mm -hmm. and said something much stronger, but to say that in your report on the balance of probabilities, it just didn't quite make sense to me. Um, I just on that point, uh, Councillor, let me just get an answer legally. No, no, I don't, I don't need an answer. Oh, you do? No, I, I do want I an have answer. A right to, uh, no, I am chairing the meeting, I'm and I'm going to get clarity from Mr. Beeman. Mr. Beeman, please. Our balance of probabilities is a standard test in civil law today. The difference between, if I might express the difference between the balance of probabilities test and the there are two tests which are commonly used in common law courts for the burden of proof, what you have to prove in order to, 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 establish, to establish a fact. The balance of probabilities is used in every court other than criminal court. And the classic case of a, of a, that's popularly known in the, in the public realm is the case of O.J. Simpson. O.J. Simpson was not convicted of criminally murdering his wife. However, he ended up paying $33 million in damages in the civil courts based on the balance of probabilities test. So there's nothing, there's nothing unusual about that test being used in this context. Yes, in a criminal court or uh, some in bylaw courts, they use beyond a reasonable doubt. That isn't the test that's applicable in this area of law. Thank you. And that is a legal matter. Yes. And if you had been listening, I said, as an investigator for the government of Canada, when I was in criminal court, if I had said that to the judge, he would have thrown me out and laughed at me. That's exactly, and you just reinforced what I said. And I am a little offended that you, I am, I'm, I normally don't get upset. So, um, if the council feels, and you have every right to, because we have the report here, and you're going to make some kind of a decision whether you're going to, defer it and wait till see what the ombudsman does because if it comes out contrary to what we have then we've really got a problem or or if we're going to take action today if we are and if that's the will of the council i understand that so what we have is the first situation so sort of like the first time something like this has happened so normally in the progression process if something like this happens for the first time, and there's some options that uh, Mr. Duxbury has provided to us. One is a reprimand, and I saw that used uh, not too long ago in this in this uh, in this chamber that we give someone a reprimand. If we're going to go down that road, I'm not saying we should, but I'm saying if you're going to go down that road, then I would suggest that if we go down that road, then a letter of reprimand uh, indicating it's whatever the wording we want to use is not appropriate, it's not the right thing to do, and not to make sure we stick to the rules, which I happen to agree with, in camera is in camera, and that's where it belongs. Um, so I'm gonna make that as a suggestion if we're gonna go down the road today to, uh, to make a decision. But I'm also saying, in fairness, that, uh, and I do know from my experience of dealing with the ombudsman, and I will tell you, there were, even when I was with the provincial government, I can remember four or five times they turned down some of the things that I was working on to help residents or to help uh, the health care system in particular. I was so upset with the way they were treating the public. And I went to the ombudsman, and he stepped in and intervened and allowed some things to happen to the benefit of some of the people. 
so i'm going to make and i'm going to make that a suggestion that if we're going to go down the road and uh, a letter of reprimand would be appropriate for something that might be a, would be a first time if the council feels that way thank you thank you for that council morocco uh, yes, Your Worship. Um, I have to say that uh, we actually are here to represent our constituents and make sure that we do due diligence. This report um, was paid for by the taxpayers uh, as it was a motion that we actually hire integrity commissioner. I had no idea what the, uh, the, the whole purpose was, is that there was only something that wasn't done in breach. I was not here at the January 24th uh, meeting. This. This document states in black and white that a breach has taken place, a breach of confidentiality. No matter what it might have been, who it was, there was a breach of in camera that should not have been let out. No matter to who or to what about, it's a breach. And that's where we as councillors elected to represent the people of this city, that we entrust in them that we are going to make sure that we do have honesty and integrity and making sure that we put forward the best decisions based on our constituents. Right now, I'm, I'm holding a document that we actually uh, asked uh, the Integrity Commissioner to do an investigation. And I'm very sad to say that it's been a struggle for a number of years that in camera that the city staff cannot give us some of the information that we should as elected officials because we're always fearful that that breach or that information will be out there in the newspaper the next day and that that's a challenge because you know what it is we're fighting against other cities and municipalities for a piece of the pie like it's a university or whatever it might be a new business coming here and if it gets leaked out uh, then there's another opportunity for that city or another destination to come and take that opportunity to grow this destination. It is challenging and even more challenging now that it, it is in black and white that a counselor has breached confidentiality and there's no getting around it. And you can say that maybe someone else did it or whatever, but the information provided to me basically outlines that it's one individual that has breached that confidentiality. And unfortunately, right now, we have to make a decision and we have to deal with it. Because this then would be a bloody waste of the taxpayer's money, unfortunately. But we as council, I cannot continue to go on and be a council and represent my constituents when I know in camera that I'm not going to get the full information that I deserve as an elected official to base those opinions on because somebody might be leaking the information. So I, I have to say that I truly support the fact that we have to move forward and we have to make one of these uh, recommendations or reprimands that are outlined here. Not only does Councilor Iannone uh, sit on other boards as well as, as the hydro and, and things too, that there's confidential information. And all of us, I would hope, would never leak that. It's all called insider trading. And we all know what happens when you do insider trading. It's, it's illegal. So I have to say that we have to deal with the report. And if we don't deal with the report, I feel that we're letting down our constituents and we're actually wasting money that has been spent on this report. How much did this cost? I guess maybe that's a question. How much did this report cost? Mr. Beeman? Council said a ceiling of $7,500 at the time of the outset of this investigation, and that's what it's going to cost us. Well, we have to make a recommendation, so. Uh, I don't know what was Councillor Anoni, and then Councillor Kirio. Thank you. I'm so confident that the Ombudsman will rule differently based on the text messages from this St. W1 that I just want to ensure that if this council is going to reprimand me for what you believe is something I did, that the person who actually leaked the information gets the same reprimand that I get in this council chamber tonight. That's fair is fair. You, not only that, when I prove it wasn't me, and I will prove it, 
I'll get an apology in this council chamber. And that person will be reprimanded with the same reprimand you believe that I deserve for something I didn't do. That's all I want to say. Fair is fair across the board. You set the standard now. The standard is for when the ombudsman's report comes back. Councillor Carrier? Mm -hmm. Your Worship. Failing to see an ombudsman's report, I'm prepared to make a motion based on the report we have. I read this report. I believe this report. It's the only report I have. And I'm prepared to make a motion based on what I've read and what has been presented to us tonight. I'll start with a resolution. I have a resolution that, that I suggest that we send to the Ministry of Municipal Affairs. That we provide the, you know, I'll go a little higher than the ombudsman. I suggest that we provide the Minister of Municipal Affairs, Bill Morrow, with a summary of what is taking place here, including a copy of the report, and ask that consideration be given to making changes in the Municipal Act that would impose more severe penalties, including removal from office, similar to penalties that already exist in the Conflict of Interest Act. That's my first resolution. I would move that resolution. Okay. Uh, motion by Councillor Cario. Looking for se second by Councillor Peter Angelo. Do we have any discussion to the resolution? Hey, okay, seeing none, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay. Opposed? I have a conflict. Clearly, I'm voting on that. Okay. So that's unanimous then. Thank you. Councilor Carey, you have the floor. Thank you, Worship. <clears throat> then, based on what I've read and by the report that's in front of me, the motion that I'm going to make is that we ask, that we ask Councilor Iannone to apologize to her peers on Council, to staff, and to the public. Number two, that because of Councilor Iannone's failure to cooperate with the Integrity Commissioner's investigation, who was appointed by this Council, that city staff be directed to decline to answer any further questions that the counselor has or may have with respect to the investigation. Number three, to remove Councilor Iannone from all boards and committees of council, including Niagara Falls Hydro Holding Corporation effective immediately. Number four, to impose a 90-day pay penalty to offset the funds that the taxpayers have had to pay to conduct this investigation. Number five, to ask for the resignation of Councilor Iannone. Number six, further, that the actions of W-2, as described in the report of the Integrity Commissioner, be referred to the appropriate authorities for investigation and response, including a review of any possible benefits or financial gain that W-2 may have received from having learned the leaked information. That's my motion. Thank you. We have a motion. Uh, Councilor Morocco. Second. second the motion. Second. Do we have any discussion to the motion? Councilor Crater. Yeah, the only the only comment I'm making, I'm saying it respectfully. Um, you deem that the person has done something inappropriate it's the first time, and normally you don't you don't normally do what I'm watching in front of me. I've I've been through this and I I know how it works. So I'm just I understand what you're doing, but I just think at least the very least at the very first time. And there was another option we had that we could at least look and look at that, and that's the only thing. That's the, and I guess the only thing left is, if the ombudsman is does come back, then we've opened the door that whoever the other person is, all of these things that's going to we're going to vote on for Carolyn will apply to him as well, or to her, whoever it is. I just want to be sure we. Absolutely. That's the. Okay, that's what I heard, and so it's absolutely this this motion. If it's deemed it's someone else, that person will have exactly the same consequences. And that's absolutely, and that's, that's fair. Then I understand that. Thank you. Okay. If there's no further discussion, I get recorded vote. Recorded vote. I clearly had a conflict, Your Worship. With a conflict? With one conflict, Mr. Clerk? Well, due, due to the length of the uh, motion made by uh, Councillor Cario, seconded by Joyce Morocco, um, I'm not going to reread it all. Uh, I wasn't able to transpose all that, obviously. If it needs to be reread, uh, we could ask that to be done now. Otherwise, I will just ask for the uh, recorded vote. I think we've all heard it. Okay. Uh, Councillor Campbell? In favor. Councillor Crater? Support. Councillor Curio. In favor. 
Councillor Morocco? In favor. Councillor Peter Angelo? Yes. Councillor Strange? In favor. Councillor Thompson? Yes. And Mayor Diodati? Four. Passes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Duxbury. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Pardon me? It was unanimous. It was unanimous. Worship, may I be excused? Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Thank you, good evening. Appreciate your time, thank you. Consent agenda, it's the will of council. Does anyone want anything lifted? Yes, Councilor Crater. I did, I had, uh, I had that white item I talked to you about. That was the one to do with the, from the parking and traffic regarding a request for a disability sign. Yes, that was, uh, which one was that? Uh, I had it, had it in my notes. There's a lot of them. Oh yeah, there it is. TS 2017-15. Yeah, it's yes. uh, fifth from the bottom. And I just had one question, uh, maybe it doesn't have to go withdrawn. That was on the user fees. I, I, the only question I have, I'll ask that right now, is are there changes to the amounts that we're charging people on the user fees? You couldn't tell if we yeah. increased them. That's what I wondered. Have we increased them or are we just renewing them? Mr. Harrison? Uh, no, it's... Uh, uh, throughout the board, uh, there are some changes. Most of them are inflationary um, in, in the whole user fees. All right, thanks. Okay. That's, that's good. That's okay, good. thank you. Point, your worship. Yes, Councillor? Just on that point, Your Worship, I think it was last year, uh, I brought up the notion of user fees being charged as a proportion of the service. So let's say you take soccer, baseball, hockey, uh, take those three. If the ICE users are paying 80% of the cost of the service, it's unfair to only be charging other user groups 10%. So I was wondering whether or not we could uh, come back more with a ratio instead of a dollar amount. That to me would be more fair uh, if we had a ratio in effect and then that ratio could just increase on inflation. Um, the reason to be, uh, well, we can't. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> I'm. Uh, I guess I would be. We could certainly provide a report as part of next year's budget uh, sure. that would provide, yeah. in particular circumstances, what the ratio uh, is. Uh, I assume you're talking mostly raised uh, recreational type of rates. Uh, we have some agreements with some of the user groups on multi-year phase and a rate structure. So certainly we can provide that as part of the uh, budget process so that for next year, as for the 2018 user fee schedule, we certainly could incorporate some of those ideas. Yeah, be interested to in see the information. Yeah, definitely. Yes, Councillor? Yeah, and I also, um, I mean, I don't know that it needs to be pulled, Your Worship, but we're, we're just looking at doing a public open house in regards to vacation rental units and bed and yeah. breakfast. I don't know, if I, uh, like I know Councillor Thompson wanted to talk about it, I know Councillor Morocco wanted to talk about it, probably Councillor Grader. I, I don't know if it needs to be pulled, but as well I wanted to mention that the City of Toronto is actually looking at this uh, specific topic right now and they're looking at making vacation rentals in their, in, in their city legal but only in your, uh, only in the home that you live in. So in other words, you can't own another property and rent that out but if you wanted to use your place of residence as a vacation rental, then there was going to be a mechanism that you could go through where you could obtain a license. But, I mean, I think we have to do uh, something on this issue because it's starting to uh, increase in terms of the number of units that are out there. I know just in Toronto, uh, listening to the radio the other day, they said that there's more vacation rentals in Toronto than there are hotel rooms. I believe there was uh, up to 13,000. They said in Paris, there's 60,000. So anywhere where you're a popular tourist destination, there's obviously going to be a lot more. And I think we really need to put a policy in place or, or we're going to miss the boat because um, if we don't do something soon, it will be too hard to play catch up in the future. Uh, yes, Mr. Bimo. I just wanted to uh, address the concerns of Councilor Peter Angel. Uh, we hear you loud and clear. And what we're, the, the purpose of, of this strategy is to try to, there are so many people want to speak about it. Uh, council that we, I think we'd be in a kind of like a, a, a two-day meeting. Yep. So what we're trying to do is give all those people a chance to come in and, and have their say so that it, uh, 
in the, in the public forum and have their go at the planners and we'll put the various scenarios before them. As uh, Councilor Peter Angelo has uh, so correctly pointed out, we've got that great honkin report from Toronto now. Um, and there are other examples, um, Niagara on the Lake is another one that comes to mind. And so the whole purpose of this strategy is to allow this vast number of people to have a forum in which to, to communicate directly with us and to uh, try to summarize their information for Council. So hopefully by the time we get the issue to Council, there won't be six hours of presentations for Council to go through and we'll have it uh, concentrated, the basic uh, issues and positions of the various uh, parties involved. That's why we're, we're doing it this way. And, and we're hoping that it, it will be the best way for all involved. Okay. Okay. On that right. point, I've got Councillor Thompson and Morocco. Yeah. Well, you know, this has been going on for uh, so long now. Um, I'm uh, hoping that uh, your suggestions are appropriate. I don't know whether there were anybody here that was uh, uh, Airbnb. <laughs> Uh, the gentleman uh, has been sitting here all night, okay. but uh, he, uh, do you know? Uh, yeah, I know. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you want to come up? I make a motion. He oh, be given a minute yeah, because he's been no, sitting sorry. here all night. Yeah, no, no. Uh, come on up, Mr. Vitter Turner. Uh, it's this. No, this is not a public meeting for in this no, regard. No, but yeah, just to express your sure. Sure. Good evening, everyone. Which we hear every day. Yeah. This is the first time I've been in this room and I've lived in this city for 50 years since the day I was born. So I didn't even know where I was actually. Um, <clears throat> yeah, lucky you. <laughs> Excuse me for interrupting the speaker. Yes, sir. Would you just mind giving your name? Yes, my name is David Vitaterna. So we can contact you for a meeting. Thank you very sure. much. Sure. My name is David Vitaterna. My wife and I live on, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Roger Crescent. Currently there's one vacation home there and there's a second one that the same owners of the first one they're getting it ready to start renting out as well and i understand that they are from toronto i'm not sure about that but i know they don't live in the houses that they're renting out um the one address is 7195 roger crescent <clears throat> and the other one what it is is it's four doors down on me the one way and then the other one doesn't have the address on the house it's two doors down the other way so pretty soon it looks like I'm going to be surrounded by vacationers on my street which is normally a quiet residential street so and there's also rumored to be a third one down at the end of the street I'm not sure the address of that either I just heard some talk about it um, but at the moment there's one so we're living on a street that's being occupied by weekend visitors in which we have no idea who they are. Th this is not something we should have to be concerned about living in a residential street with no provision for tourist commercial establishments. <clears throat> I've dealt with uh, Dean Arfita in the past. He told me the city was in a position to find the owner of the home the following week and this was about three months ago and it never happened. Um, after speaking with Ron Waters who was dealing with it, um, he told me that the file for that home has gone inactive since they don't have enough evidence to pursue legal action. Yet for over more than a year, I provided proof with online ads on HomeAway um, and pictures of vehicles from all over the U.S. and Ontario plates as well that filled the driveway on several weekends. <clears throat> There's no city staff available to deal with this on the weekends, which is extremely frustrating as this is when the homes are being rented and they're not being rented out during the week between 8.30 and 4.30. As a homeowner on a residential street, I find it unacceptable that a home occupied by the, that the home unoccupied by the owner is allowed to be rented in this manner without any repercussions and after it is clearly against the zoning bylaw set out by the city itself. We're looking for an explanation on this. We just want something done because it looks like it's out of control. And like pretty soon, I don't know how many houses could be on our street. It's a, it's a quiet, quiet cul-de-sac. There's no traffic there. We like it that way. We just don't want to see it turn into something that it's not supposed to be. The owners don't live there, so there's no control over who actually rents out the house. That's pretty much all I had to say. So, so Mr. Bemis? The public meeting is going to be. Okay. Sure. Uh, just going to go to the office. 
Okay. All right, well, he's going to meet with you. Okay. So thank you for, uh, and we're going to be back to you about okay. all this detail. I'm kind of disappointed there's no one else here to talk about this. Well, because this isn't a public meeting. The public oh, meeting is okay. coming up. Okay. So we're just setting the date, and then, yeah. then you get your full piece. Okay, good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, thank you very much okay. for your time, Mr. Veteterna. Thanks. Did your cell number change, Mr. Veteterna? Yes, it did. It did, okay. I'll have to get it from you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, did um, the other one, is there anything else on consent that uh, you want pulled? Yeah, Councilor Morocco? What's that? Are we still on? Yeah, like, no, uh, oh yeah, I'm sorry, yes, 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 okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry. you wanted to speak on that one. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, I'm actually, um, at the last meeting, I know that you had to leave um, early, and I did bring it up under new business um, in regards to uh, short-term uh, accommodations and what Blue Mount was doing from my meeting at OSM and what they were bringing forward in some of the recommendations. The only thing is I didn't bring forward a motion, but staff is actually looking into that. And uh, as Councillor Thompson said, it's long overdue. So we're hoping to just gather information. And one of the uh, reports that came back uh, at OSM was that they were dealing with uh, Rideco and Uber. And basically, you know what, you can't keep chasing around, so re let's regulate them. So I'm just repeating what I had said at the last uh, meeting so they're working on ways to regulate uh, that and as well as they've got uh, for the last two years they've got this STA which is the short-term uh, accommodation licensing and I was very impressed on how they've got it set up is that you know you'd have to apply for it and you uh, there's a fee so that the tax is like so that there's money coming back into the coffers because let's face it hoteliers and everyone are paying high taxes um, to offset the cost of garbage and policing and whatever. So there's a fee that they implement, I think, about anywhere from 1500 to $2,000. It's every two years they have to reapply. And if I think something like, if you get two strikes, you don't get your license, you're done. And you only hold that, you can't transfer it to the next one. Anyway, there's this whole line. I did forward, it did come to me today, and I did ask uh, the clerk to take a look at that at the last meeting. But anyway, we just got an, uh, a small clip. But they did send it to me uh, today. I did contact Blue Mountain and they sent it off. So I did share it with uh, staff to maybe ch take a look at that. And I know Councillor Thompson has also said that uh, the tourism organization is gathering some information as well uh, to bring forward. So I would like to see some of these things. And I know another uh, rep um, resident actually also said that, you know, the report, hopefully, that there is going to be uh, a public meeting where it opens the doors for people to come. But she said, um, our report also failed to mention that one, three, and four of what Toronto's Municipal Licensing and Standard Division released yesterday is a series of new well thought through recommendations following months of consultation. And it's kind of like she points out a couple of different points. And I think you can get that from the Toronto Tourism file. So if we could actually um, in include uh, what I've submitted uh, in Blue Mountain and how they're doing it for a couple of years. I don't think that we have to recreate the wheel, just take the information that's out there and, and make it work for now. Absolutely. So if I can make that motion to, uh, if, if that's a motion yeah. that we need you just give direction to. You mean to share your information with uh, Yes, with please. Wilson? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so it's, if we can just maybe email it out uh, and yeah. uh, if we can just share it. So if I can make that motion and if you'd like to. Well, yeah. um, okay, you want to, the motion, okay, so the motion is. Well, I'd like to include the information that we got from Blue Mountain and also uh, Councillor Peter Angela talked about Toronto, and they just did a new uh, update to theirs too. So gathering some of that information and uh, putting it together, and also then providing what works best for Niagara, and uh, having a public open meeting as uh, residents are asking for that we make Maybe, sure. Can I hold that motion for one second? Sure. I got Mr. Beeman waving. I just, I just, wanted, to, I just to wanted to assure the council that the Blue Mountain material is in my office. We, he's got it. We've okay, got so he's already got their, it. Their stuff. We have gathered material from numerous municipalities. The Toronto one, just uh, Mr. Uh, Bryce just picked it up this morning on the, off the, yep. from the people in yep. Toronto. So we've got that. Toronto, we've got, well, we've got several municipalities. We definitely have Blue Mountain because they were sort of, they were, they're the one case that went to the divisional court, so it's kind of a good model to use. Good, excellent. Councillor Thompson? Yeah. The only thing uh, I would ask him to get in touch with uh, John Jackson, Niagara Falls Tourism. He has seven different destinations that have dealt with this. So uh, might be helpful. Yeah. Yep. Mr. Uh, Mr. Tyler, so just just to recap what's going on here f with council for this. So the report tonight was just to give you a little bit of background information and tell you we're going to be setting up a probably it sounds like more than one public meeting. 
We're going to gather all of this information from different jurisdictions. We're going to have a bit of an outline even at those public meetings as to what other municipalities are doing. And then we're going to have feedback from all of the operators, from the hoteliers, from members of the public, from people like Mr. Paterna at those meetings. After that, we're going to summarize all of that and bring that back for a report here to Council. I'm guessing it'll probably be sometime in the fall by the time we all go through this, but just so Council's patient. But that's the process we set up, and that was really the only purpose of that report tonight, is to put this on the radar and tell you we're having those public meetings and going to have a comprehensive report back at a later date. Okay, thank you very much. I just wanted to make sure if we needed a motion that I would put that forward. I actually only mentioned it at the last uh, meeting and we didn't have a motion, but staff was working on it, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so there's one other, do you have a consent on the agenda item? Just a question, uh, Niagara District Airport. Uh, is it, all we're saying is we're going to do our part of the environmental right. to move it forward. Uh, right. To be considered. Yes. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Uh, and one thing, if I could draw your attention to uh, bottom of page five, TS 2017 23, it's the McLeod Road, Wilson Crescent intersection control. And I know Councillor Crater, uh, you brought this forward, and the regional staff had said no to it. Um, so, uh, what, we, what I'm suggesting is we can have a motion to send it back to regional council yes. uh, through public works to have another go around of cost sharing because. We need a motion that goes to I'll the. Make it. Yeah, I want to thank you. I had completely forgotten about that. I would, that's what I. So thank you yeah. for bringing that for you. I was quite upset when I saw that. Um, so I'll make that motion. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Moved by Councilor Crater, second by Councilor Morocco, that we uh, bring this back to Regional Council for cost sharing, uh, to Regional Council. Yeah. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved. Thank you, uh, uh, Councilor Peter Angel. You've got a. Does he have it? The trail. Yes, uh, well, we're just going to approve the rest, right? Isn't it? Does it need specific? Did you have a, you had an issue on the one trail, Councillor? That's right. Uh, uh, about the uh, gravel around the. Uh, well, I read the report, Your Worship, and the report said that they could replace it with the stone dust, right? Yes. I so, do we need a specific motion said, on so that? Uh, unless you're asking me to say thank you to staff, thank you to staff, <laughs> thank you. That's cool. So, so we'll go with the stone stone dust option. Stone dust, great. Yes. Okay. Yeah, absolutely, Good. Worship. And I know that there was a, uh, something in there about um, you know, taking some funds out of the 2018 OLG funds or in order to pay because there was a, a bit of an increase in cost going with stone dust as, as, as opposed to the wood chip. Yeah. That's the way that I read the report and I thought that we were just going to adopt that report, Your Worship. Okay. I'd be so happy. Thank you. Thank you. So looking for a motion. <laughs> I won't be able to run for a while, but that's okay. Motion for the rest of the consent agenda Thank for all the Lord consent. Yeah. Moved by Councillor Crater. Yeah, oh, hold on. Oh, wait, wait. I've got some. Oh, Councillor Crater. Sorry. Yeah, I, yep. I had that one item that I asked him. Yes, the disability. Yeah, yeah. Sort of you did. You did. So, very simply for the information, Council, about five or six weeks ago, um, a lady, Vanessa Coombs, that's her name, approached our MPP, Wayne Gates' office, to find out if the province could look at putting up a, a sign for an autistic child. Uh, worked a bit with Wayne's office and I talked to the MTO and it was explained to us that uh, the municipalities can decide if they want to or not. So I suggested to her that she should come to council and explain why she felt strongly about having a sign up. She has an autistic child and I met many autistic children uh, when I was a member of parliament and many of the families so I, I understood what her concerns were. So I told her to come to council, um, staff would put a report together, and then she'd have a chance to make a presentation. She got a phone call from the, the clerk who explained to her that uh, the staff had done, done a review of her agenda, that it's pretty big, and so she doesn't need to come. In fact, she can't come. That this council will just look at the report that we have in front of you from the parking traffic, from the traffic department, which says that, um, don't put it up. So I suggested to her that I would bring it up here and see if maybe the council would agree to defer it or to put it over to our next meeting and she was in agreement with that. So she, and I appreciate, I know Bill contacted her so I wasn't being critical of you at all, Bill. I don't want you to think I meant it that way at all. Um, so I'm simply asking in a nutshell is that we not deal with this today that they come back to our next council meeting, but she has the opportunity to come out. I will tell you, she'll probably bring some other autistic parents with her. There are communities 
that have these signs up and there's a multitude of different types of signs, but you need to hear from her why she felt it was a, important for that type of a sign to go up to let people know there's an autistic child in that area. So that's what I'm looking for. The other option is, I could just make the motion that we approve the sign, but but I think, I, I, and I appreciate you saying yes, yes you were, but I think it'd be interesting for the public to hear from autistic parents why that sign is so important and what difference it can make in a, you know, in a child's life. So do you want to defer that to, to the next meeting? So I'm, yeah, I'm going to defer it to the next meeting oh, on the condition that she be allowed, she yeah. is guaranteed she'll be able to come out and speak no matter how big the agenda is. Okay. So thank you. Okay, so motion, uh, motion for uh, deferral to the next uh, meeting. And that's moved by Councillor Crater and seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved. Okay. Is there any other uh, consent agenda, agenda agenda items? No? Okay, looking for a motion to move the rest of the consent. Moved by Councillor Morocco, seconded by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Now the are we under Mayor's remarks? No, no, we're, yeah, we are. We are Mayor's remarks. Okay, lucky you. Reminder uh, again, uh, just a reminder everyone that does attend council meetings to so please turn their cell phones off. Now that we have live streaming, uh, it is a distraction. It does get picked up. So we did have some comments that there was ambient noise, including cell phones uh, during the recording. So appreciate it if everyone would do that. Obituaries. Mr. Charlie Zambito, the father of Deputy Chief Joe Zambito, passed away. Claire Davidson, grandmother of Angela Davidson of our Business Development Office. And Rosemary Sharp, retired City Council Secretary, passed away as well. So our condolences to their families. I'd like to thank the following councillors for representing the city. Councillor Cario for the 610 CKTV Live with Tom McConnell Show. Councillor Strange for representing the city at the International Right of Way Association Conference, Solar Park. 10, the solar park opening and uh, June Recreation Month kickoff. Councillor Campbell for the Sir Adam Beck pump station 60 year celebration, the Pride Niagara flag raising and the Italian Heritage Month flag raising. Councillor Crater for the annual Qingming Festival and the Philippine Independence Day flag raising. Also uh, kudos to our uh, staff for the Live with Kelly and Ryan uh, I'd like to maybe start, uh, Council, or MPP Gates had sent a letter. He asked that we read, so I'll give it a quick read. He said he wanted to write a letter to thank all city staff and volunteers for the organization of the live event with Kelly and Ryan. It was I was fortunate enough to be present for this event, and quite frankly, I was impressed. This was an incredible showcase of Niagara Falls, and it truly highlighted the best this city has to offer. Two-day event spread our image to the whole world, and I can imagine this will have a positive impact on our local businesses. As we know, Niagara Falls is a top tier tourist destination in the world, and I believe that the Kelly and Ryan Show was a terrific way to further share the message to the world, and I hope that similar events are planned for the future. Once again, thank you for making this such a, this wonderful event a reality. So that uh, came from uh, our MPP Gates. So congratulations to te the team, the entire team, all the volunteers, and specifically Serge Felicetti, who was right at the center of this big event, and it was a lot of work, a lot of hours, uh, time he'll never get back, but he did a terrific job. Um, it was such a success that we've asked our staff to look at other shows, and we said, wouldn't it be nice if we had one show a year in Oaks Garden? So we're going to send out tweets and letters to everyone from Ellen, The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon, Jimmy Kimmel Live, Late Show with Stephen Colbert, Late Show with James Corden, uh, Late Night with Seth Meyers, Conan O'Brien, The Social, Marilyn Dennis Show, City Line, George Trumbopoulos tonight, and we're going to see if we can get a little bit of momentum going on for this uh, Oaks Garden and kick off every year with a great show down in Oaks Garden. Uh, so I would ask a motion of City Council to support city staff inviting these groups of other international and Canadian talk shows to bring one to Niagara Falls each year. Moved by Councillor Strange and seconded by Councillor Campbell. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? And thank you for your support on that. And last uh, two things to mention, uh, our CAO and myself were in Ottawa last week meeting with CN officials. And I know that Councillor Thompson has been working very hard at getting us to try to redirect these trains around the city. And we took that, uh, that message directly to the top executives and we spent a great deal of time. So we are arranging uh, upcoming meetings with their senior staff and we do have them engaged. Matter of fact, the COO said, 
we don't like going through cities any more than you like us going through cities. So let's talk about options. So, so it was a good news uh, meeting with the CAO. As a matter of fact, we were on a train and the executives couldn't get away because between the CAO and myself, every time they'd walk, there was nowhere to go. We kept kind of, oh, look at that. Well, it's you guys again. Uh, and as well, I wanted to reiterate yesterday's big GO announcement travel package deal in celebration of Canada's 150th, Metrolinx has partnered with the Niagara Parks Commission where for $25 you'll be able to come to Niagara Falls, do all the parks attractions and return. Uh, and include, I, I'm sorry, come down a two day we go pass and return and you'll be able to buy all your attractions to the parks and everything else. So 25 bucks return trip and two days we go. Phenomenal deal down here with the parks and with the uh, Ministry of Tourism working together with our uh, Metro Lakes. So we're really excited to hear that announcement. So uh, next meeting will be Tuesday, July the 11th. And reminder, turn your count, your phones off for that meeting. So moving on to communication. Yes, yes, Councillor Campbell. To be fair, uh, Councillor Thompson was in attendance at the Pride uh, flag raising and just also at the Italian, Italian flag raising. Oh, good. That's what he said. He, he was there, but you were as well. So thank you for that. Yes. It's hard because a lot of the time there's a lot of overlap. There'll be three or four events at one time and just can't do it. So thank you to council for helping cover off because uh, a lot of groups are disappointed if they don't have representation. It means a lot to them to have you there. So under communications and comments to the city clerk, we have uh, eight items. First one, Niagara Region 2017 tax capping policy. That's just uh, for information of council. Do we need to receive that, Mr. Clerk, or do we? Okay, motion, motion to receive item one, regional tax capping, moved by Councillor Strange, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? Item two, Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Uh, inspectors will be initiating a summer residential survey of the plum pox virus, PPV. I need a motion to receive, moved by Councillor Campbell, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? That's received, thank you. Item three, Canadian Deaf Blind Association Ontario Chapters requesting that the month of June be proclaimed as Deaf Blind Awareness Month. Second. Moved by Councillor Bernacco, second by Councillor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? That's approved unanimously. Mental Health and Addictions Hepatitis C Care Clinic requests that July 28th be proclaimed 2017 World Hepatitis Awareness Day. Second. Moved by Councillor uh, Bernacco, second by Councillor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? That's approved, thank you. Niagara Region Bill 73 requirement, the Planning Advisory Committee. That's again for information, looking for a motion. Someone. Councillor Thompson? Could we have an explanation of uh, what that's all about at the region? Does uh, our planner know? I don't know. Pardon me? I'm not familiar with that. Bill 73 uh, requirement, Planning Advisory Committee. a committee yes. at the region uh, for planning. That's do you know anything about No, that? I know what you know. I figured the planners would know about that one. I'm not on the planning committee. I thought the last thing we needed was another, <laughs> another planning committee. committee at the regional level. Do you want to pull that one until we get some clear? Oh, wait, we've got uh, our regional councillor, Ball Patty. Did you want to comment on this one? Um, yes, I can. And being chair of planning. Oh, perfect. It's mandated by the provincial government. In the, in, yes, in the new act. So we must have this advisory planning committee. Yeah, well, it's going to be made up of experts because we're working on a new official plan. So that's the... Okay, good. Thank you for that, Councillor. You're very it. welcome. Okay, so uh, we're looking for a motion. Move by Councillor second by Councillor Campbell, that we receive the uh, Bill 73 requirement <laughs> information from the region. All those in favor? And that's approved, thank you. Committee of Adjustment Vacancy. Mm -hmm. There's a memo attached from our acting city clerk. For the okay, yes. So it's moved by Councilor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councilor Thompson, that Mr. Colosimo be appointed to the Committee of Adjustment. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved unanimously. Niagara Region correspondence from the Ministry of Finance in response to the correspondence regarding the contraband tobacco trade Looking for a motion to receive that information. Move, moved by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Morocco. All those in favor? <coughs> That's approved, thank you. And the last one, the Regional Development Charges Bylaw um, 
uh, referred to correspondence from the City of Welland, the recommendation from our staff is that Council endorse the City of Welland's recommendation with the exception of the recommendation related to area specific charges which cannot be supported. Yes, Councilor Thompson. Can uh, somebody tell us what this is all about? We're endorsing uh, the City of Welland comments with respect to uh, development charges. I read through it and uh, they seem to be really concentrating on their downtown area. I wonder why we would be endorsing that if we, we probably have our own comments with respect to uh, development charges. Mr. CAO? Well, uh, to you, Mr. Mayor, uh, the idea being that a lot of their comments related to their downtown or RCIP areas or all brownfield areas would be similar issues that relate to us. Uh, the exemption of industrial uh, development charges would be the same for us. So we're just saying that a lot of the same common elements are common to us with the exception of the uh, area specific charges because you heard a report tonight where there's something like 180 some odd million dollars in regional work. If there was an area specific charge that would fall to Nick Falls. Over the last 50 years that the region's been in existence, those charges have been spread proportionately across the region and our feeling that that practice should continue. So any of those things you saw tonight uh, for a new sewage treatment plant should not fall solely on development right. charges from Niagara Falls. They should be spread across the region. So we're saying we're, we're consistent with a lot of the thinking of Welland, except we don't believe that there should be an area specific charge. Do we have the motion on that one? Yeah, we're just going to receive what I just read. So, <laughs> endorse with the exception of the recommendation related to area specific charges. Okay, so that's the motion we're looking for. Are they? Uh, I don't know. They're in the hospital. No, that doesn't pay development charges. Yeah, oh, sorry, it doesn't pay DC. Yeah. Okay, so I'm looking for a motion on this one. Uh, moved by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? Okay, thank you. Mr. Clerk, are there any additional items for Council's consideration? Uh, yes, one, uh, one additional item. Uh, it is in the additions, uh, and it's uh, relief of the noise bylaw for an 80th birthday party taking place at 5926 Valleyway. An 80th birthday party? An 80th birthday party. It's going to get pretty loud. <coughs> they yeah. do plan on bringing in some, uh, a band for entertainment. Good. In case we are looking for a motion, moved by Councillor Peter Angel, second by Councillor Cario, that we give relief to the, the, by, the noise bylaw for the 80th birthday party. All those in favor? That's approved unanimously. Thank you for that. The bylaws. Motion to introduce the bylaws. Moved by Councillor Peter Angel, second by Councillor Campbell, that the bylaws be given a first reading. All those in favor? Just before we do that? Nope, nope. just before we do that. I just wanted to point out, uh, again, through the additions there, uh, Bylaws 2017-65, it, it is listed on your agenda and it was included as a handout. Uh, bylaw 2017-67, uh, there has just been a small uh, change to that where we've added an additional enforcement officer under Schedule C. And then lastly, uh, bylaw 2017-78 is a completely uh, new addition that wasn't in your package. And this is really a housekeeping uh, matter, uh, whereby executing a bylaw of a previous transfer payment agreement. So this would then renumber our bylaws, uh, starting at 2017-55 through to 2017-79. That's fine. Okay. Thank you, and I should have asked you that, Mr. Clerk. Thank you. So uh, we do have the bylaws uh, moved for a first reading by Councilor Peter Angel, second by Councilor Campbell, and the vote. We'll call all those in favor. Okay, thank you for that. So just to reiterate then, 2017-55 through to 2017-79, read a first time. Second. Motion by Councillor Pierangelo, seconded by Councillor Campbell again, that the bylaws be given a second and third reading. All those in favor? Thank you. Okay, bylaws 2017-55 through to 2017-79, read a second and third time and passed. Thank you very much. New business. This yes, Councillor Grader, uh, Morocco, Campbell, Thompson. 
Yeah. Uh, thank you, Worship. Just have a couple things. Um, on the corner of, and I ask all the councilors to take a look at this uh, tomorrow, but on the corner of St. James and Thurlstone Road, look at the house on the right-hand side as you're heading, heading uh, away from Niagara Falls. It's a vacant house and the grass is unbe unbelievable. Yeah. You probably see yeah. it. In fact, I was out there looking at it and you're afraid to walk through it because of ticks. Because the reason I tell you this though is because, and I, I'll bring it forward to our, to our property standards department, but what's happening, and I think we need to take a look at this, your worship, but, but the number of complaints over property standards is phenomenal, the things that are happening out there that are inappropriate. For example, the grass. What I'm learning is that people will not cut their grass, and they think it's cheaper to wait the five or six weeks before the city can get to it. We've got so many that, and we'll go out and cut it, and we'll put it on their bill, and then the cycle will continue on, and maybe twice they'll get cut through the city. They won't do it. And I did some checking with some other municipalities, and what I found out was if you contravene a uh, property standards bylaw, particularly if it's your second time, there's no warning letter where we say you have 14 days, you have 20 to comply. They're given a letter and they're saying within one <coughs> week or less, whatever day, five days, you have to comply to the city bylaw. And the only reason I mention that part to you is I think that some people out there who are not complying to bylaws, they start thinking, what's the difference? If I don't comply, nobody's going to do anything. Or if they do, it's going to be five or six weeks down the road. So maybe we need to look at, maybe the staff would take a look at, maybe a different approach when it's someone that's doing it a second or a third time. There's no leniency that will be kind kind to you to do that. So um, I'll turn in the concern about St. James and Thorlstone, but we should have a look at, and it's a, that's a beautiful corner of that area. Yes. Um, secondly, I've had more phone calls uh, about Dorchester Road, about McLeod Road, about Drummond, people asking for more police presence. They're saying, where are the police? How come they're not out here? And that's because of the speed of the traffic and things that are going on that they feel there should be more police presence. So I said, I will gladly bring that forward. Um, on uh, Drummond Road and, and Dorchester, we have that major development, all those homes going in back there. And I know Mr. Mr. Holman and his staff have been wonderful, but so many complaints about the big trucks that are going up and down there. Sometimes they don't even have them covered up and the dirt and everything is flying off the trucks. Um, the speed, and I understand the drivers are trying to get down, drop their load off or take their load. But they're speeding up and down. But in the meantime, you've got residents who've just been living there all those years. And suddenly they, they're being really impacted by all these vehicles. They want police out there to, to try to slow them down. Uh, McLeod Road has become a highway. It is, you can't drive the speed limit on McLeod Road because you're pushed by the traffic telling you're driving too slow and the people want more police out there all the time. So I said I would, I would bring it forward and we can talk to the police to see if we can get more police presence in, in these areas. So now Dorchester, just so I've got the street, now Dorchester, Dorchester. shouldn't be too bad because it's so congested because the 4, 406, yeah. or the 420 rather. Uh, but, but yeah, I hear you, McLeod, that's nutty. Yeah. And what was the other one? It was Drummond? Drummond. You know where we have the putting all the new homes back in Oldfield back there. Well, all oh, the trucks are, yeah, and, oh. and they, or else they'll come out the other so, way up Dorchester yeah. and head towards McLeod. And you, it's just, sometimes it's backed all the way up. I, I live up that way, so I haven't seen it. it's backed all the way up. But most people are just saying, "Can't we get more police out here, Kim?" And I said, "I'd bring it forward." Um, the other thing was the the property standards. Yeah, I did. I mentioned about property standards. We could look at a different approach to really enforce. Because the last thing I'll tell you is if you call property standards and the message you're going to get, and again, I'm not being critical of the staff anyway, they'll say, leave the message. It'll be four or five weeks before we can get to your issue. Four or five weeks? Yeah, that's how, and yes. Joyce has heard. Yeah, so that's, yes. yeah, that's, and the, and the number of complaints coming it's unbelievable what's happening out there. People are afraid, whatever, not not sticking to the to the bylaws. So we can take a look at that. that yeah, for it. sure. Yeah, and I will mention. Um, I was doing that, uh, but I will mention too that uh, because it was such a wet spring, like a record wet spring, 
that the grass, the ground was so soft that we did have problems. We couldn't even get cutting equipment, and I know Hydro had the same problems where the muck, like so the the grass, the long grass, part of it's related to the wet, wet spring that we had. But but I agree, we've got to make sure we, we stay on top of them. And up to that point, Council, you want yeah, to address? Yes. Yeah, Your Worship. Uh, two I things think. on that point. First of all, is the actual policy. Uh, I brought this up years ago, and I know that City of Niagara Falls we. Uh, changed our policy. I don't ever remember us going back. We used to notify every single time that um, someone was in contravention of the bylaw, especially in regards to grass cutting. There would be a lengthy delay in between notifications, and you're right, maybe they would get charged twice in a season. But we changed that policy, Your Worship, and unless staff can yeah, tell no. me anything different, no. I'm, I'm pretty sure that if it's the same landowner year after year, we don't even notify on an annual basis. So let's say in 2015, we notified them one time that their grass was too long, um, there was no compliance, we sent cutters out there, they cut the grass. 2016, if a complaint comes in again, we don't notify again. They've already contravened our bylaw. They understand our bylaw because we've given them a written copy the year prior. So if yeah. it's the same well, landowner, my, my understanding is that we don't even notify a second time. You're right, Councilor. In regards to in 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 regards to grass complaints, Your Worship, the number I heard was 1,100. I'm not sure how many the department is actually dealing with. That's the number I heard. Unless staff can tell me anything better, I think with the amount of properties that we have in the city, the fact that we continue to go up in terms of number of residential buildings we should be looking at adding staff into enforcement rather than taking staff away, which is what I think we're doing right now. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yes, Councilor Thompson. Yeah, I, I had that on my agenda uh, tonight too. Uh, we're just in the throes of, uh, in fact, I think you hired somebody as uh, uh, in uh, bylaw of enforcement and property standards, did you? Not yet, they haven't started. No, they haven't started, but I think there's a decision to be made. Um, it, you know, I think there's a huge problem uh, with that particular uh, complaint system. Um, if you want to get something resolved, call uh, Jeff Holman's office. Uh, <laughs> we do. No, so, no ser ser seriously, the people that he has had in his department from uh, Marianne Tickey, uh, uh, Selony. What, what's the other Selony. one? Selony. Selony. Emily Cox and Selony. the other one was there before. Selony Tadini. Yeah, e excellent. They get back to you, they See follow that. up. Uh, the, uh, I think we, with the changes that are taking place uh, with the new manager, I think we should examine what they're doing in other areas because I tell you, uh, the uh, complaint system, the way it is now, and the number of people we have, it just doesn't work. Uh, we, we have a serious concern and problem, and uh, you, you have to keep making excuses to people about, well, you know, we'll go try it again, we'll call them again. Uh, th I think we really have to do an examination of uh, how we're handling uh, bylaw enforcement property standards because uh, it just doesn't seem to be working. Uh, you're having the same <coughs> concern yeah. you are. Uh, I, I'd really like to uh, see if we can find out what other municipalities do. Um, I, I'm always impressed with uh, the people that Jeff Holman has had in there, uh, the way they handle themselves. and. Uh, uh, I just want to put Jim. my two cents in. Yeah, actually, yeah. We should have a real examination and a report back. Whatever you need, you know, put some more employees in there and let's make it work. Yeah, Councillor Peter Yeah, uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I just want to say too, I mean, I know Councillor Crater mentioned the fact that I think it's actually on the uh, voicemail that it would be four to five weeks. I think if I was living next to a property where yeah. they didn't cut the grass, Four to five weeks to me would be very unacceptable. Um, unacceptable from the standpoint that four to five weeks is just simply uh, when they actually will schedule a visit to come out. Once they schedule a visit to come out and notice that the resident or the landowner hasn't complied, 
then there's still the whole notification aspect of it. They have to come back to City Hall. They have to write a notification of non-compliance to the property owner. That has to be mailed out. And then there's a specified time frame that the landowner has in order to comply. Once that time frame expires, then the staff member is able to go back out there just to see whether or not they've cut the grass yet. If they still haven't cut the grass at that point, that's when the cutter is called and then that's when the cutter comes in. You could be looking at close to two months, Your Worship. So yeah. I'm not quite sure that I would want to live next to a property like that right now. Yeah. So I mean, whether we can pull resources from other areas or whether we can actually increase our complement in that respect, um, it would be great if we could draw some attention to it because I know I've gotten calls as well and people are quite upset. Right. Yeah. Yep. Mr. C. With all due respect, Mr. Mayor, a lot of these aren't, these are processes. So in some cases, no matter how much staff you have, if you still have a process that says you've got to give two weeks notification and then you've got to go back and respect, it's, that's what the staff have to follow. So, you know, probably the best thing we should do is look at what those processes are as much as the staffing. And that means coming back and looking at how our bylaws function. These have been bylaws that have been in place for probably 30 years. And we're bringing a new person in. We are combining both property and standards and bylaw into one because in our view, that was an efficient, inefficient way to operate. So we are looking at new methods. We haven't got it up full and running yet because the new manager hasn't even arrived yet. Um, but that's what we're trying to do. So instead of having a bylaw person that goes out to the site and comes back and says oh sorry that was a property standards issue and three days later we send the property standards person out now the person that goes out on site will be able to handle every single complaint that's on that property whether it's a grass complaint whether it's a missing eaves trough a broken window derelict vehicles they can handle all of it at one time so that's the system we're trying to put in place to be more efficient we haven't gotten there uh, just because we have to get that new manager in place and get him implementing the new system. So it's going to take a little bit of time, but part of that process is that we will have review of those bylaws and some of those processes to see if we can streamline. Right now we're handcuffed a little bit by the process and the notification period, <coughs> but Councillor, you're absolutely right. If you've got a notification on your grass from last year, the practice is if we get a complaint at that same address, we just go out and cut it. So that is in place, and I don't know why that's happening, but that's certainly something that we can check on. Uh, Mr. Dren, did you have your hand up earlier? Were you trying? Um, I was just going to make comment on the speeding problem. Okay. So, um, with regards to uh, Dorchester, McLeod, and, and Drummond, um, I think it would take a request from council or resolution to the, the chief or a letter to the chief because it's generic. If it's specific, then we usually deal with the police, but they won't take uh, generic ones from us. So um, it's it's a I, I would say it's a letter to the chief of police from council requesting enforcement versus in, uh, coming to staff and staff sending that letter because it, what happens is we do a follow up process. So if we get a complaint about speeding, we we put uh, we either do a radar study or we put uh, uh, road tubes out to measure speeds, uh, but we have to have specific areas. And then we follow up with the police saying, here's what we found, can you go out and enforce it? In this case, it's, it's a generic, they're speeding out there, and I think it has to be a letter asking for a generalized enforcement. You make that motion, I guess? So uh, moved by Councillor Crater, seconded by Councillor Morocco, uh, that we send a letter to the Chief of Police, or, or do we send it to the Chief, or do we send it to our uh, District Commander, the Inspector, Inspector McCaffrey? I would say District Commander. Yeah, I would say to, yeah, I think, because he's gonna hand it to him anyway. So to uh, Inspector McCaffrey, um, that we uh, have a concern with speeding on McLeod Road, Dorchester Road, and Drummond Road. Uh, did you want to be specific what area? Because they're big roads. Like, you want to say a Dorchester near Oldfield? Just include my cell number. <coughs> you can call me. <laughs> no, I, specific, I shouldn't joke because it's serious for the people. It's uh, McLeod, all of McLeod Road. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Just, that's why we, we're going back with that Wilson Crescent. Yeah. For that because of that. And Dorchester, particularly down between McLeod and and Dorchester to Oldfield, yes. and Drummond, same thing down there. They were even asking. So me. south, south, yeah, south. Okay, okay, that's great. So we have the motion, all those in favor? Okay, that's approved, thank you. Uh, Councilor Morocco. Okay, thank you. I have um, a couple of things I just wanted to talk about. Uh, first of all, I did, um, 
uh, attend um, FCM uh, last uh, actually two weeks ago in Ottawa, and I ran into a gentleman from Niagara Falls, Michael Lambert. Uh, he's with Unifor, and he actually um, asked. Um, since this is his municipality, if we could actually pass this resolution, it's the Municipal Softwood Lumber Resolution, I believe everybody got a, uh, a copy in their in their package. Um, is it, should I read it out? Uh, yeah, is it long? Is it long? It's it's long. long. Yeah, so we uh, all have a copy so of it, right? If I can actually just ask for the support, they're basically asked for us, Canada's forestry industry is vital to our economy, hundreds of thousands of workers, and more than 650 communities depend on good forestry jobs, including in, including in soft wood lumber. And there, it's just asking, therefore, that the uh, Niagara Falls Council uh, support um, some of the um, items that they've asked for support, especially with the uh, U.S. tariffs and that, uh, the changes uh, with President Trump and softwood and trading. Um, that we support the Canadian government uh, in helping support our uh, softwood lumber. Okay. Can I make that? I so make a motion. Let's move by Councillor Morocco, second by Councillor Campbell, mm -hmm. that we support the softwood lumber motion. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved unanimously. Thank you. And I know at the last council that we actually did discuss some uh, uh, situations with garbage that's uncovered and it's blowing all over. I had another situation where um, some restaurant uh, was put the garbage out and it wasn't covered and the seagulls came and kind of prepared away. Are we actually kind of getting any closer to having some kind of report on closed containers for garbage or? Are you talking about for curbside garbage? Yeah, for curbside, but it was a restaurant that actually had their uh, garbage put out without a lid and the uh, garbage, the seagulls blocked in. I mean, staff is taking care of it, but I think that we were actually gonna look at some different uh, forms of trying to cover this garbage from flowing around anyway. Uh, so, so I'm told the report's not ready yet. Uh, okay, so great, helped. thank you, Finished. just one now. Um, and also, unfortunately, uh, a situation was brought to my attention. Um, uh, the neighbor of mine was seriously burnt um, uh, in an accident with some, this happened, fire, and was sent uh, to the Niagara General Hospital. And uh, unfortunately, um, he was treated there uh, and told he had second degree burns to his legs. Um, his uh, situation became much worse after uh, after a couple of days. It wasn't second degree burns. He ended up in um, Sunnybrook Hospital. The burns were fourth degree burns. He is diabetic and could have lost his legs. I think that that we would like to have this investigated, and I know that the family is going to send some letters um, to to address the situation that happened at Emerge. Um, I think that, you know, we don't specialize in burn trauma, and I think that even if that happens, I, I think that we need to look at preventative medicine and send patients like that uh, to a burn trauma unit to be assessed and not just take it. Um, yeah, it was, he's, he's been burnt uh, pretty much to the muscle and now is going through grafting, and he was lucky that he didn't lose his life. So it was very unfortunate. They are my neighbors, and... Uh, Anyway, they've asked me to just bring it to the attention because they want to make sure that nothing like this ever happens to other people and going through this situation of uh, being at our hospital and pretty much being misdiagnosed, especially in a burn victim. So wow. I, um, I'm i sure I'm going to hear something from the NHS, but I just want to let that know that uh, Have that they happened. brought this to the NHS's uh, yeah, contention? Yeah, that, that it happened. So anyway, that's all I have to report. Okay. Thank you very much, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Campbell? Thank you, Your Worship. Um, some time ago at a project share meeting, it was brought up that uh, uh, a lot of the people that are homeless or have uh, low income housing are many of their clients. Mm -hmm. And uh, tonight it was brought up about closing the, uh, some of those homes in the uh, tourist area. Um, we received this report from the uh, Niagara Regional Housing about the uh, terrible shape that uh, low-income housing is in our community. And I just picked up on uh, uh, this morning, at its most recent meet uh, meeting, St. Catharines Council has moved forward with an affordable housing action plan for the city. And apparently there were more than 40 ideas detailed by staff at the council meeting aimed at trying to address the rising need for affordable housing in the city. I would ask that we could have staff perhaps approach the city of St. Catharines and, and find out if we can use the information that they have and, and we need to stand up to the plate and 
uh, start having a serious look at affordable housing in our community. That's great, uh, Councillor. So, I, so we got a motion by Councillor Campbell, second by Councillor Strange, that our staff reach out to the City of St. Catharines staff for their research on their homeless initiatives and we'll report back, yes. okay? All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. And I should point out, I did have a meeting today at the region with uh, our Director of Economic Development, Serge Felicetti, on that exact topic with the City of St. Catharines and with the region, and we're part of an initiative. Uh, we do have a developer that does wanna build um, here in the region, in Niagara Falls, well and in St. Catharines, and with federal funding, and we're in there advocating uh, for these people so that we can build these kind of places. So we understand we have to create incentives uh, through development charge incentives and other things because these guys aren't just gonna build it just for the, the, for the community. They gotta have some benefit and some incentive, these developers. So we were discussing exactly those incentives. That's exactly, our goal is to have a shovel in the ground before September, by September. And, and if I could just take that to a further step, Your Worship. You know, the, the uh, Board of Education, whether it's separate or public, our tax dollars pay for it. There's a whole slew of schools being closed across the peninsula. Um, there should be some way that we could work in conjunction with the <coughs> boards of education. Perhaps uh, they could continue to own the property, but we could use it in terms of some form of development for low housing. Um, I look at uh, Drummond Road, uh, the old yeah. Drummond Road School. Yeah. I do believe, if I'm correct, the city was involved in, in in that process at that time. So there, there are so many different ways that I think that we can can uh, look at this problem. And if we could work in conjunction with these large buildings, they, they took down that one in Chippewa, um, the uh, DSPN, would have made a perfect uh, yeah. housing. Yeah, Rutland, yeah, Rutland. Yeah, Rutland. <coughs> so I, I think that there are unique ways that we could, and I, I'm glad to hear that that was happening at the region level. Yeah, that's a great idea on the schools. That's a great idea. Uh, Councillor Thompson. Um, yes, I was going to hand this over to you. Uh, I got a call during the week. Uh, a woman was very upset about uh, our policy with respect to fireworks, when they're used, wh where they're sold, how they're sold. And uh, she dropped this letter off. I said, uh, can you put it in writing? She did, I think. Uh, you may know who this person because they've complained uh, numerous times about uh, uh, fireworks, <coughs> uh, but uh, it was signed a uh, concerned citizen. So I'll no name with you. And uh, there's no name in there. Uh, I you probably it's okay. a detail in there about uh, the issue. So um, I'm passing it on. Maybe you can look and see if there's anything we can do. They indicated that it, the bylaw hasn't been changed for uh, many, many years. I mean, That's for the sale of, of fireworks. And, and letting them off. Okay. Yeah, and then we can report back on it. Okay. No problem. Thank you. Yeah. Councilor Peter Angelo. Thank you. Your Worship, I. Um, just wanted to say, like, uh, I kind of went back in our emails over the past couple of months and, and noticed that we get a lot of emails that are emailed to all of City Council, um, but yet we really don't have one point person to quarterback these. So, uh, Councillor Thompson might respond, Councillor Ainoni responds, Councillor Crater responds, Councillor Macro responds. None of us really know what is happening with it until it's an actual staff member that we get an email back from. And I just think that, I mean, I, I just jotted down some of the ones that we've heard about, uh, Corey Crescent and the radio, uh, Riverview Park and, 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 and how the development is gonna uh, come closer to the backyards, uh, the fence that has the plywood on it, although that one's solved, Sodom Road, uh, the downtown BIA, Drummond Road, and, and I know we did hear back from Marisena, which is great but we really don't hear back from uh, a point person. And it would be nice if it's an email that's sent to all the council, that we actually have a point person so that we understand um, how the situation is being dealt with instead of each one of us individually emailing back, which I find almost to be uh, overkill a lot of times. So. Yeah, uh, Mr. CIO. Well, just to that point, and uh, there's a lot of times that the council emails that are grouped for council, there's a lot of times that none of the staff were even copied in on that. 
So, you know, one way we could solve that is we could just ensure that any of those emails that are going to the group as council, we could have a specific point person, perhaps in the mayor's office or whatever, or, or, or our office, that just had those so they can kind of make sure that the appropriate staff person gets looped in on it. Because a lot of times we're left out of the loop right. until later down the line because we're not copied in on those council group emails. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, and that's what I was going to suggest, actually. I mean, I think that they should go through the mayor's office. I mean, I understand that you get a copy of them uh, as being a member of council, but it's still important to have that point person. Each individual councillor can still email everyone back what they think that, you know, their thoughts on the matter are, but we still need to have one point person. So, I mean, if that can be the mayor's office, that would yeah. be great. Yeah, absolutely. Mr. Mayor, so what we could do is, if it was a matter of a group email that was identified through the mayor's office and they knew it was Mr. Holman's department, an email would go out and say, Mr. Holman's department is the lead on this, this issue. That's right. So then you would know right off the bat who the lead person is. Perfect. Uh, Councillor Strange. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I just want to, uh, just a quick reminder of our big event Friday yeah. at our KO Chat at uh, um, boxing charity event that's happening this Friday. It's been uh, we've been training with all the boxers the last three four months. Myself and Billy Irwin and Matt Warner and Billy's brother Mike Irwin. Um, so everyone's been kind of stepping up, training hard for it. No one's really ever boxed before. We got a great committee uh, together: Wayne Thompson, uh, Kim Rossi, well working hard trying to sell tables, sponsorships, whatever. And it's for two great causes. And uh, that is the uh, Child of Cancer Research and Ronald McDonald Host Hamilton, which is uh, just an awesome cause. So um, we're all sold out of tables, and we're having stand-up tickets that are actually, so there are no seats, but you get to stand up near the bar, of course. And uh, they were to be on sale that night, uh, which is this Friday at the Scotiabank Center. Uh, boxing matches start at 7.30. Um, so I just want to uh, thank Wayne and everyone on the committee that just been doing an incredible job to, to have a sellout at the great, uh, uh, a venue at the convention center, so truly amazing. Um, all these boxers are really, really nervous, so uh, um, they're gonna have great production, great on entourages as they come in uh, to uh, to the boxing ring. I know Pat Kelly Sr. is gonna come over, who's been kind of returned and be kinda become one of the coaches in the corner. We have uh, a couple of firefighters boxing each other. We have Councilor Peter Angel's wife uh, stepping up. We have uh, a couple of girls from uh, Scotiabank Center in particular, uh, Carissa Samis, who's lost 36 pounds in the last three months oh, just by doing this. So we're really, truly amazing. They're really taking this stuff serious. So we would love uh, for everyone just to come out and support the cause. So thank well, you. that's great. Absolutely do. Any other new business? Just a question. Yeah. I just want to say thank you very much for including this uh, yeah. whole time. That was from Sylvia Somerville. Yeah. She was here at council last time. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Motion for adjournment. Councillor Strange, second by Councillor Morocco. All those in favor? <laughs> Thank you. We're adjourned. Thanks, Bill.